This is Audible. Enslaved by the Alien Dragon, a sci-fi alien romance. Galactic Alpha's Conquest, Book 4. Written by Stella Casey. Performed by Lisa S. Ware. Chapter 1. Yvette. A raised dais had been set up in the middle of the crowded market. Directly behind it were a series of large metal cages that created a perverse wall that framed the stage on which my life was set to change. Again, I kept my head down and tried to avoid eye contact with the Pax guard who hung onto the bars of my cage with pincer-like claws. His eyes were a zealous crimson red, and his teeth were large protruding shards that could take off my arm with one bite. I had obviously offended him somehow, because he ground his teeth at me every chance he got. My instinctive response was to turn and run, but where would I go? Even if I managed to get out of this cage, Minneapolis was a planet of traps and slavers. Earth was several light years away. Even its memory had turned cold in my mind. I could feel the frenzy of excitement that punctured the air. There was a certain bloodlust that tainted the atmosphere when fresh batches of slaves were brought in. My cage was connected to several others, each with its own Pax guard. Two long lines of barefooted human slaves were wheeling us in. They wore gray-brown, one-shouldered garments that came up to their knees. As if their clothes were not enough, they also wore thick black collars around their necks. I was sure that the packs made those collars heavy on purpose. The weight was a constant reminder of what you were. My hand went up to my own collar. Its thick, unrelenting grasp was claustrophobic, and I remembered that first moment, years ago now, when it had first been fastened around my neck. I had spent the first week believing I would die from its hold. Those first few weeks as a slave had taught me one thing. Dying wasn't as easy as some imagined. Only when you prayed for death did you realize how stubborn the human instinct for survival was. As we got closer to the dais, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The crowd was larger than I had anticipated. The auction hadn't even started yet, and I could see several slavers shout out bids for slaves that had caught their eye. I was suddenly extremely conscious of the three-leafed clover scarred on my right cheek. It was a warning to any who were brave or foolish enough to bid for me. I was marked. My only consolation was that the mark didn't betray the nature of my ill advantage. Fresh meat coming through, one of the packs screamed from the head of our procession. The crowd parted with interest, and I stood in the middle of my cage, keeping my eyes downcast. There was a hum of conversation only snippets of which I understood. The translation chip in my slave collar had been known to malfunction from time to time. My ears were buzzing with nerves, and I felt as though the tiny piece of stale bread I had been allowed for breakfast would come up if I didn't stay very still. I pulled up my hair, trying to comb it over my right cheek in an attempt to cover my mark. The Pax guard noticed. That won't help. He jeered at me through the bars of my cage. I'll make sure everyone sees what you really are. Trouble. I didn't respond. I pretended as though I didn't hear him. Engaging with the Pax was always a stupid move. Stop hiding your face, the Pax guard insisted. Look up. Let them see you. I hesitated, wondering if I could get away with avoiding his order. Snarling menacingly, he swiped at me with his claws, and I stumbled back with a gasp and hit the bars of my cage. I felt its cold bite like ice against my back, but I steeled myself against the pain. 
let them see you, whore, he screamed. I got to my feet and raised my chin. My hair fell away from my face, and I saw several slavers look in my direction. Two six-legged vents looked at me with interest, but their enthusiasm faded from their reptilian features when they noticed my mark. They tended to be more superstitious as a species, and I knew none of their kind would bid for me. You look like you know your way around a bedroom, a Norsian called out as we passed by. His skin was a faint blue that clashed severely with the bright orange-brown of his mane. What would it cost to buy you for a night? The pack guard looked at me with glee. This slave is special, he said, raising his voice over the whoop of hoots and whistles. She's been trained for large and ruthless lovers. The mild-mannered cocks of Norsians won't do, no sir. She knows her way around a dragon. In fact, she prefers to fuck them in their dragon forms. I had to tune him out. Fear burned hot on my cheeks. Ever since my enslavement, I had only ever known Pax owners. They were a sadistic and ruthless species. But after years of doing their bidding, I knew what to expect. At this point, the unknown scared me a lot more than the Pax did. The Kavoan centaurs looked like a mild-mannered species. They were calm and relatively peaceful. They didn't have the same lust for violence that the Pax did, but they were not big slave owners. The Drakens, on the other hand, were a different story. I hadn't come across them very often, but their reputation was fearsome. They were ruthless space pirates who lived by their own laws. They reaved, pillaged, and stole which was why there was little love lost between their kind and the Pax. The Drakens resembled humans, far more than any other species I had seen since my enslavement, but under no circumstances could you ever mistake them for humans. A thick layer of colored scale coated their skin, and they had large wings that folded back against their shoulder blades. I had never seen a Draken in his shifter form, and I had to admit, that was a sight I was both curious and terrified to see. We finally made it to the dais, and I could see the auctioneers ready themselves on one edge of the platform. Several smaller wooden cages were being wheeled onto the stage by a small group of human slaves whose backs were covered with a barbarous collection of lash scars. Once the dais had been set, the auctioneer walked to center stage. His fur was a gleaming white beneath the layers of black leather he wore. His claws scraped the wood as he walked towards the waiting crowd. Welcome all, I am Serge Minnow, he boomed, his throaty voice grating. We have an excellent selection for you today. I hope you have come prepared, my friends. Today's bidding will be fierce. Goose flesh pricked at my skin and I wrapped my hands around my body. Minneapolis was a relatively warm planet filled with bony trees and an eclectic collection of mismatched buildings, mud huts, and tunnel caves. There was a certain archaic beauty about it, and yet I felt cold all the time. First up, we have a human male, Serge Minot started gesturing for one of his guards to bring forth the first slave. Born in captivity, this useful creature has been trained in the kitchens. His specialties include nox and stew and lager-braised pie. He is also skilled in the preparation of rare delicacies such as phoenix and manitou. I watched as a jeering Pax brought a young boy with a chain fastened around his collar on stage. All the Pax guard had to do was pull and the boy stumbled forward. He looked no older than sixteen or seventeen, but the milky sallowness of his skin made him seem even younger. He takes command well, Serge Minot went on. Very obedient and very attentive. Let's start the bidding at a hundred credits. I turned my gaze towards the crowd, wondering if my future owner was somewhere amidst the throng. Please, I murmured under my breath. 
Please let me be bought by a decent slaver. There was a time when I used to pray for freedom. Now I just prayed that my owner would treat me well. It was a depressing thought, but one I had resigned myself to. Next lot! I gasped and looked up, realizing that my batch was up next. It felt like the collar around my neck tightened by several inches. My vision blurred as the crowd before me dissolved into obscure lines. I had never been part of an auction before. I was usually handed over from one owner to the next, and I realize now that I preferred it. I couldn't imagine standing up there while all those lecherous sadists examined me. Here we have a human female, Serge Minot boomed. She is considered very fine among her species. Look at the golden hair, the blue eyes. She would make any male a fine bedmate. I couldn't help it. I had to look at her. Serge Minot was right. She was beautiful. Her face was long and framed by hollowed and cheekbones that accentuated her large doe eyes. It was obvious she had been bathed and prepared for this auction. Even her slave garment looked presentable and passably flattering. We want to see her, a Gorbeck yelled. He stood at about nine feet and had three of his six arms in the air. Even if he weren't so huge, I would have noticed him by the deep, murky green of his skin. His eyes were cat-like, with vertical black slits that made my skin crawl. We want to see her whole! I frowned. What did that mean? Before I could blink, Serge Minot had walked over to the blonde slave and ripped her robes off with his teeth. I didn't hear her gasp because my own was still ringing in my ears. She stood there, completely naked, staring out at the salacious audience with her eyes downcast and her body trembling like a leaf. The bidding started at two hundred credits, but I couldn't watch. Her nakedness felt like a personal insult. Why did they have to do that? It was a silly question, really, one I already knew the answer to. She was a slave. We were nothing more than objects, and objects didn't have opinions or dreams or feelings. Next batch. I froze. No, not yet. It was too soon. But the door to my cage had already swung open, and the Pax guard looked at me with bright eyes and barred teeth. Come, my little ill vixen, he said in a crude sing-song voice. Time to see what cock you're going to have to climb every night. He climbed onto the bars of my cage with dexterous feet, and using them to balance, reached out and grabbed my collar. I had no choice but to wait till he had fastened a chain to the hook in the center of the collar. Then he jumped to his feet and pulled me from the cage with a tug of his claws. Like a dog on a leash, I was pulled onto the stage as Serge Minot started my bid at a record low ten credits. I was so nervous, so conscious of the audience's eyes on me, that my legs started to lose their autonomy. No, I thought desperately to myself. Don't faint. Not now. Not now. Just when I thought I had mastered myself, I tripped. I stumbled to the side and hit one of the cages that had been put on display at the back of the dais. The cage I knocked into rolled into the next one and created a domino effect that ended in a large crash on the side of the dais. I stood perfectly still as dust kicked up in soft plumes. Serge Mineau and the Pax Guard looked at me with dumbstruck expressions on their faces. Then I heard a scream. My knees give out, and I landed on the dais as grainy wooden planks as Pax started running towards the accident I had never meant to create. What's the damage? It landed on two of ours, I heard someone shout. Are they alive? No. Slaves? One dead, two injured. I shuddered. What would this mean for me? It was an accident. 
Surely they could see that? I looked up, just in time to see a Pax guard walking toward me. His eyes were alight with anger and his claws looked ready to strike. I closed my eyes and tried to disconnect my body from my mind. Wait! The voice made my eyes fly open. Serge Minot was standing next to the Pax guard. We are still in the middle of an auction, he snarled under his breath. Put her in one of the cages by the stage and let's get on with it. But you're not going to sell her? Look at her, Serge Minot said darkly. She's marked. After this whole debacle, no one is going to want to buy her. Just get her out of my sight and deal with the cage collapse. But what do we do with her? The Pax guard asked. She's no longer valuable to us anymore, Serge Minot replied with a shrug. Once the auction is done, kill her. Chapter 2 Rennell I had always hated Minneapolis. Market planets always had the stink of poverty about them, which was why it irked me to be here, standing among an assortment of stinking Norts, Pax, and Mosset, trying to outbid them for slaves I didn't really need. I amended that thought in my head. I really did need a few new slaves. My ship was in need of a good cook and a few maids to clean up after my ever-increasing crew. I was particular about the slaves I brought on board, which was why, despite my distaste for the crowds that were drawn to slaver cities, I had resolved to go myself to make the purchases. I remembered Tarion scoffing at me when I had shared my plans. You're going yourself? Why shouldn't I? Because you're the commander of your own fleet now, Tarion had pointed out. You can get one of your seconds to do it for you. You can get one of your slaves to do it for you. I'm aware of that, I retorted. But there's something to be said about picking your own slaves. Tarion had rolled his eyes at me, and I had suppressed the growl hiding in my throat. We all have our own way of doing things, Dashiell said, stepping in smoothly. Dashiell had a way of diffusing looming arguments before they could take on a life of their own. How are you getting used to your ship? Lahar asked. The wyvern. I had developed a growing sentimentality for the ship that had been passed down to me from Dashiell. It had taken a while for me to get used to the amorphous vessel, where most ships in the fleet were sleek and elegantly foreboding. The wyvern was unrefined and completely non-threatening. While Tarion, Lahar, and Dashiell had ships with savagely powerful bodies that resembled the dragons of old, the wyvern's design was spherical, and oblong, with little in the way of distinguishing characteristics or impressive embellishments. I had taken pains over the course of the last several months to update the ship as best I could. I had upgraded the weapon systems and replaced the old space turbines with interstellar engines. I had even spent coin on blaster tubes, space-to-surface missiles, and light-speed drives. As state-of-the-art as all the new additions were, they clashed glaringly with the outdated construction of the wyvern. However, there was still more to be done. I wanted to update the internal comm system and make additions to the ship's crew rooms, which was why I was stuck on Gigner until my ship was ready to fly. The ship was bordering on obsolete, I replied, but I've managed to salvage it. Tarion had glanced at me with his sharp eyes, but I had never been one to mince my words. I saw no reason why he should take offense by my honesty, especially because I hadn't taken offense with the understaffed ship he had seen fit to pass into my command. Of course it had annoyed me, but annoyance was my constant companion most days anyway. The vents make good slaves, Lahar advised. But you can't go wrong with hermits either. Or maybe I should just get a human. 
I tried to suppress the smile on my face as all three of my fellow commanders tried to figure out how to react. Given that all three had taken human women to wife, there was no simple way to respond to my goading statement. Humans don't make good slaves. They crave freedom too much. We all turned towards the heavy monochrome door as Carissa walked in. She was wearing pants that took the shape of her legs and tan leathers that staked around her body, accentuating its shape. Her soft yellow hair hung loose around her shoulders and her green eyes were shrewd as they turned on me. But if you're going to the slave market, I have a favor to ask. I had instantly regretted not bolting the door. Which is, I'm in need of a nanny, someone strong, competent, and capable, Carissa said. Do you think you could find someone for me? Tarion will give you the credits. I glanced at Tarion, waiting for him to tell his woman to leave the commander's chamber. But instead, he gave her a smile that invited her in. She moved to his side and stroked the pale red scales that coursed up his arm. What happened to sending in one of your seconds, Tarion? I asked. Tarion gave me a smug smile that made me bristle. I have my own command now, I growled. Easy now, Lahar said, as somber and subdued as the dark maroon scales that peppered his arms. Tarion likes to have his fun. Ignore my husband, Rennell, Carissa said, though she stroked his head affectionately as she spoke. So, will you? We would be eternally grateful. The fleets were overrun with half-breed babies and not enough hands to keep them all in line. I knew there was a need and I didn't mind so much. The whelps' rounded cuteness made them easy to tolerate. What I did mind was Carissa's penchant for giving orders when she had no authority to do so. Very well, I sighed. I'll purchase a nanny when I'm in the market buying my own slaves. Which is how I'd ended up here, scanning the offerings for a slave that looked like it could hold its own against the growing brood of feral hatchlings running through the fleet. I had already made my purchases. I had a new cook and two maids to add to my ship. The payments had all been processed, and I might have been on my way back to the fleet if it hadn't been for Carissa's damned nanny. I had purposely chosen a smaller, quieter auction stage. There was a motley assortment of bidders, and the stage was set with a few smaller cages. Many bidders tended to favor the larger auction stages, bursting with choice and dressed up with animated auctioneers, who didn't seem to take a breath. All the pomp only served to grate on my already short attention span. I wasn't interested in being entertained. I wanted to conduct my business and get the fuck out of here. Commander. Deverin said as he walked up to me. I have your new slaves loaded and ready to go. I gritted my teeth. Unfortunately, I have one more purchase to make. Deverin frowned. Uh, you need another slave? He asked. He was one of the more promising members of my crew. He was young, but he showed determination and skill. And most importantly, he was eager to prove himself. His dark eyes were punctured by tiny blue spots, which matched the teal hue of the scales that ran up and down his arms. I don't, I replied. But apparently, Carissa does. Carissa, Deverin repeated. Oh, Commander Tarion's wife. That's the one, I nodded. She didn't want to come down to the market herself? Deverin wondered out loud. Apparently, she was too busy, I replied, trying not to sound too annoyed. After all, I'm only the commander of a Hiles Rain ship. 
I'm only moving from ship to ship trying to better the other captains of their command. Apparently those duties pale in comparison to Carissa's. So much for masking my annoyance. I sighed inwardly and fixed my attention to the stage in front of me. The auctioneer was a gaunt Norsian who looked both tired and disinterested. He had only two more slaves to offer, and then this stage would be closed. My height gave me a good vantage point, and I scanned the other stages. The biggest one in the center of the market was well underway now. The crowd gathered around it was massive, and I noticed that there was an overwhelming number of packs that overran the area. Filthy maggots, I muttered under my breath. Sir, Devron asked glancing at me. You said something? Nothing, I said gruffly. Keep an eye out for a slave that might suit as a nanny. Someone young and able-bodied. Did Carissa have a species preference? She'll take what I bring her, I growled. And she'll be grateful. Deverin nodded, and I could see that he was trying to suppress a smile as he moved closer to the stage to examine the last two slaves on offer. I was close to bidding for the last slave, a pale human female with a tangle of black hair that looked charred at the edges. I stopped myself the last moment. Satisfying as it would have been to see the look on Carissa's face, I knew that a human slave would be no match for those little hybrid pups. They may have been half-human, but the half draken in them made them feral little beasts. Should we move to another stage? Deverin asked, appearing at my side again. Several others are still open. I was about to reply when a loud crash caught my attention. Deverin and I looked in the direction of the commotion. It appeared to have come from the main market stage. Little dust clouds had been kicked into the air, and I realized a row of cages had been pushed off the stage. Let's try that one. I said, acting on a whim. At the very least, we'll get some choice. Deverin and I abandoned the quiet auction stage that we had spent the last half an hour standing in front of and made for the main platform. As we got closer, we heard the faint titter of conversation filter through the crowd. Apparently, one of the slaves had caused the ruckus that had drawn Deverin and I to the main stage. Some seemed to think it was impudence on the part of the slave, and others assumed it was an accident. I, for one, really didn't care. All I wanted was a half-decent nanny, and then I could get back to the comfort of my ship. I made my way through the crowd as close as possible to the auction stage. The pungent stink of packs clung to the air, and I had to suppress the urge to gag. I hated having to buy off one of their auctions. But there was no arguing that they were the best and most ambitious slavers in the galaxy. Seven lots in, and I saw a slave that looked the part. She was a graceful Norsian with sorrowful eyes and an impressive honey-tinted mane that flowed over her long limbs. Norsians had the temperament and the physical prowess to be able to handle a dragon hatchling or two. I nodded to Deverin, who sighed with relief as he raised his hand to place a bid. Thankfully, we had landed in the sweet spot that every auction inevitably sailed through. It was midway through the bidding, which meant the crowd had thinned out, having made successful purchases or simply lost interest. The rest were more serious bidders who were waiting till the very end to make sure they got the best slaves. Everyone was reluctant to bid high at this point because they were waiting for better slaves to be offered. After a short bidding war with a squirrely little Pax, I managed to purchase the Norsian female for only two hundred and fifty credits. Satisfied and intensely relieved, I moved towards the left side of the stage to complete my purchase and procure the slave. There was a throng of packs sitting around a large table that looked much too big for their kind. I decided not to comment on it. The less said the better. 
There was no love lost between the Pax and the Dracons, and the smallest misstep could end in an unnecessary fight. They watched Deveron and me wearily as we approached, their eyes lingering on the tough scales that covered our bodies and marked us as dragon shifters. We just won the bid for the Norsian slave, Deveron spoke as he counted out the coin that were due and placed it on the table in front of the packs. Two hundred and fifty credits. The lead packs eyed the money carefully for a long moment. It was as though he was waiting for it to burst into flame. Despite the fact that his suspicion was warranted, I wasn't worried. The fake coin I had brought with me was of a high enough quality that I was certain it would fool anyone. I had real coin with me, and I had even been willing to use it, but it was just the packs. The hairy little fuckers deserved to be cheated. The female Norsian, the lead Pax asked, giving me the once-over. That's the one. Where are the papers? I want to get out of this dung pile. You seem to be in a hurry, Draken. I have more important things to get to, I replied, keeping my tone detached. Stealing is hard work, the lead Pax snarled with a forced smile on his rodent's face. You wouldn't know. I retorted. Deverin took a careful step forward. Like I said, we want to be on our way. If you could prepare our slave, we don't want any trouble. The lead Pax eyed him with interest and then turned back to me. He was trying very hard to hide his instinctive dislike, but he wasn't doing a very convincing job. No, we don't want any trouble either he agreed. In fact, I will throw in a free gift with your purchase. Call it a gesture of goodwill. I felt Deverin tense beside me instantly. You're offering me a gift? I asked. Indeed, and it is a valuable gift at that. The lead packs nodded. Kova, bring the dark-haired slave girl. There was a pause. The human? Kova clarified. That's the one. The lead Pax nodded. I could see the smug satisfaction on his face, and I wondered what deformity the human had that he wanted to unload her on us. Curiosity was the only thing that kept me from turning down his gift. A few moments later, Kova appeared pulling a long metal chain the end of which was fastened onto the collar of a young human female. She was slight in frame and build, her shoulders hunched downwards as though she wanted to disappear altogether. The rough, spun brown cloth she wore bared one naked shoulder and left her arms and legs exposed. She was looking down, allowing her long, dark hair to cover the bulk of her features, but I could still make out the unusual hazel gold of her eyes and the prominent three-leaf clover emblazoned on her right cheek. So she was the cause of the cage collapse that had caught my attention earlier in the day. I am sure she will make a capable slave, the lead Pax said in a wheedling tone that made me want to punch him in his pointed snout. I have no doubt she will, I said, forcing some measure of cordiality into my tone. I could see Deverin glancing at me from the corner of his eye, but I knew he would not dare question me in front of anyone else, let alone the Pax. Thank you, I said, for your generous gift. The chain was passed into my hands unceremoniously, and the Norsian slave was prepared for our departure. Once the papers were signed, Deveron and I made our way past the throng of packs and out of the slaver's market. We were on our way to the collection bay to retrieve our other purchases, when Deveron glanced back over his shoulder at the human slave girl who was following behind us, trembling like a new sapling. She's marked. She's nothing more than a bad omen, Deverin said urgently, 
his tone rife with indignation. She was never meant to be a gift. She was only ever meant to insult. I'm aware, I nodded. But the joke's on them. I don't believe in that superstitious fodderal. The bottom line is I gave them false coin. And they gave me a free slave. Chapter 3 Yvette I couldn't help but stare. I had never seen a dragon like him before. His strides were strong and confident. His movements were jerky and alert. It felt like he would pounce at any moment. He was several feet taller than I was, and his broad shoulders seemed to cast me in shadow. He wore a dark leather tunic that mirrored armor, but his forearms and neck were exposed to reveal tough, burnished burgundy scales that covered his skin. I imagined those scales on the massive body of a dragon, and my hair stood on end. The scales snaked up his neck, but ended around his jawline. They gave way to human features. A hawk-like nose that was slightly bent at the tip. A square jaw that led up to caved-in cheekbones and dark, ranging eyes that held the tiniest slit of light. Those eyes were deep and emotionless when he glanced my way. It made me feel as though he could see inside me. As terrifying as I found him, my curiosity was hard to temper. I kept glancing at the long viper's tail that flicked at his legs, and the impressive set of scaled wings that were folded inward against his back. For one insane moment, I actually imagined reaching out and touching those wings. The Norsian slave he had purchased made sure to keep her distance from me, at least as far as our chains would allow. Apparently, she was worried my bad luck was infectious. The Pax had tried to pass me off as a gift, but the fierce-looking dragon had to know the truth, didn't he? I had a mark on my cheek, and the marketplace was buzzing with the news of the deaths that had been caused on the main stage. He had to know. And he had taken me anyway. I wondered if that was a good sign or a bad one. I could hear him conferring with his friend, who had all the same characteristics without any of the underlying menace. They were talking in low voices that were underpinned by a series of growls. This was the first time I would be owned by dragons. It was the first time I would be owned by anyone other than the Pax. A part of me, couldn't help but wonder if I would survive the experience. I trailed after them while they retrieved three other slaves from the collection center, two ermits and a superior-looking vents. The ermits both stood at around five feet with long feather-like hair that erupted from their heads and ended only at their feet like billowing robes. I couldn't see any of their features other than large oval eyes that looked out into the world with a kind of frightened awe. The only thing that distinguished one from the other was the color of their downy fur. One ermit had a coat of milky eggshell, and the other's was a soft, earthy brown. Next to both of them, the vents looked massive and significantly more dangerous. His legs, three on either side, protruded from his globule-like torso in a manner that was reminiscent of a spider. We walked through the heart of the city to get to the outskirts. Given that Monopolis was predominantly a slaver's planet, every species within the galaxy had contributed in some way to the architecture of the city. We walked past a tall, vertical building with several doors and windows snaking around the oblong structure. At first glance, it almost resembled a tree, and I recognized it as Vent's architecture. They had no staircases. They simply climbed in and out of their buildings through the groove-like windows in each tiered floor. The tall immensity of the tree-like building gave way to a series of tunnels. 
The packs, in their more primitive days, had favored tunnels, much like the Ermits still did. But as the Pax Alliance had grown in power and ambition, they had refined their homes to set them apart from the Ermits, who they considered no better than a slave species. The Ermit tunnels were crude burrows that wove through dirt and muck with little in the way of aesthetic beauty. As we passed by a collection of interweaving Ermit warrens, I noticed how careless the design of their tunnels were in comparison to the Pax almost as though to highlight the difference in their status the pax homes had been placed a few short feet away from the ermit tunnels they had evolved into large arched constructions made from fine teak and yellow moonstone the entrances of their buildings reached as high as ten feet i had been inside countless pax homes as a slave and i knew they would be filled with silk cushions and soft carpets that were at least five to eight inches in thickness. As we left behind the burrows and tunnels, we came to a series of large towers, complete with hexagonal gazebo-type roofs that were shingled in colored tile. The color scheme was bold, and parts of the outer facade were intricately carved or covered with mosaic and painted glass. I had heard about Norsian architecture, but I had never seen it up close. The Pax spoke of it with disdain that was meant to hide their innate jealousy. The Norsian architecture, despite its obvious showiness, was definitely the most refined style I had seen thus far. The city was a kaleidoscope of cultures. My eyes darted around so fast that I started to feel lightheaded as we continued our long walk through the city's heart. I saw the contributions of all these different species, and it was both overwhelming and dazzling. There were Pax Caves, seamlessly floating into the body of Norsian Towers. There were mud huts, nestled against the simple practicality of Vent's buildings. I could see the rough earthiness of pueblos made by the rhymers of Kitak, and the black stone construction of the Kohex of Norm. Even the pathways resembled Minneapolis's confused identity. Cobbled paths gave way to stone, stone gave way to brick, and brick gave way to mud and dirt. At first glance, Minneapolis was a city of contradictions, an ugly mass of opposing cultures, species, and lifestyles. But when you got past the ugly mishmash... There was something to be said about the singularity of eclecticism. As the city started to thin out, I noticed the buildings and towers give way to more primitive abodes. I recognized the mud huts from Gorbeck culture. They were the antediluvian species that value tradition. Their homes were no better than mud huts. Large, circular spaces with no rooms, gambrel roofs, and small circular windows. Gorbex had no concept of privacy, and that was reflected in their open-door cabanas that I spied as we made our way to the bright greenery of the city's outskirts. The two draken led our incongruous group toward the open space that looked free of civilization. The trees were thin but robust, and each one of them boasted a different variety of flowers. I had passed by them earlier this morning— and looked at their understated beauty with indifference from behind the bars of my cage. Now I could appreciate them. The world always looked bigger and more vivid when you weren't watching it from inside the prism of a box. We arrived at a monstrous hovercraft that could have seated about twenty different creatures. It was deep obsidian, and I could see my reflection in its shimmering surface. I looked gaunt, underfed, and completely broken. I remembered a time when people had saluted me with respect. My only solace was that none of them could see me now. I felt shame rage hot and prickly inside my stomach at the selfish thought. None of them would ever know what I had become, because none of them had lived through the Pax invasion. I looked at the back of my new owner, 
through the prism of old memories. Maybe I deserved to have this collar around my neck. Deveron, the older dragon said. Get them inside. Over here, the younger dragon said, gesturing for the five of us to follow him. There was a square recess built into the side of the hovercraft. Deveron walked over to it and punched in a sequence of numbers. Immediately, the door of the hovercraft lifted up to reveal gleaming brown leather seats. Get in, Deveron commanded. I made my way to the door, but the other slaves overtook me quickly. The Norshan and Vents were the first ones in. Their large bodies made it easy for them to maneuver into the hovercraft. The Ermits got in behind them, and, despite their small size and stature, they leapt into the hovercraft with surprising agility. I glanced at the raised step that I needed to make in order to pull myself into the craft and sighed. This was probably not going to go smoothly. I tried to find something to reach for, but the door was made of smooth surfaces that were difficult to grip. I tried anyway and promptly landed on the mossy grass in front of the craft. I could hear snickering coming from the vents, but I ignored it and pulled myself back to my feet. I tried once more, and this time my hand slipped and I knocked my forehead against the side of the opening. For Jupiter's sake! An impatient growl came from just behind me. I glanced behind to see the looming form of the older dragon. I felt my heart stall a little as he wrapped his Herculean arm around my waist and hoisted me onto the hovercraft without the slightest bit of effort. Sit, he commanded, and fasten your seatbelt. I hurried to a window seat in the far corner of the craft and did just that. Moments later, the door closed on us, and I saw both dragons enter the hovercraft through separate entrances at its nose. I noticed that neither one fastened their seat belts. As they prepared to take off, the loud, growling scream of the engine burst to life and made me gasp. I was used to traveling in large spaceships. These smaller vessels seemed painfully exposed. I could feel every vibration, every dip and bend and turn. I glanced out my window at the tight formation of clouds that we were passing. Had we really covered that much distance already? As the hovercraft dipped to the side, I spied the sweeping rust plains of Minneapolis. Clouds and whiplash winds shrouded the city and diluted its colors. It looked very ordinary from my vantage point. The further we flew, the more the scenery began to change. I could make out the ridges of mountain peaks and rolling hills that melded together in the kind of harmony that was lacking in the city. The hovercraft approached a particularly tall mountain peak, and I realized we were losing height the closer we got to it. We passed very close to the mountain's charcoal blue summit, and I was able to see the green pools of water that had stagnated in some of the crevices. Once we had cleared the mountain, I craned my neck down and spotted the huge fleet of spaceships docked against the mountain range. They varied in size and shape, but even from my distance I noticed the similarities that united the fleet. Most of the ships were sleek and aerodynamic and their front decks were designed to mimic the snarling muzzle of a dragon. The nacelles were shaped like wings, and some even boasted a series of outer guns and pods that resembled the spikes that coated dragon hide. The fleet looked impressive from the sky, but as we sunk lower, I saw the true beauty was in the power of the forces that surrounded the fleet. The Drakens were a smaller group within the larger multiverse. The Hyles' reign were smaller still. I recognized the warlike appearance of their ships with their protruding missile launchers and the decidedly aggressive snarling face that formed the mouths of several ships. Sand flew up in a whirlwind around us as the hovercraft touched down between two massive spaceships. Before the dust had settled, 
the door beeped up and exposed us to the harsh terrain we had landed in. Come with me, the lot of you, Deverin commanded. He was standing in front of the craft, clicking his talons together impatiently. Ah, except you. He was looking right at me, and I felt my legs turn to jelly. What were they going to do with me? I hadn't been a purchase. I had been a gift. Renell, he asked, looking towards the older dragon. Do you have a use for her? Renell turned to me. She can stay on Dashel's ship until I find something for her to do. Take her to one of the cells. I'll confer with Dashel first. Take the rest of them to the wyvern. The slaves' quarters have been readied. Once he had given his orders, he walked away. His strides were militant, his legs barely bent. I wondered if that was indicative of his personality. Malik, Deverin called out to a dragon with ice-blue scales and eyes that resembled a cinder block. Take this lot to the wyvern and install them in the slaves' quarters. What about this one? Malik asked, giving me the once-over. His eyes were filled with blatant curiosity, and I saw him lick his lips. A new slave, Deron replied. She belongs to your commander. He won't mind if I play with her for a little while, would he? Deverin let out a low, menacing snarl that had me cringing back in fright. Malik, however, looked amused. I was only joking, he laughed. You lot, come with me. He gave me a parting glance before he led the other slaves down a different path. Deverin turned to me and gestured for me to follow him. He led me into a large ship, whose entrance walls were carved with an impressive motif of dragons. The further in we walked, I realized that the motifs were telling a story. I wondered if it was narrating the history of the Traconic Empires. It was clear Deverin was taking me through the back channels of the ship. The passageways were narrow and dimly lit, and they seemed to get smaller the further we walked. Finally, he stopped outside a thick black door that was framed with metal studs. Inside, Deverin ordered me. I wanted to ask him what they were planning on doing with me, but I was too scared to speak to him directly. The moment I walked in, the door slammed shut on me, and the sound reverberated through the lonely room. It looked like a holding cell with no light and no character. Just a dark hole that was meant to stamp out all light and all hope. I was thirsty, but there was no water in the room. So I slipped down to the ground, resting my arms on my knees. It seemed that most of my life consisted of waiting for the next horrible thing to happen. What would it be for me now? The best I could hope for was to be put to work in the kitchens. I would be out of sight of my fearsome new owners, and I could sneak away little bits of food if I ever got too hungry. Hunger had been my constant companion in my previous life as a slave to Goret Gore. He liked to keep his slaves underfed, for what reason I couldn't possibly say. I used to serve him food at supper, and he used to make me watch as he ate every mouthful. There were days I was so hungry, I used to lean in every time he opened his mouth to take a bite. The room he ate in was large and circular, it reminded me of a harem, filled with gaudy cushions and mismatched prints and intricate wall hangings that hid the moon rock walls from view. The carpet was a fevered red that he often slid down into after a particularly long meal. The table where the food was laid was a thick block of sable wood, and even after Gorat Gore had finished eating, it was still full of food. I still remember that night when Goret Gore had caught me picking at the discarded food on his table. He had only pretended to leave so that he could watch me. He waited until I had a large piece of craked meat in my mouth before storming into the room and shoving me onto my back. 
First, he had made me spit out the meat, and then he had turned his pincer-like claws on me. I still had the scars on both of my arms. I shook my head, trying to dislodge that memory from my brain. But I was hungry, and whenever hunger pains assaulted my stomach, I couldn't help thinking of Gorat Gore. I hoped he had choked to death on crake meat at some point after he had passed me into Win Odell's ownership. I leaned against the cool wall of my cell and stared at the depressing gray steel that made up the ceiling. If I stood on my tiptoes and reached up with my hand outstretched, I could almost touch it. There were deep claw marks ingrained into the walls, and I wondered if anger or desperation had caused them. I counted all the distinct scratches that marked the walls, but I gave up when I got to 113. I was tracing my finger along a particularly artistic indentation when I heard the latch to my door click open. I was hoping it would be the younger dragon, Deverin, but it was the older one, Rennell. He didn't enter the cell. It was much too small to allow his height anyway. His eyes were shrouded in shadow, but I could still make out the gaunt hardness of his features. In their shifter forms, most dragon looked distinctly human, but this one was different. His scales encroached onto his face. The textured scales coated his jaw and curved around his left eye like a frame. You're in luck. It turns out we need a scullery maid, he said gruffly. But until the wyvern's repairs have been completed... You will be staying here on this ship. I gulped and nodded, wondering what the appropriate way to address him was. Come on, he said, raising his voice. I suppressed the cringe I could feel coming and moved towards him. He moved back only an inch to allow me to pass. My hand grazed his forearm, and I felt the textured toughness of the scales on his skin. I was weak as I passed over the threshold, and I stumbled over my own feet on the way out. I saw the floor coming towards my face, and my hands flashed out instinctively. I screamed as a searing bite of pain threaded through my hand. I looked down to see one of my fingers lying to one side in a decidedly broken position. Oh, no, I sobbed. The fatigue of hunger, combined with the bursting pain in my hand, reduced me to a fragile mess. And before I could will myself into calm, I had started crying. When I was brave enough to glance upward, I saw that Rennell was looking at me with more than a little distaste, as though my tears were personally offending him. He met my eyes only for a moment before he sighed in frustration. Then... To my complete and utter shock, he bent down and lifted me off the ground and into his arms. I was so caught off guard that the tears dried on my cheeks and I just stared at him. He walked through the labyrinth of narrow passageways without a word. Well, what are you going to do with me? I stammered. The medical bay. I, what? I asked stupidly. Your finger is broken, he replied gruffly. It needs to be set. I blinked at him. I had never expected to find humanity in someone like him. I... thank you, I said, after a long silence. He didn't look at me. He didn't answer. Instead... He tried very hard to avoid my eyes altogether. Chapter 4 Rennell Of course, it was just like a human. They tripped over their own feet and were reduced to weeping messes at the sight of a small injury. That was one thing I understood about their kind. They hated pain. They did anything to avoid it. It was one of the reasons they made such good slaves. 
The promise of pain was all it took to keep them in line. She was light as a hatchling in my arms. Her flesh was so soft I could have torn her apart in seconds using only my teeth. It was a wonder her kind had existed so long outside their puny planet. Her eyes kept darting to my face every few seconds. I wondered if growling in her face would put a stop to it, but something stopped me from acting on the impulse. Was it the way her hand had absent-mindedly curled over my shoulder? Was it because I didn't want to displace the soft, unkempt hair that spilled over her arm and tickled my neck? I thought about Carissa and Tyrion, Lahar and Laura, Dashiell and Natalie. They had all fallen for human women. I had never understood why. They were weak creatures, insignificant, slight, slaves. And yet, there was something to be said about vulnerability. Her eyes flitted to my face again. This time I turned just in time to catch her stolen glance. Her eyes widened and I saw a blossom of color burgeon on her cheeks like blood on fresh snow. What are you staring at, slave? I growled, keeping my voice low and intimidating. She opened her mouth, but nothing came out. Your eyes are green, she blurted out. The moment she said the words, I realized she hadn't meant to speak at all. She dropped her gaze immediately, and I saw a fresh blush of embarrassment flood her cheeks. Draken never cop to weakness, and it was weakness to allow others a glimpse into your mind. We were a proud people who hid our true emotions behind steel expressions. It was new and intriguing to see a creature whose inner thoughts and feelings were laid bare for all to see. The medical bay was empty when I walked in. It was always left open should any draken need to use the supplies on board. We were resourceful and independent, which meant we preferred to tend to our own wounds. Of course, humans were children, and they were used to relying on others to alleviate their pains and injuries. The medical bay was made up of four large walls. One wall was almost completely hidden by large shelved cabinets that contained medicines, pills, and healing remedies to treat everything from chilling scabs to deep cuts. A long steel table had been set against the second wall, and it contained bandages and other medical utensils that were normally used in surgical procedures. There were three broad beds pushed up against the third wall for any draken who had suffered serious injury that required overnight assistance. The middle of this space was taken up by a center island, which contained a sink and drawers for various other miscellaneous items. I set the woman-child on the flat slab of the center island and rummaged around for a brace to set her finger. The whole time I looked, I could feel her eyes on my back. The braces we had on hand were made for Draken, so they were much too large for her finger. But I improvised by breaking off a piece of wood with my teeth. I retrieved a small piece of thick, gauzy material from the first aid kit in the supplies cabinet and placed both items down next to her. There, set your finger in that. It'll be fine in a few days, I said. She glanced down at the wood and gauze next to her. Uh, I'll try doing it, she mumbled under her breath. She reached out and picked up the piece of wood gingerly. She turned it over in her hand and then shot me a self-conscious glance. I growled low with irritation. You don't know what to do. Do you? Actually, I do. I'm not an idiot, she said suddenly. A spark of anger danced in her eyes for a second before it was extinguished by fear. I mean, I just... I don't know if I can do it one-handed. 
Dracoon set limbs one-handed all the time, I scoffed. I am not a Dracoon, she said, and I noticed the ice in her tone. She was more spirited than I had first assumed. Rather than irritate, it impressed. I watched as she picked up the wood brace with her good hand and attempted to hold it against her broken finger. She winced from the pain, and I saw her hand tremble. She tried to reach for the gauze when the brace fell between her legs and slipped down onto the floor. I mashed my teeth together and walked towards her. I picked up the fallen brace and straightened up. Give me your hand, I commanded. For a second, she didn't move. She just sat there, staring at me with uncertainty. What are you going to do? she asked. What do you think? I said impatiently. I took her small hand into my palm and examined the break first. It was a simple enough task, but I found myself getting distracted by the feel of her palm against mine. It was an intimacy I wasn't accustomed to, and it stirred something inside me that I thought had died a long time ago. That realization made me suddenly furious. There was nothing special about this human, so why did I feel the need to examine her face? Why did I feel the need to make sure her finger was set correctly? Why did I feel responsible for her? My anger seeped into my fingers, and I abandoned all attempts at being gentle. I saw her wince from the pain of my rough handling. It hurts, I asked. I've had worse, she replied. I've almost died more times than I can count. Tripped on a flat surface, I asked. I saw the same flicker of anger pass through her eyes, but she reined it in this time. Sure, why not, she said. I suppose it doesn't matter to you either way. No, I agreed. It doesn't matter to me. But that was a lie, and it irked me to admit it, even if it was only to myself. Arr, she said in a soft voice as my claws rubbed against her broken finger. There, I said, ignoring her. It's done. The finger should be fully functional in a few days. I pulled away the moment I was done and put several feet between us. She stared at her little cast. Her eyes were blanketed in an emotion I couldn't recognize. Thank you, she said softly. I started walking toward the medical bay's large sliding doors. Come with me, I said, and try to keep up. I could hear her scurrying after me, her breaths coming in short, sharp bursts. If I concentrated really hard, I could even hear her heartbeat beat steadily against her ribcage. I walked through Dashiell's monster of a ship, leaving the medical bay behind and entering the heart of Gignar. I noticed the girl's eyes scan the area, and I realized that everything, from the contoured white walls to the domed glass ceiling, must have been new to her. Our spaceships were different from every other species in the galaxy. While they boasted smaller, sleeker designs, our ships were built for strength rather than speed. I walked through one of the sliding partitions that led to the arched tunnel corridor, with light filaments recessed into the spherical ceiling. We walked the length of it until we reached the petal orb that served as a doorway to the back chambers of the ship. The petal orb opened gracefully and allowed us to step into the dimly lit passageway that led to the kitchens and the scullery. Through there is the kitchen, I told her gesturing towards the large square doors that slid open easily with just the press of a button. It was one of the few parts of the ship that was accessible to all. You'll have to follow the cook's orders. This is where you will work most days, I said as we reached the scullery. Go on, I said, gesturing for her to walk inside. She moved into the scullery with careful steps, 
as though she were worried I would attack her suddenly when her back was to me. You will wash the dishes, scrub the floors, and I know how to be a scullery maid, she interrupted, turning on the spot. In fact, I've been a scullery maid before. Have you? I asked. And how did that go? Her face dropped noticeably, though she tried hard not to give herself away. I was mildly amused, but I kept my expression straight and domineering. I will. It went reasonably well, she replied. Reasonably well, I repeated. That doesn't sound like an answer. She looked up at me with large doe eyes. They were a soft honey caramel that stood out against the dark earthiness of her hair. Her face was small and oval-shaped. The one cheek that hadn't been marred by her clever tattoo was rosy, even in the absence of a blush, and she had two tiny birthmarks just beneath her right eye. I had a feeling that among her kind she would be considered beautiful. I, um, there was an incident when I was in charge of the kitchens, she admitted at last. A small fire. You caused a fire, I asked. It was a small one, she said quickly, as though that information was meant to be comforting. And they managed to put it out fast. Only a few people were injured. No one died. I raised one eyebrow and surveyed her with clinical interest. Why do I get the feeling that people dying around you is a common occurrence? Her face paled visibly and I realized I had touched a nerve. I saw her jaw tremble slightly, and her body turned inward somehow, as though she were trying to hide in plain sight. This mark on my face, she whispered, lifting her hand to her right cheek. Do you know what it means? I nodded. Yes. Bad luck follows me everywhere. I can see that. The packs didn't give me to you to be kind. They were trying to get rid of me. I'm aware, I nodded. One of their better plans. If you knew what I was, why did you buy me? She asked. I wondered what had emboldened her to think she could ask questions of me. Perhaps this was my own fault. I was the one who had engaged her. That was the thing about humans. Sometimes they forgot they were slaves. They clung stubbornly to their autonomy as though it were theirs by right. Because I don't believe in bad omens, I heard myself reply. I don't believe in good luck or bad. I believe that luck is what we make. She looked down, a small, sad smile playing against her face. I used to believe that, too. But you don't any more, I asked. No, she said, looking towards the dirty dishes that formed a leaning tower on one of the three large sinks. I attract bad luck. Maybe believing that attracts the bad luck in the first place. She seemed to consider that for a moment. I, maybe you're right. I usually am. I said, now get to work. She seemed taken aback by my blunt command. Instinctively, she looked down at her broken finger. I, how can I do anything with this? She asked. I set my jaw firmly and took a few steps towards her. She shrank back with renewed fear, and I took a small amount of pleasure from the uncertainty in her eyes. I don't give a damn, I growled making my voice as menacing as possible. You are a slave. You do what you're told to do. I saw her eyes grow cold at my words, but she nodded slowly. Good. I nodded, before turning to leave. Yvette. What? I asked, turning back to her. My name is Yvette. I thought you should know that. 
I knitted my eyebrows together, trying to figure out this strange human. She looked broken and defeated. And yet there was hidden steel lying just beneath the surface. I was fairly certain not even she realized that yet. I don't care what your name is, I said, even though the sound of her name was already imprinted in my memory. You are nothing more than a slave to me. Is that why you took me to the medical room and helped me with my finger? She asked. Careful now, I said, glaring at her. Careful. Just because I accepted you from the Pax doesn't mean I can't return you to them. She looked down, and I saw her shoulders hunch from the weight of all the words she was leaving unsaid. I was walking back towards the door when I heard the shattering of glass. I turned and saw the bones of a fallen plate scattered across the floor before her feet. Apparently even breathing is dangerous with you, I said. The rise and fall of her chest was decidedly panicked. I decided to capitalize on the moment, so I walked towards her with exaggerated slowness. Perhaps keeping you around was not the best idea, I said, licking my lips. Perhaps I should just throw you out of my ship once we're in the air. She closed her eyes for a moment, as though the sight of me was too much for her. I savored that feeling for a second. It was nice to be feared. The moment the fear was gone in an instant, so too was the control. Chapter 5 Yvette Once Renelle had left, I felt like I could breathe normally again. What was it about the strange dragon that had me feeling flustered? frightened, and self-conscious all in the same breath. I had a sneaking suspicion that it had to do with the way he looked at me. Most other creatures looked at me with obvious lasciviousness. It was as though they were undressing me with their eyes. With Renell, it felt more like he wanted to see past my clothes to the core of who I was. Knowledge was power. If you knew a person well enough, you could use their secrets and their weaknesses against them. Which is why I reminded myself to be extra careful around the intimidating draken. He was smarter than the rest. I had seen that in his shrewd eyes. I tried to push his image from my mind as I turned my attention to the scullery's design. It was certainly a large space with three massive sinks installed into one of the scullery's walls. I walked around the space, familiarizing myself with the plate racks, drain pipes, storage shelves, and two long work tables that contained various coppers for boiling water. There was a long line of storage cupboards to the left of the scullery, and it contained an extensive collection of mops, brooms, vacuums, and other cleaning tools, only some of which I knew how to use. I was examining a strange oblong piece of equipment that had been stored next to the brooms when the adjoining door to the kitchen slid open soundlessly to reveal a round-faced Norsian. He had a thin mane and sallow blue skin. His expression was bitter and impatient, and he looked at me with distaste. You're the temporary scullery maid? He growled. A human. Bah! I sighed inwardly. I'm a hard worker. What's wrong with your hand? I looked down at my broken finger. Um, it'll heal. And a broken human. The Norsian cook complained, shaking his head so that his mild-mannered mane shivered slightly. Stay out of my sight, human. You will come only when commanded and speak only when spoken to. Understood? I nodded silently. The Norsian narrowed his eyes at me and then nodded with some satisfaction. 
Before I could ask him what the contraption in my hands did, he turned, and the door slid closed on his back. I put the oblong cleaning utensil back in the storage cupboard and turned towards the pile of dirty dishes and platters that were piled high on a large trolley that had been parked beside the first sink. Left with no choice, I started on the washing, moving slowly so as not to disrupt my broken finger. It proved to be far more challenging than I had anticipated, but it kept my mind occupied. Once I had finished with the plates and dishes, I decided to take a stab at cleaning the floors. They were incredibly sticky, and I could tell because there was a bit of pull every time I lifted my feet. The threadbare woven slippers I wore created only a thin barrier against the worst of the grime. My finger posed somewhat of a challenge, but I managed to work around it. I was just mopping the area when the doors to the scullery opened, and I saw someone's shadow cast itself along the entrance. For a moment, I was worried that it would be Renell come back again to make me feel small and inadequate. But when I turned, I realized the person standing before me was blonde, fine-boned, and very human. Hello, she greeted. You must be the new scullery maid. I heard you were human, and I thought I'd come down here and see for myself. Who was she? She was wearing the leathers of the Hiles reign. Her blonde hair had been braided several times and wound into a top knot at the back of her head. Her stance was one of authority, and most glaring of all, there was no collar around her neck. I'm Carissa, she continued, when I said nothing. Carissa? I croaked awkwardly. You... Don't worry, Carissa said, walking up to me. You needn't fear me. I mean you no harm. Ask me anything and I will answer it for you. But first, you will answer a question for me. I paused. I'll try... Carissa smiled. What's your name? My name? Why did it feel so good to be asked that question? Maybe because it was the core of my identity, the start of who I was and who I would end up being. I had gone through entire years without anyone ever mentioning my name. After a while... You start to see yourself the way others see you. A nameless ghost with no life, no family, and no future. It always started with a name. Yvette, I said, wishing I sounded more confident. That's a lovely name. You're not wearing a collar, I said. The thought burst from my lips before I had a chance to second-guess myself. No, Carissa said, shaking her head. I am not a slave. Then what are you? I asked. It sounded like a silly question, but I genuinely wanted to know. She was human, and the only thing humans were valued for in the greater universe was their role as slaves. I am the same person I've always been, Carissa replied. But I kept my wits about me, and I refused to let the collar around my neck define the person I was. So, you were a slave at one point? I asked, wondering if she had meant to tell me that or if it had just slipped out in the moment. I was a slave, yes, she replied. And... Now I am second-in-command to Captain Tarion. Second-in-command, I whispered, in awe of a story that seemed too far-fetched to even dream about. How did you manage that? Carissa smiled and came forward as if we were old friends who were catching up after a decade of absence. Well, marrying him helped. I knew 
My jaw was hanging down and my eyes were wide with disbelief. But I couldn't hide my reaction. I had heard that some dracot took humans to the marriage altar, I admitted. I just never thought... It was actually true, Carissa offered. Well, yes, it's true, Carissa nodded. In fact, it's more common than you might think. Tarion and I are only one of many mixed-species couples in the fleet. But you were his slave, I said. I was, Carissa agreed. But no one has any control of how they feel, not even dragons. No matter how strong and powerful, even they are slaves to their feelings. So, you fell in love with one of them? I asked. I was aware that I was prying, but I didn't really care enough to stop. I did, Carissa nodded. And he fell in love with me. I know it's a difficult concept to wrap your head around. I thought about Renell and the exchange we had shared this morning. I couldn't deny that I was curious about him. He was an enigma that I wanted to figure out. But he owned me. I was his plaything. No better than an object in his world. I couldn't imagine looking at him with anything other than resentment. I went to slave school, I blurted out. Carissa stopped short. You went to serve a skull arm, she asked, using its given name. I spent almost a year in that prison. Hearing about how I no longer existed, I exclaimed. I was nothing more than a tool to be used at my master's pleasure. I was whatever he wanted me to be. If he wanted me to cook, then I would make his meals. If he wanted me to dance, then I would learn as many steps as it took. If he wanted me in his bed, I had no choice but to satisfy his every need. I know how you feel, Yvette, Carissa said gently. How could you possibly... Because I went to serve us, she said, cutting me off. I stared at her. You? You too? Yes, Carissa nodded. I completed all three years before I graduated. I can't remember you. No, I was there before your time, Carissa nodded. It has been almost two decades since I've seen those nightmarish gray battlements. I shuddered under the memory. I remembered the battlements perfectly. The slave school was built like a fortress with high walls that ended in crenellated tops and flying buttresses that were fitted with special microscopes that caught every single movement in a 360-degree radius. It was impossible to escape. Many had tried, and their skeletons now decorated the highest watchtowers within the fortress. When did you graduate? Carissa asked. Her tone was tempered by regret and sympathy. Five years ago, I replied. I spent three years there under Magdasa Yuri's charge. I haven't heard of her. No, I said. My eyes flitted back to the past for a moment. No, she arrived at the school shortly before I did. She was a Gorbeck, one of the most ruthless Gorbecks I've ever met. It was rumored that she ate the skins of any slave that attempted to run away. I focused my eyes on Carissa and stared at her unblinkingly. I still believe she did. The school was never a place for happy stories, Carissa said. I recognized the detachment in her tone. Years of freedom had taken the edge off her memories and left them feeling distant. If she had pain, it had been washed away by decades of happiness. I hated her for that. They ripped me from my home. I flared up. They stole me away, pulled me into a galaxy I wanted no part of. 
and brought me straight to that hellhole in the middle of the universe to be trained. They took everything from me. They must have done the same to you. Carissa glanced down. My story is similar, yes. Then why aren't you as outraged as I am? Carissa sighed. Because anger is not useful in this life, she said. There are other emotions that are more effective. I looked down, unable to relate to this woman, this stranger with a familiar face. When I had first seen Carissa, I had been relieved. Another human on board meant an ally against the draken. But in listening to Carissa speak, I realized something. She was one of them now. She may have looked human, but I saw the hard lines around her eyes and the way she held herself. They had made a draken out of her. Yvette, Carissa started. I turned away from her and continued with my mopping. I should get back to work, ma'am, I said, using a tone of mock respect. Yvette, you don't have to do that, Carissa said, stepping around me. You can use my name. Would your husband like that? I asked. I tried to contain the aching sense of betrayal I felt looking at Carissa, but I was battling with too many competing emotions in one day and I had never been very good at hiding how I really felt. My husband has come to see the human race in a different light, Carissa said. If he hadn't, then I would not be by his side now. Does your husband own slaves? I asked pointedly. Carissa hesitated. We treat them well, with respect and kindness, she insisted. They are better off being slaves to us rather than the Pax Alliance. If we free them, they won't survive on their own. The Pax will hunt them down and put them up for auction in another slave market on another planet. At least here, they're safe. I turned my back on her. I'm a slave in your fleet, and I don't feel safe. Has anyone harmed you? Carissa asked. I hesitated. If you were my slave, I would have freed you, Yvette, Carissa said. But you do not belong to me or my husband. No, I belong to that brute in red scales, I said, before I could stop myself. Renell, he can be harsh at times. Harsh? I repeated incredulously. Is that how you would describe him? He's gentler than he seems, Carissa said, and kinder than you'd imagine. He just... He has been through a lot. I snorted loudly, and the sound surprised even me. He has been through a lot? I repeated with indignation. I know that sounds... I don't care what he has been through, I said, before Carissa could finish her sentence. He is not the slave. I am. Some would argue that grief and pain could be chains in their own right. So he's lost someone he cares about? I said. Who cares? My entire family is lost to me. I don't know where they are, if they're alive or dead. And my squad, my men. Tears lobbed themselves in my throat and made it impossible for me to continue. No, I wouldn't go there now. That memory burned my soul every time I relived it. Carissa looked at me with sad eyes. For a moment, I thought she was going to leave and let me stew in my anger. But instead, she walked closer to me. I know you're not going to want to hear this, Carissa said softly. I know this won't make any sense to you now. I know you will see this as a betrayal. I understand all that. 
but I need you to understand something, too. We all do what it takes to survive. It is the one thing that is true of every species in the known universe. Everyone wants to live, and when you've resolved to survive, you need to do things that are sometimes morally questionable. You need to make the choice, and you need to see it through. I frowned. Taken by her words, despite the fact that I had no idea what she was talking about. I don't know what... Befriend your owner, Yvette, Carissa counseled. Befriend the draken, and who knows? Something good might come out of it. You want me to make peace with my captor? I asked. There are some things none of us can change. The slave trade is one of them. Since you cannot change that, you must find another way to survive. By befriending Ranel? His name slipped free from my lips, and I instantly regretted it. Carissa was staring at me with her head cocked to one side. I understand that what I'm saying may sound impossible, Carissa continued, but I am uniquely qualified to advise you, because I have been in your position. I was a slave just like you, and I had a dragon master just like you. And yet, somehow, I found peace. I found happiness. And, most importantly, I found love. Now our children run through the halls of our ship, and I can't even imagine a time when I didn't love my husband. Then you're lucky, I said, waving away her words as nonsense in my head. Not all of us can be. Carissa's eyes lingered for a moment on my three-leaf clover tattoo. Then she nodded and turned for the door. If you need anything of it, you can always come to me. Carissa stood at the threshold for a second longer. Her eyes lingered on my face, and then she turned and disappeared from view. As angry as I had been a moment ago, I was disappointed to find myself alone again. Sometimes silence could be claustrophobic, and I felt its gnarly fingers wrap themselves around my body. Carissa had advised me to make friends with my brooding captor. I bristled against the idea on principle. His surly fierceness was armor, and I knew I wouldn't be able to puncture through it. I continued working, but I couldn't get the conversation with Carissa out of my head. Was I being stubborn by dismissing her advice? That night. When I was lying alone on my thin, hard mattress, staring up at the claw marks that decorated the ceiling of my cell, I started to think about what it would be like to befriend Renelle. I started to wonder what it would be like to talk to him as equals. I started to really think about it. Chapter 6 Renelle did you see any strange behavior when you were in the slave market? Dashiell asked me. I took a hunk of gourmet meat and bit into it. The flesh was tender, but it had a certain amount of chew. No more than usual, I replied. The Paxil lion still dominates the market. The room we were sitting in was a large oval-shaped space with high ceilings and a window that overlooked the fleets that all three of us commanded. Did you buy from them? Only one slave, I admitted. The Norshan nanny. Dashiell and Tarion exchanged a glance. The one you purchased to look after our children? I narrowed my eyes at both of them. If you have a problem with my choice, maybe the two of you should have been down there buying your own fucking nannies. Dashiell smiled. We checked her collar. It was free of ticks and bugs. What about the other one? 
Parian asked. Other one? Dashiell repeated. He bought another slave from the packs, didn't you? Tarion asked, turning toward me. Carissa mentioned that she met the girl. Of course Carissa had taken it upon herself to visit my slave. I hope she hadn't filled the girl's head with ridiculous ideas of freedom. A human? Dashiell asked, looking interested. I didn't buy her, I admitted. She was given to me. Given to you? Dashiell asked, sitting up a little straighter as concern colored his dark features. The packs never give anything up for free, especially not to one of our kind. The girl is marked, I explained. An ill omen, Dashiell said with a frown. Why did you accept her? They clearly meant to insult. I don't believe in ill omens, I growled, and neither should you. We are the Hyles Rain Dragons. We reap what we sow. He got the girl for free, Tarion said with a shrug. Where have you put her to work? In the scullery, I replied gruffly. She's probably wrecked the whole fucking place by now. Tarion and Dashiell exchanged a glance. Why do you say that? Dashiell asked. Never mind, I said. Bring the girl in to clear our plates, Tarion said, curiosity coloring his tone. I was about to protest, but thought better of it. Tarion and Dashiell would just find a way to read into it. So I rang in through the intercom and summoned the girl to come and clear away our plates. There are two different kinds of mulberry pies on the table, I pointed out. Dashiell shrugged. The children like it, he smiled. And I've developed a fondness for mulberry myself. Yes. The children. Ever since my fellow brothers had taken their human wives to bed, our fleet had been overrun with hatchlings. Of course, they weren't hatchlings at all. Tarion, Dashiell, and I had all hatched from eggs. But this new generation was different. They had grown in their mother's bellies before hissing and screaming their way into the world seemed to me to be a messy and unnecessary process. The humans had strange ways, and it shocked me still that those ways had slowly taken root within our own traditions. There was a tentative knock on the door, and I knew that the girl had arrived. Enter, I called. It took a while for the door to open, and when it did, I saw her struggling with it. Drakenwood was immensely heavy, and I realized that with her broken finger and two left feet, it must have been difficult to maneuver. She had a large wheel trolley that she was trying to slip through the door before it could close on her. My first instinct was to walk over and help her, but I reminded myself that she was a slave, and Darian and Dasha were watching. Most of our ships were equipped with sliding or automatic doors, but there were still a handful of traditional doors that peppered the ships, hearkening to the architecture of our past. She finally managed to get inside, and I could see the steady rise and fall of her chest. The skin there was pale, punctured by spots of color that might have been a result of exertion. The fabric of her slave's garment had been displaced slightly to highlight the tops of her breasts. I looked back towards the remaining food on the table. Clear the dishes, I ordered her, and be quick about it. She has an injury, Renell, Dashiell pointed out. Fine, I grunted. Take your time. Her eyes flashed to my face, but I looked away. She came around the table towards me and took my plate first. Is there anything I can get you, sir? 
she asked, her tone marked with respect. I looked at her searchingly, wondering at the shift in her attitude. No. Do you require any more refreshment? she asked. Just clear the table, I said. She nodded willingly and started moving between chairs, taking plates and stacking them against her forearm. Is that a good idea? I couldn't help but ask. You're bound to drop them. I can manage, she said. Thank you for your concern. My concern is for the cutlery, I said brusquely. I was aware that Tarion was watching me carefully, and he was starting to annoy me. Something on your mind, Tarion? I demanded, addressing him directly. He raised his eyebrows. A few things, he nodded. I ground my teeth together, and Tarion's smile only grew wider. The girl seemed oblivious to our little exchange. Once her hands were full, she stacked the plates onto her trolley and then came back to the table to take the serving dishes. She was a few feet from Tarion when his hand reached out and grabbed her arm. My head snapped towards them and I felt my body tense immediately. Stand still, Tarion said. Let me look at you. What are you doing? I growled. Tarion looked at me with barely concealed amusement. Just inspecting your new purchase, he said. You don't mind, do you? He was trying to goad me, and he knew I had never been very good at hiding how I really felt. Let the girl go. Tarion glanced around her at me. She's very comely. Carissa mentioned it, too. The girl has work to do, I said, as my words grew more clipped. Come now, Tarion, Dashiell said, stepping in. She's not your slave to inspect. Leave her to her work. Tarion smiled and released the girl. She stumbled back and looked over to me with pink cheeks that were flushed with embarrassment. What was it about this girl? She made me feel like I needed to protect her all the time. I gestured to the empty serving dishes on the table. Go on. She nodded and continued with her work, although this time I could see that she was making an attempt to be as fast as possible. Once she had cleared everything away, she pushed the trolley back towards the heavy door. She hesitated for a moment before pulling hard at its dragon-helmed handle with her good hand. It barely budged. I gave a deep sigh and went to help her. Her face was red with struggle when I approached her, and it made me smile despite myself. Move aside. I said, I'll open it for you. I can do it, she said stubbornly. I snorted. Move aside, I said firmly. She sighed with defeat and took a few steps to the left. I pulled open the door with one hand and grabbed the trolley with the other. I pulled it out into the wide entrance passageway and the girl followed quickly behind me. There was a sharp crack of the door as it shut on us. Come on, I said, pushing the trolley down the passageway. What are you doing? She asked, running after me. You're not going to be able to get this trolley back to the scullery in one piece if I don't help you, I said gruffly. I could try. We both know how that'll turn out. She seemed as taken aback by my behavior as I was. I had never been inclined to help the slaves. So why was I doing it now? When we got back to the scullery, I pushed the trolley through the doorway and parked it by the sink for convenience's sake. Get to work, I barked. I'm not going to stand here and wash them with you. 
Her hand reached out and landed on my forearm. I stared down at it for a moment, feeling a strange prickle of warmth cut through my scales. Her hand was so light and small. It was perhaps the prettiest thing I had ever seen, with long fingers that ended in harmless little nails that could do no damage. It set a stark contrast to my large, tough, plated arms that had no grace or beauty. Thank you, she said as her eyes met mine. I cleared my throat. Your finger is broken and the trolley was heavy. Not for this, she said. I meant thank you for stopping him back there. Should a human's eyes be that large? It was unnatural. I pulled away from her abruptly and made for the door. I didn't even glance behind before I left. I just headed back to the dining gallery as fast as I could manage. Darian and Dashiell were standing by the gallery window when I arrived. They had their backs to me, and I was grateful not to have to look either one of them in the eye. I was hoping to avoid talking about the girl altogether, but the moment I joined them at the window, Tarion turned to me with a smile on his face. That was kind of you, he said meaningfully. Our fleets can't stay here indefinitely, I said, ignoring him pointedly. We'll need to move out soon. I'm a little surprised, Rennell, Tarion continued. I thought you preferred Drake's to Ness's. I gritted my teeth and let out a low growl. I prefer nothing and no one. The only thing on my mind right now is my crew and my ship. So you don't find her pretty? Tarion asked. Dashiell sighed. Tarion, just drop it. It's a simple question. She's a human, I spat. That's not an answer, Tarion replied. And even so, humans are not so different from us. Aren't they? I demanded. I wasn't aware they could shift into dragons at will. We are not so different from them when we're in our shifter bodies. She is a slave, I snapped and I am a commander of the Hyle's reign. As we all were with our women before they became our wives, Dashiell pointed out softly. Your choice to crossbreed is your own, I replied. I want no part in it. Now stop this nonsense. We need to discuss the future of the fleet. I could see that Tarion wanted to tease me some more about the girl, but Dashiell sent him a glare that convinced him to leave me alone. Have we received the report yet? I asked, steering the topic firmly back to matters of the fleet commanders. We just received word that Modoc has arrived, Dashiell said. He will be here shortly. Modoc? I asked. He manages communications between Theron and the fleet, Dashiell replied. He will be traveling on my ship for the time being, and I asked him to see if he could get any information that might be useful to us. I frowned. He's playing the role of informant? Don't you think that's a little risky? He's a dragon of the Hyle's reign, Dashiell said immediately. We can trust him. At that exact moment... There came a loud knock on the door. Enter, Dashiell called. The door pushed open to reveal a broad-shouldered dragon with sinewy, ash-blonde hair and white scales. He was wearing dark colors that emphasized the snowy beauty of his draconic endowments. His face was square-shaped and classical in feature, while his eyes were a murky blue that was shrouded in a detached apathy that I found dangerous. Modoc, Dashiell said, turning to him. What have our spies got to say? 
There is talk that the Pax Alliance is on the move, Modoc said, his eyes ranging around the room as though he were nervous. I don't know details, but I believe they're planning another conquest. Of course they are, I snorted. They always are. Surely a planet or two was mentioned. Modoc didn't even meet my eyes when he answered. Rawl. Rawl? I said, narrowing my eyes at the somber-faced draken. Rawl is heavily fortified. Even the Pax Alliance would not dare to attempt a conquest on Rawl. Wouldn't they? Tarion asked. The natural resources on Rawl are extremely valuable. The Pax Alliance have a standing trade deal with the Rawly, I pointed out. They get what they want from the planet as it stands. But they pay for it. Modoc spoke up in his carefully monotone voice. If they take Rawl, not only will they have unlimited resources, but they can also block any other species from purchasing Raleigh metals. The Pax have always had bold ambitions, Dashiell nodded. It could be a feint, I said. What do you mean? Rawl is not so far from Theron, I pointed out. What if the Pax mean to take Theron? Theron? Dashiell repeated, with a disbelieving smile on his face. Our home planet? They wouldn't dare, Tarion said sharply. They don't want to start another war with us. They have no reason to start a war with the Raleigh, I said, through gritted teeth. But the war between the Pax and the Hyles reign has been brewing for decades now. Even if Theron is not under threat, Rawl is not so far from our borders. We should set course for Theron immediately, I said. If there's even a chance our planet is being threatened, we need to be there to protect it. Theron is not the planet being threatened, Modoc said, shifting from one leg to the other. Spies can sometimes mistake lies for truth and musings for plans, I countered. There is no way the Pax will target Theron, Dashiell said calmly. They fear us too much, Tarion nodded. We have power on our side, I nodded, but not the numbers. The Pax, on the other hand are the rodents of our galaxy, Tarion interrupted forcefully, and we will exterminate them once and for all. But we have no reason to fear them. What are you suggesting? Dashiell asked. We continue with our plans to raid Grisa. It is a small planet, but it's rich with coin, Tarion said. We need more credits. The last few updates we undertook on our fleet depleted our reserves. We need to replace them. Rennell, Dashiell asked. What say you? I think we need to make for Theron. We can pillage once our planet is safe. I could see Tarion looking at me with barely concealed annoyance. Our intelligence says that Theron is not the planet under threat. We have no reason to change our plans. We need to replenish our credit stores. Dashiell looked out towards the fleet. Lahar is conducting some business on his ship, he said. We will make a decision when he is here. The need to pillage was strong among our kind. I could see the lust for plundering reflected in both Dashiell and Tarion's eyes. I had a strong suspicion I would lose this vote, and it made me weary. Chapter 7 Yvette The sinks in the scullery were massive, robust squares that had been built for larger beings. I could tell that they had been designed with vents or Norsians in mind. 
because I needed a step stool in order to be able to do the washing properly. Of course, the only step stool available in the scullery was almost two feet tall, and that meant I had to hunch slightly when I did the washing. It was only a passing annoyance when I started on a load of dishes, but the longer I went, the more my spine started to complain. I had just finished washing the large, cumbersome serving dishes when the Norshan cook stuck his head into the scullery. His eyes looked small and beady compared with his large mouth and even larger nose. They stuck out and gave his overall features a strangely distorted quality. From behind him, I could see the noise and bustle of the kitchen. I spotted at least four different slaves, all of who shot me curious and mistrustful glances. I wondered if that was the real reason I was alone in the scullery. Most other sculleries and ships of this size were equipped with at least three to five maids. But I had found myself alone from the moment I'd arrived. I wasn't about to complain, though. Working with other species was difficult, especially because most of them considered humans to be at the bottom of the food chain. I wondered if the ill omen emblazoned on my cheek had something to do with it. The Norshan cook surveyed the scullery in an obvious attempt to look for some reason to pick on me. You finished the washing? he barked. I did. And the floors? I mopped them only thirty minutes ago, I said, falling back on a word I constantly used in my head but rarely used out loud. What? Uh, thirty microns ago, I corrected myself quickly. The vast majority of aliens had their own system for calculating time. Fine, the hatchlings need their supper, he said. Take it up to them. I hesitated, not having expected that. You want me to take a trolley up to the nursery? I asked. Did I stutter? The Norshan cook asked, his beady eyes fixated on mine. I... Okay... I nodded. I don't know where to go. Third floor, east wing, he replied. You can use the service elevators. They're open to us. I nodded, wondering momentarily why I was being sent up to the nursery with food. Surely there was already a slave who had been designated that task. Why are you standing there with your mouth hanging open? The Norshan cook demanded. Those rabid hatchlings will be hungry. I don't want to have to deal with their mothers. Those women are worse than the dragons. Ah, now I got it. None of the slaves enjoyed the task of taking food up to the nursery, so the job was palmed off on me. To be honest, I didn't really mind so much. I was curious now to see the half-breed children that had been born out of a union I had once thought impossible. Another thing I noticed was the way the Norshan cook's expression faltered slightly when he mentioned the hatchling's mothers. These were human women he was talking about. And yet there was a certain amount of reluctant respect mixed with fear that I could detect in his tone. I had to admit, that realization made me feel a little more optimistic about my own plight. I had resigned myself to being a helpless creature in a world where everyone was stronger, larger, and equipped with powerful advantages that I lacked. And yet, despite all the same disadvantages, Carissa and the other women in the fleet had risen among the ranks, from slaves to wives mothers and commanders. I heard Carissa's voice in my head. Befriend the draken, and who knows? Something good might come out of it. You must find another way to survive. Get on with you, the Norshan screamed as he grabbed a stray pot and threw it at me. 
I narrowly missed getting hit, and that was only because I tripped and my head dipped down at just the right moment. I gritted my teeth in annoyance, knowing I would have to clean up the mess when I got back and mop that part of the floor again. I wasn't stupid enough to let that frustration show on my face, however. I scurried into the kitchen, keeping my head turned down as I sensed the other slaves' eyes fasten themselves on me. The kitchen was almost double the size of the scullery. It was state-of-the-art, and it had been fitted with all the newest and flashiest equipment. There were five large refrigerators to my left, and on the opposite side, there were three different kinds of oven. One was the wood-burning kind that might have made a fantastic pizza, had the aliens only known what pizza was. There were sinks in the kitchen, too, though sleeker and more aesthetic than the ungainly sinks that had been stuck in the scullery. There were two large center islands placed in tandem with one another, one of which held a number of stovetops, and the other was a flat surface for rolling, kneading, and whatever else needed uninterrupted space. Over both islands were artistic-looking contraptions, that I first mistook for sculptures or chandeliers. On second glance, however, I realized they were exhaust. The smell that hit me was mind-numbingly good, and despite the fact that I'd already eaten for the day, I felt hunger nip at my stomach. I could detect the smell of charred meat and roasted vegetables, though not every scent was familiar to me. One of the larger trolleys had been laid out with an assortment of dishes, with the plates and cutlery presented neatly on the lower deck. I spotted a few dishes that I recognized. There were two large pink mulberry pies, heaped with fresh mulberry on top. There was a Karen drenched in marrow gravy, a favorite of many packs because of its punching flavor and tender meat. There was nari, an alien species of fish that was so large it had to be cut up and divided between two serving platters. And there was also purple hemlock, a meaty vegetable with a sharp bite. There was also a bunch of dishes I couldn't put a name to. There was a deep bowl filled with spiked balls that had been lathered in dark red gravy. Another bowl had been filled with what looked like porridge, but had a strange orange tint and a dark, musky smell. There were also thick, long stalks of some kind, with a series of spikes running down the spine. It looked more like wood than anything edible. It's the third floor, east wing, right? I asked, looking to the Norse and cook for confirmation. Watch out for the mongrels, the cook replied. They bite. I raised my eyebrows, wondering if my curiosity was gullible. After all, some things were better left unseen and unexplored. Still, the choice was out of my hands now. I pushed the trolley out of the kitchen and was glad to know that it glided across the floor easily and without much effort on my part. I knew which corridors to take to reach the service elevator on the basement floor. It had been tucked away at the corner of the basement level, so that the Draken wouldn't have to see slaves on the elevators they used in the main body of the spaceship. I pushed my trolley into the elevator and stared at the extensive collection of dishes in front of me. I thought about tasting something, but the memory of my clawing by Gore at Gore came screaming to mind, and I resisted the urge. The elevator glided up to the third floor, and when the doors opened, I found myself in a large open space with a domed roof and a series of floating staircases. I had never seen anything like it before, especially not in a spaceship. In fact, it was easy to forget you were in one. The interior on the third floor looked more like the sweeping expansiveness of a mansion complete with light fixtures that looked similar to chandeliers, and carpets that reminded me of home. 
I took a moment to appreciate the beauty of the unexpected design. And then I continued pushing the trolley along the winding passageway until I came to a series of doors. I thought I heard sounds, but I couldn't be sure of where they were coming from. The design of the space created an echo chamber, and sound seemed to bounce off the walls. Then I heard a high-pitched scream, followed by a snarling growl that wasn't quite fully developed yet. I turned the corner and stopped outside a massive blue door that had been set with a door knocker in the shape of a dragon head. There was a blue button on the side, and I pushed it tentatively. The door glided open slowly, and I pushed the trolley in and glanced around. The room was massive, and it even had a spiral staircase in one corner that wound down into a separate annex. I realized that this nursery was devoid of toys. Instead, there were several odd-looking gadgets that looked like space-age jungle gyms. There were ladders winding into long, snake-like tunnels that ended about six feet off the ground with nothing but a long rope in front of it that had been suspended from the ceiling. Apparently, in order to get your feet back on the ground... You would either need to jump for the rope and use it to shimmy down, or you would have to be an agile jumper. Was it possible that these dragon children were advanced enough to be able to do that? Hello, I called. I was greeted by silence, but then a moment later, I heard the steady click-clack of approaching feet. A moment later, the female Norsian that had been purchased alongside me appeared from the staircase. She had been given new garments to symbolize her elevated position as nanny. Her robes were now an off-white color in a thick fabric that covered both her shoulders and came down to her calves. Her mane had been combed back, and there were little silver bells tinkling prettily by her ears. Hi, I said. Uh, you look nice. You again, she said, eyeing the trolley I had brought with me. Me again, I agreed. I'm the new scullery maid. I see that, she nodded. My name is Yvette, I said, because it felt weird to me not to know one another's names. It doesn't really matter, the Norsian replied. I sighed inwardly. I suppose it doesn't, I shrugged. Here's the food, if there's anything else you need. Marat. I looked towards her. Excuse me? Marat, she said again. I raised my eyebrows. I'm sorry? These collars are usually fitted with translators. I should be able to understand you, but... The Norsian rolled her eyes, but there was a faint smile on her daintily superior features. That was my name. Oh! Well, it's nice to meet you, Marat. The echoes of screams and howls reached us from the room beneath the spiral staircase, and Marat looked over her shoulder. They're terrors, the lot of them, she said. But they do grow on you. So, you like being their nanny? I asked. Marat's smile widened, but not by much. It's not the worst job in the world, she shrugged. Certainly beats being a scullery maid. I was willing to forgive that little jab in light of the newfound amicability in our otherwise disdainful relationship. Are you the only nanny? I asked. The only one so far, Marat nodded. Apparently none of the other nannies could cope with the little monsters. None of them were up to the task. But then, they'd never procured a Norsian before. I only smiled at the air of superiority in her tone. Before I could ask another question, I felt a slight vibration under my feet. And then, it was like the room exploded. From the staircase came at least half a dozen children, they leaped and bounded their way into the main area of the nursery. 
Their screams were a cross between roars and laughter. The moment I saw their sure-footed movement, I realized that the jungle gems before me were probably not half as complex as they needed. At first glance, they looked like human children, but when they slowed down long enough, I recognized the characteristics that marked them as mixed-species offspring. Their bodies were partially scaled, though not in the same way as their fierce fathers. Their scales looked more like tattoos against their soft skin. They had wings, but they were noticeably smaller than a full dragon child at that age. They seemed to have the same sharp teeth and the powerful claws of their fathers, but their faces were more distinctively human. The young children raced straight to the trolley and reached for the food with unabashed eagerness. For them, I was just another piece of furniture, not worth their time or attention. But the older dragon children came to a stop in front of me, looking curious and interested. There were two, both of whom looked to be about six or seven years old. The girl was dark-haired, with large blue eyes and silver-blue scales that covered her arms and neck, and the boy was fair-haired, with dark, feral eyes and gray-brown scales that marked parts of his face. Hello, I said, because their stares were making me uncomfortable. Who are you? the boy asked. They had the expressions and mannerisms of older children, but when the boy spoke, he sounded so very human it made me want to cry. I hadn't been around a human child in years. My name is Yvette, I replied, wondering if that was the right way to introduce myself. She is a scullery maid in the kitchens, Marat said. Does that mean you're a slave? the girl asked. Her voice was less childish and more mature. Yes, I said, even though the word was bitter on my tongue. You look like my mommy, the boy said. Are you human? I nodded. I am human. Mommy says that humans are special, even though they don't seem special at first. I couldn't help but smile. They were impertinent little creatures but I could tell how advanced they all were. I could see a toddler in the background leaping off one of the beams with the elegancy of a trapeze artist. The child spun in the air and landed on all fours with a triumphant smile on his face. Your mother is right, I said, but I'm sure you already knew that. After all, you are half human. The boy and the girl exchanged a glance. It's more fun to be a dragon, the girl said. We have wings and hard skin. When we fall, it doesn't hurt so bad because of our scales. So the scales were functional then. I found that interesting. That meant that the half-breed children were as strong and as resilient as their fathers. That would serve them well in the future, should they face off against an enemy who underestimated them. That's good, I nodded. You're lucky to have such strong skin. But you don't, the girl said, watching my face carefully for my reaction. You're right, I don't, I agreed. Sometimes I wish I did. I wish I had wings, too, but we can't always have everything. The girl's pretty blue eyes dipped low for a moment. Daddy says I won't be able to turn into a dragon, she said. He says I'll be able to fly, but I won't be able to shift. I could tell that this was a huge disappointment for the little half-dragon. I'm sorry, I said, lowering myself to the ground so that I was at eye level with her. That must be upsetting. I don't know why I can't do it she said, and I detected a strong note of vulnerability in her admission. Matilda can do it. Matilda? I asked. My big sister, the girl replied. She can turn into a dragon. 
Daddy says that she will one day be a Hiles Ring commander. I saw her large blue eyes dip down in disappointment, almost as though she considered her inability to shift a personal failing. Well, maybe one day you will be too, I said. The girl's eyes went cold immediately. All commanders can shift. So you'll be the first commander who can't shift, I said with a shrug. You can break the glass ceiling. Her brow furrowed. What? she asked impatiently. What ceiling? What I mean is you don't need to turn into a dragon to be one, I said. Yes, you do, she insisted, shooting me an annoyed glance. What makes dragons so great? I asked, aware that Marat was watching our exchange with nervous interest. I don't know. Everything, the girl replied. Give me a few reasons. They can fly, she said after a small pause. So can you, I pointed out. They're big and strong, and everyone is scared of them. The packs are small, I said, and there are many beings that are scared of them. She frowned as my logic started to work on her. If you believe your fears, others will too. The girl smiled and nodded. Okay. Okay, I said as I got back to my feet. Marette came forward and put her hand on the girl's shoulder. Go on now, she said. It's time to eat. You and your cousins must be hungry. The girl looked back at me. My name is Elena, she said. And mine is Brandon, the boy piped up. I took note of the very human name. It was a testament to the influence the women of the fleet had over their husbands. It was very nice to meet you both, I said with a smile. Will you always bring us our supper? Alanya asked. It seemed I had made a good impression on her. I can try, I said. I hope you will, Brandon said. I wondered if my similarity to their mothers was what had won them over. Whatever it was, I wasn't about to complain. I couldn't have hoped for a better introduction to the Draken children. The children banded together to push the trolley into the middle of the carpet, where they promptly set about devouring the food in display. You have a way with them, Marat said, and I could tell that I had impressed her. I shrugged. Children are a lot easier to talk to than adults. Marat raised her eyebrows at me. You want to trade jobs? she asked. I smiled. I thought your job was so much better than a scullery maid. Marat sighed, but she couldn't keep the guilty smile off her face. I might have been trying to make myself feel better by trying to make you feel bad. Did it work? Not really, Marat sighed. I could help you up here from time to time, I suggested. Once I'm finished with my work in the scullery, and if I can get away without the cook noticing. Marat looked at me with new suspicion. Why would you do that? she asked. Because I don't like being left alone with my thoughts, I said. And it would be nice to have a friend. She gave me a puzzled look. You are a strange creature. I just meant, you should go back to the kitchens, Marat said dismissively. They will be searching for you. I suppressed a sigh and headed back down to the scullery. Maybe it was naive of me to believe that I could carve out some semblance of life on this ship. At the end of the day, I had to face the facts. I had no life anymore. It belonged to someone else, and there was no escaping it. The only thing that was left was resignation. Chapter 8 Renell 
Dashiell's ship was titanic and imposing, but I missed the comforting familiarity of the wyvern. It had taken some getting used to when I had first been given command of the old ship, but I had come to love it. I was looking over a rundown of all the repairs the wyvern was undergoing at the moment, and it looked like it would be another couple of days before it was fixed up enough for the rest of my crew to move back into it. The slave quarters were mostly done, which was why my slaves, with the exception of the girl, were already on board. I had been waiting a long time for the fleet to move out from under the mountains of Minneapolis, but now that departure was imminent, I was fearful. As I had predicted, Lahar had joined us at the commander's meeting and promptly sided with Tarion. We need credits, Lahar said. Without coin, we won't be able to rebuild or fortify our defenses. Our ships will keep, I said, trying to use logic to steer my brothers in the right direction. Our planet may not. I don't believe the Pax Alliance will attack Theron, Lahar said. Are you willing to take that chance? I asked. What if you're wrong? He's not wrong, Tarion said, turning from the window and walking back towards the table. The Pax act superior, but they're terrified of us. How many planets have they conquered? I demanded. How many species have they reduced to chains? Tarion straightened to his full height, his chest puffed out, and I saw his scales gleam with the excitement of battle fever. We are not the lesser species of the moon planets. We are the Hyles reign of Theron. We are feared. Hubris cannot win wars. I snarled. You're growing cautious in your old age, friend, Tyrion had said, annoyance coloring his tone. It doesn't suit you. I roared threateningly, and Tyrion narrowed his eyes at me. We'll vote on the decision. But I already knew where we would end up. I didn't need to see the voting process to know I had lost. All in favor of moving the fleet to Grissa, Tarion asked. Tarion's hand balled into a fist, and he slammed it down on the table in front of him. He had cast his vote. A second later, Lahar followed suit. His fist hit the table with a resounding echo, and I ground my teeth together before turning to Dashiell. Dashiell's eyes flitted to mine for only a second. He blinked at me apologetically before slamming his fist down on the table. So be it, I sighed. Grissa it is. I didn't like the decision, but I had no choice but to resign myself to the process of decision-making that our forefathers had agreed to. Dashiell, Lahar, and Tarion had immediately moved on to strategizing over the Grissa pillage, while I sat back and listened with one ear. Powerless under the law of Commander's majority, I decided to focus my energy and attention on the Wyvern, which was why I was poring over the details of the ship's improvements and the privacy of my personal chambers. The list of upgrades I had commissioned was extensive. I wanted the wyvern fitted with armored shields, powered sensors, and stronger fuel cells. I had also added a new annex to the spaceship, a feat that was only achievable because of the wyvern's ungainliness. The new addition gave the ship more shape, and while it still wasn't the best-looking craft in the fleet, it was certainly an improvement. The room Dashiell had given me was a large circular one, with three windows that overlooked the north, east, and west. I spent most of my nights sitting in front of those windows. 
wishing we were up in the air instead of docked together among the barren mountains of Monopolis. Like many of my kind, I hated staying in one place for too long. Nashel had a private room he worked from, and out of respect for my position, he had offered me the same. But I had turned him down in favor of working from my room. At least here, the space felt like it was mine. I was looking over files of the wyvern's account when I heard a soft rap on my door. Frowning, I went to see who was on the other side. I opened the door to find the marked human. Her brown slave's garment was covered in a white dust that I couldn't name, and splotches of it clung to her neck and arms. She didn't seem to mind, though. She was holding a large plate on which lay several small circles, with a smattering of dark chunks mixed in. I could smell the inviting scent of chocolate, but I was unfamiliar with the food she had brought me. What is that? I asked in an offhanded manner. These would be cookies, she said, holding them up for me. I made them myself. I narrowed my eyes at her. Are they poisoned? Her eyes went wide, and I could tell she hadn't expected that response. Of course not, she said. She actually sounded hurt that I'd even suggested it. Just checking, I said, as I held the door open wide for her to walk inside. What are you doing here? She placed the plate on the table next to my files and turned back to me. I wanted to bring you some cookies. I regarded her carefully, trying to find the plot in this strange gesture. She had made it clear how she felt about me in more ways than one when she had first been brought on board. I wondered what had changed. Did she really think making me food would help her win her freedom? I walked over to the table and looked down at the strangely shaped cookies she had apparently made for me. Why are they shaped like that? I asked. She smiled. Uh, well, I don't know, she admitted. I suppose you can shape them any way you want. This just happens to be the traditional way of making them. What are they made of? Sugar, butter, flour, and chocolate she replied, rattling off the ingredients and taking them off on her fingers as she went. Eggs. I didn't have everything I needed, so I had to improvise. I tasted one. They're not as good as the cookies I used to make on Earth, but they'll do. I reached out and took one of the circles. It was light as a feather in my hand, but I decided to take a bite and see if this human knew her way around the kitchen. My teeth sunk into it, and I felt an amazing release of sweetness erupt in my mouth. The cookie was soft, yet crumbly, sweet but salty, and unlike anything I'd ever tasted before. It's good, isn't it? she asked, watching my face intently. I popped the rest of the cookie into my mouth. It's good, I nodded soberly. My mother taught me to make them, she said. She used to say that all she needed in the world to be happy was a plate of chocolate chip cookies. I watched her face change when she mentioned her mother. It reminded me of my own face on the rare days I allowed myself to think of Heron. Are you okay? she asked, her voice cutting through my memories. Of course, I replied gruffly. These things, they're good. I know, she nodded. Cookies are the only thing I can make perfectly every time. It's my superpower. Your mother taught you? I asked, realizing that I was interested in her past. Yes, she nodded. I feel close to her every time I bake a batch. Where is she now? I heard myself ask. Gone, she replied, 
looking towards the windows. Gone. The word had a sharp finality about it. I wanted to ask her more, but I knew my interest would only lead to unpleasantness. She didn't need nor want my comfort, and I was not equipped to be that person for her. The dynamic between us was too off balance, and the collar around her neck only reinforced that fact. So, why was it that I didn't want her to leave? I had been in the middle of my work, and I hated being interrupted. Yet here I was, trying to string out a conversation with one of my slaves. What was it about these human women? What was this hold they seemed to have on my kind? It couldn't be a coincidence that three of my fellow commanders had taken human women to wife. Is it? True that the gestation period for a human dragon baby is only three months? She asked abruptly as she turned back to me. I could sense that she was trying to force the conversation, too. She had come here for a reason. I just wasn't sure what that reason was. It depends, I replied. Hatchlings that can shift generally have shorter periods of gestation. Each pregnancy has been different for each human woman. We're still learning. That's amazing. I shrugged. I suppose, to someone who knows nothing about our kind, it must be interesting. I do know some things about your kind, she replied. And anyway, I'm learning. How long is the gestation period for full dragon babies? Five to six rotations, I answered. But dragon hatchlings emerge from eggs. They are not carried by their mother. Right, she nodded. I knew that. Is it hard? she asked. I mean, for the mother. I don't know, I replied. I've never asked. I nodded. I can't imagine it, she said absentmindedly, as if she were talking to herself. I can't imagine what it would be like to have a child that was... She looked up suddenly, as though she had just remembered I was in the room. I mean, uh, what I mean to say is, you can't imagine lying with one of my kind, I said sharply, filling in the blanks. She blushed a deep red, and the effect suited her. Her cheeks were awash with color, and her eyes fluttered self-consciously. I... Can't imagine it either, I said. Lying with a human seems unnatural. She met my eyes then. It was only a second, but I saw a certain amount of curiosity there. Or perhaps I was simply projecting my feelings onto her. I reached out and took another cookie. The sweetness was welcome, and the bitter chocolate provided a nice respite from the doughy softness. After she left, I would probably make short work of the rest of them. I made some for the hatchlings, too, she said. I hope they'll like them. They're such sweet things. I frowned. You've seen them? A few times now, the girl nodded. I think they like me. The cook sent you to the nursery with cookies? I asked. She paused and I could see the start of a lie winding its way onto her tongue. Then she changed her mind at the last minute. I just thought they'd like my cookies, and it's nice being around them. It's much less lonely. I could feel my heart beating thunderously against my chest, and I didn't like the feeling of not being in control. Why did I feel that way whenever she was around? Why was I so affected by her presence? Surely it was mere clinical curiosity. After all, I had never owned a human before. Yes, that was it. They made for very different slaves. They spoke without permission, they replaced silence with questions, and they engaged in conversations when they weren't invited to do so. They may have been slaves, but they had not resigned themselves to their role yet. You could put a creature in chains, 
But if he did not give himself over to those chains, was he really a slave at all? I thought it was understood that you were not to leave the ship's kitchen unless you were ordered to, or else in the case of an emergency. Was there an emergency? She stiffened. No. Were you summoned? No, she replied as her eyes turned cold. The warmth fled from her face, but that did not detract from her beauty. You have no right to walk about this ship without permission, I said gruffly, pushing away my own discomfort. Do you understand what that is? She set her jaw stubbornly, but I persisted. Well, do you? Because I'm a slave, she said without emotion. Because I have no free will and no choice. Correct, I nodded. I was trying... What? I asked with raised eyebrows. What were you trying? She looked away from me. Nothing, she mumbled. I walked over to her and grabbed her hand roughly. She gasped and struggled to free herself, but my grip was too strong and she was too weak. I was extremely aware of how easy it would be for me to push her down and climb on top of her. Let me go, she said, in a tone of authority that any commander would have admired. I wondered where this brazen courage had come from. I certainly hadn't seen it in the marketplace among the packs of lions. No, she had been meek as an ermit there. I will let you go when I choose to. I said, pulling her closer and glaring at her threateningly. I could see her heavy, tangled breasts, the flush that covered her chest and cheeks. There was something almost titillating about the effect. That thought had me dropping her arm like it was on fire. What the hell was I thinking? Had I completely taken leave of my senses? At that moment, I knew one thing with certainty. I needed to get her out of my chamber and out of my sight. I walked to the door and held it open. I'm taking you back where you belong. She just stood there and stared at me. Do I need to carry you back to the kitchens? I demanded. I don't belong there, she said. Her eyes were awash with fire. For a second, she looked as fierce as any dragon I knew. You know that. Before I could go over and force her through the door, she started walking towards me. I escorted her back to the kitchens, and the whole time we were enshrouded in a prickly silence that was rife with tension. When we arrived at the kitchens, I took her roughly by the arm and pushed her into the scullery. She had her back to me as though she couldn't bear the sight of me. That suited me just fine. It was easier now that I couldn't see her face. You are too familiar, I said in a low voice. In a few days, the repairs on my ship will have concluded. Perhaps I will offer you as a gift to Dashiell. I slammed the door shut, and she disappeared from view. Then I stood there, with the thick door between us, wondering why I still felt her presence just underneath my skin. Chapter 9 Yvette It had been three whole days since I'd last been let out of the basement floor of the kitchens and the scullery. I was no longer being sent up to the nursery either, and I wondered if Rennell was responsible for that, too. I hated what he had done to me. And yet, for some unknown reason, I couldn't hate him. I kept replaying his last words to me over and over again in my head. In a few days, the repairs on my ship will have concluded. Perhaps I will offer you as a gift to Dashiell. Apparently, my bad luck had struck again. Why else would I be handed off again, a useless object that no one wanted? 
I tried to find the hidden blessing in my new circumstances. Why shouldn't my life on Dashiell's ship be better than the one I had imagined on Rennell's? The fact that I couldn't come up with an immediate answer made me weary. It was during my confinement in the basement when I started to dream about him. They were disjointed, sometimes myopic fragments, pushed together by my life of drudgery in the scullery. But sometimes a clear scene would unfold, and I would remember the dream when I woke up. In one particular instance, I dreamt I was in the scullery alone, and I was trying to clean a particularly stubborn stain off of one of the copper pots that the cook favored. The stain refused to scrub out, so I abandoned it and moved on to the next pot in the lineup. Except the next pot had the same stain, only it was slightly bigger than the last. When I replaced it with the third pot, the stain only seemed to grow. I abandoned my cleaning and turned to find Rennell staring at me from the entrance of the scullery. I could see the great width of his shoulders and the muscles of his arms, half covered in the burgundy darkness of his scales. His face was shrouded in shadow, but I could still make out his eyes. They were tiny spots of light amidst all the darkness. He was terrible to look at, and yet the sight of him brought me comfort. He moved forward, but no matter how close he came, I still couldn't make out his individual features. When he was close enough for me to touch him, I reached out, my hand shaking, and just before I touched him, I woke up. That dream had stuck with me through most of the next day. I sifted through it like a puzzle that needed solving. It made me clumsy and distracted in my work, and I had to duck more than once the next day when the cook threw various bits of crockery at my head for every mistake I made in the kitchens. This was my fault, and I had no one else to blame but myself. I had allowed Carissa's advice to worm its way into my head, and I had decided to act on it. The cookies had been something of a peace offering. I wasn't looking for a husband, but I couldn't help but wondering if befriending Renault wouldn't be in my best interests. He was certainly powerful. He commanded respect. And, in terms of pure practicality, he was the only dragon I had consistent contact with. My plan to ingratiate myself in his favor had backfired badly and it had only served to confuse me more. Confusion and loneliness seemed to be my only two companions. They actually made me long to be in the kitchens with the bulk of the slaves. They may hate me, but at least their presence would curb my loneliness somewhat. I decided to try my luck and slip into the kitchens. The nourishing cook was by the stove, cooking up something with deadly spice that made my eyes water. He noticed me the moment I appeared at the connecting door between the kitchens and the scullery. What do you want? he demanded. I saw several of the other slaves' eyes travel to me. The vents glared at me with unadulterated superiority before turning back to their tasks. But the other slaves kept their stares trained on my face. I just... I wanted to know if there was anything I could do in here. You think I want your help in here? He demanded. You'll burn down the whole fucking kitchen. He had enough evidence to support that statement, so I decided not to refute that point. I'll be careful. No, he said with stinging finality. I was told to prepare a special feast for tonight because one of the commanders is going back to his own ship tomorrow. I can't have the likes of you around. You'll end up poisoning the lot of them. I felt my chest grow cold. It seemed Rennell and his crew were going back to their ship tomorrow. I had heard none of it, which probably meant he had already transferred me into Dashiell's possession. I would not be accompanying them. 
I tried not to let my disappointment bury me. A part of me was equally upset that I was taking it so hard in the first place. Get out, the cook screamed. I don't want you ruining my meal. I backed out of the kitchen before he could find something to throw at me. The last hit had nearly taken out an eye. I slipped back into the scullery and stared at the messy countertops and dirty floors. I might as well clean them all. I needed a distraction, and I wanted to keep my hands busy. Perhaps my mind would follow suit. I started on the countertops first. No matter how orderly I tried to be, there was always a fresh layer of grime that found its way onto the surfaces of everything in the scullery. I used a thick scrub brush with bristles on the end to tease out the more stubborn oily blotches. Then... I used water and soap to take off the loose layer of dirt. I had to admit, there was a part of me that hadn't actually believed he would keep me on this ship. But perhaps I had just deluded myself into believing that he had developed an interest in me. Or maybe it was just desperate hope that I had foolishly chosen to fall back onto. Whatever my reasoning, I felt like a naive child. Once the countertops were gleaming, I got out the mop and pail. Before I started on the mopping, however, I went over the floor with a thick, bristled brush that got into the nooks and crevices of the stone floor. I was on my hands and knees, trying to stay focused on the task at hand. But my own thoughts were distracting me. I remembered the day Rennell had stopped his dragon friend from examining me. His tone had been neutral, and his expression controlled. But I had detected an edge of panic in his stance. He had ushered me out of the impressive circular room as though he had wanted to protect me rather than get rid of me. It was the same feeling I had felt when he had bandaged my finger that day in the medical bay. At the time, I hadn't yet possessed the objectivity of distance, so I hadn't examined the moment until later, not after my opinion of Rennell had started to shift. It was that shifting opinion and Carissa's careful words in my head that had encouraged me to bake those cookies for him in the first place. The process had certainly not been easy. Flour was not a common ingredient in Draken kitchens, and that meant... I'd had to grind my own flour and work late into the night because I didn't want to further irritate the Norsian cook, who still refused to tell me his name. All my efforts had fallen to dust when Rinella kicked me out of his room unceremoniously. It had snapped me out of the delusion I had been under. I was his slave, and he was my owner. We couldn't possibly be friends. The idea was absurd. Maybe it had worked for Carissa, but she wasn't marked. My hand slipped up to my cheek and touched the three-leaf clover. There was no escaping my fate. It had been set in stone from the moment the packs had marked me. Some would argue I deserved it. Hell, I would argue I deserved it. I blinked and saw the red, blotched skies on the day of the invasion. No, I thought, shaking the image from my mind. Don't go there, Yvette. Not now. I heard the scullery door slide open, and I uttered a silent prayer of thanks for the distraction. I expected to see the cook, but instead I saw the tall, imposing form of the draken that had invaded my thoughts for the past three days straight. His expression was impassive but I could sense tension in the rigid arch of his back. His name was on the tip of my tongue, but I swallowed it at the last second. I shouldn't be addressing him by name. What can I do for you, sir? I asked. Rennell's eyes flitted across the scullery. I need something from you, he said curtly. What is it? I asked. He paused for a moment. Cookies. I stared at him, 
trying to make sure I'd heard him right. Excuse me? Did you just say cookies? Yes. Oh. If the circumstances had been different, I might have smiled. I, I suppose I can make another batch today, I nodded. Good. I nodded, wondering why he was hovering by the entrance now that he had issued his command. I'll get to work right away, sir, I said. Good, he replied shortly. I stared at his expression, trying to decipher the meaning of his presence here. He could have sent an order to the kitchens through another slave. The fact that he was down here telling me himself meant something, right? I heard there will be a feast tonight, I said, breaking the pregnant silence. In your honor. An unnecessary extravagance, Rennell said with annoyance. Dashiell can be overly sentimental and generous. Well, I suppose he felt the need to reciprocate, I said, trying hard to keep the bitterness from my tone. Rennell looked at me questioningly. I take it. You are no longer my owner, I said, proud of the fact that my voice didn't shake. Rennell's eyes dipped down. It turns out Dashiell doesn't have a need for you on his ship, he replied. And there was no one who wants you either. I asked around. You will be coming aboard my ship. I do still need a scullery maid. He answered me with indifference, with a kind of forced apathy that made me believe there were stronger, less detached feelings hidden behind his stony words. I felt the soft warmth of satisfaction, but I kept my face neutral, as though his news didn't make a difference to me. Gather your things together. We will be making the move tomorrow morning, Rennell told me. The whole fleet will be taking off immediately after boarding. I suppose I can start making the cookies on board your ship, I said. That would be best, Rennell nodded. You can give my cook a list of ingredients you'll need. I nodded, and he shifted on his feet. It was like he was looking for an excuse to stay. I decided to give him one. If you're interested, I squirreled away a few cookies, I admitted. Would you like one now? His eyes widened. Yes. I went to retrieve the old crock pot that I had stowed away on a cabinet in the storage unit next to the sinks. I had saved a few cookies from the last batch to eat whenever I needed a little break. I brought it out, opened the lid, and offered it to Renell. His large hand reached out but couldn't get past the small opening. I knew that if he tried, he'd just end up breaking the crock pot. Let me, I offered. I pulled out the three last cookies and set them down on a plate in front of him. He eyed them carefully. E you didn't hide these away from me, did you? He asked. I hesitated. Well, no. You were saving them for yourself. Dashiell's Norshin cook doesn't exactly give me the choicest portions of food, I said defensively. Rennell smiled, and the effect seemed to lighten his face considerably. If I concentrated really hard, I could picture him as a human man. A broodingly handsome one at that. He had the square jaw, patriarchal cheekbones, and drooping eyes. that would have made any woman on earth swoon. I felt a long-lost tingle zip through my body before landing between my legs. Take one, Rennell said. What? I said, staring at him in confusion, certain I had misheard him. You saved them for yourself, he said. You should eat one. It's okay. You seem to enjoy them more than I do. I can share, he said. His tone may not have been kind, but I couldn't avoid the intention behind it. I felt the corners of my mouth turn up wondering what dangerous new territory we had just embarked on to. 
Again, Carissa's voice echoed in my head, and I wondered if maybe she had a point after all. Maybe befriending the draken would give me an easier life, if not a free one. After years of servitude, the thought of having a kindly master seemed like a victory in itself. I reached out and took a cookie off the plate. He watched me as I bit into it. I should have felt self-conscious, but I didn't. I felt a little nervous. I felt a little uncertain. But most of all, I felt hope. Chapter 10. Rennell. The wyvern's drawbridge had been lowered, creating a long, elevated ramp that the slaves were being herded through. Deverin came to stand by my side as the slaves passed by us in a single file line. The ramp had received a new paint job. It had been filmed over with two new layers of chirodai, and the way the drawbridge gleamed told me that it would last through decades without needing a touch-up of any kind. It acted as low-grade armor, an added layer of protection that many smaller spacecraft use for extra protection. I could only see a small section of the underbelly of the wyvern. I had installed new intergalactic lights and added some missile capsules that protruded oddly from the sides. I'd had to compromise aesthetic beauty in favor of practicality. The design of the wyvern didn't really allow me to do both. Still, I was satisfied to have saved the ship from the scrap heaps of Nadaj, the waste planet where the old broken and obsolete went to die. I walked onto the wyvern feeling as though I were finally home. It was less about the ship itself and more about the feeling of being at the helm of my own vessel. I didn't like having to defer to another commander's authority, and as much as I loved Dashiell, we were very different leaders. My crew had been spread all over the whole fleet in an effort to share the burden of expense, but now they were back on one ship and everyone seemed relieved. I briefed the lot of them early that morning, just before the slaves were brought on board. I was very aware of the girl, but was not the only one. She was the only human in a ship full of draken and superior slave species. Their quarters have been readied. We have several additional rooms now, so we don't have to crowd them all in one cell, Devon told me. There's going to be two slaves to a cell now, and I've placed same species together wherever I could. I could see the girl coming up down the line of slaves. The strap of her slave's robe kept slipping off her bony shoulder, and she kept riding it uncomfortably. I saw her trip twice before she had even passed me. Her dark hair looked curlier than usual in the swirling winds and her expression was contorted into one of concentration. I knew instinctively that she was trying very hard not to trip again and crash into someone. I was the human sharing with, I asked, trying not to sound too concerned. One of the female vents, Devon replied. There wasn't another vents to couple together, and she is the only human on the slave charter. I'm aware... I said impatiently. It doesn't matter. Give her a solitary space. Deverin frowned. The human? I glared at Deverin, and he tried to pedal back quickly. Are you sure? He asked. Look at her. She's the tiniest among them all. She has no abilities or physical advantages. If there are fights, she will not be able to hold her own among any of them. I said without considering how my words would come across. I didn't realize that was a concern of yours, Deverin said. My concern is a smooth-running ship, I growled, alerting Deverin to tread carefully. I don't want fights, even if it is among the slaves. Yes, Commander, Deverin nodded. I'll see to it now. He walked off and left me to survey the slave's progress alone. 
I preferred it that way. It gave me some time to think. Within the hour, the whole fleet would be leaving Monopolis behind. Dashiell's ship was set to sail alongside mine for the first three jumps. The rest of the fleet would be in the nearby vicinity so that we could fly to each other in case of an emergency whenever necessary. We didn't anticipate any trouble on the journey to Grissa, but since we were all traveling the same route, it made sense to fly close. I saw the girl coming up past me. Her eyes slipped to my face searchingly, but I pretended as though I hadn't even seen her. It was easy to miss her in a crowd of larger, more noticeable slave species. But once you did spot her, she stood out, a flower among a sea of thorns. Once my crew and the slaves were on board, I walked up the ramp and gave the command to close the wyvern's doors. I didn't bother entering the body of the ship. Instead, I took the elevator to my right and headed straight to the control deck, where both of my second commanders were ready and prepared for takeoff. The control deck boasted a panoramic view of Monopolis Mountainscape. Some might have found it peaceful, but I, for one, had always preferred the ethereal beauty of space. How are we looking? I asked, turning to Bletchcore. All systems are a go, he nodded. Gormson? We're ready to go, Commander, Gormson confirmed. I watched as the other ships started to close their main portal doors. Then the lights blinked on one by one, and I saw the dragon helms emblazoned on the front of the larger ship's twirl with purpose. It's time, I nodded giving the command for liftoff. The wyvern was the first ship in the air. Soon after, I saw Dashiell's ship take flight. The floor vibrated with the thrum of the engine's great power, and I felt my body slip slowly into comfort. We were finally off the ground. The whole ship shook just as Gormson and Bletchgore prepared for our first jump. Everyone braced themselves, but I remained standing. I had developed a tolerance for the head-spinning, stomach-churning seizures that jumping could give you. And three, Gormson started. Two, one. The jump pulled us into the travel zone of light speed. My body sang with a numbing ache, and five seconds later, Blue sky and flurried clouds gave way to the midnight blue of space and its grand infinity. Beautifully done, I told Gormson. Thank you, Commander, he replied. We would need to watch out for any anomalies in our flight path for only a short while longer before switching into cruise control. I was staring at Griss on the map that projected our arrival coordinates when Deverin showed up in the control booth. I wanted to ask him about the girl immediately, but I curbed the instinct and waited for him to tell me if he had carried out my order. It's done, Commander, Deverin told me, after greeting both Gormson and Bletchgore, an act I found highly unnecessary. I've settled the human into her own room. It's right by the scullery. Good, I nodded. Uh, Commander... Yes. She asked me for ingredients. I frowned. She had promised to make me more of those delectable, snappy things, I realized. She was meant to ask the cook. Apparently he refused her. I narrowed my eyes. I'll handle it. Deverin looked a little perplexed. You'll handle it? he asked. Commander! You needn't concern yourself with trivial matters. I can sort out their dispute. I'm going that way, I said with finality. I need you to stay here and watch our progress. Contact the fleet's captains and make sure their jumps were successful. Understood? Understood, Commander. Devra nodded, but he still looked perplexed. Once we've cleared the jumping zone, put the ship on autopilot, I said. We can cruise for a few leagues before the next jump. As you say, Commander. 
I walked out of the control center, which opened out into an open forum that led into the body of the ship. It was a minimalistic space that boasted thin white columns that were free of embellishment. It was also oval in shape and led off into separate passageways from which you could access other parts of the ship. I took the seventh passage to the right and headed down the wide corridor that I had reinforced with pillax steel. It was a ribbed metal, which naturally air-conditioned any space that was predisposed to heat. At the end of the passageway, there was a left turn that would take me to the weapons unit, a right turn that would take me to the supplies unit, and an elevator that would take me down to the kitchens, the scullery, and the slave quarters. I walked inside, and the elevator went down smoothly. The wyvern's basement was nothing like the one on Dashiell's ship. The walls were made of burnt brown Samite stone, and I had made sure it was well lit at all times. It may have been referred to as the basement, but I didn't want it to feel like one. As I approached the entrance to the kitchens, I heard her voice rise in indignant anger. I pressed the entry button on the side of the sliding door and walked into the kitchen, in time to see the Vince cook I had purchased four years ago face off against the girl. The Vince was twice her size and height, but she seemed oblivious to her disadvantage. I don't understand why I can't just have the ingredients I need she demanded. I don't take orders from a human. It's not an order, the girl insisted. It's only a request. Then I am free to deny it. Enough, I said, without raising my voice. The girl and the vents turned to me in unison, and immediately the vent shrugged back. His six legs seemed to fold inwards as though to make himself look smaller. Commander, he said, bowing his head. The human is acting under my orders, I said firmly. You will give her whatever ingredients she requires. Is that understood? I could see the biting anger on the Vence's purple, bruised face. Its three yellow eyes looked at me with muted resentment. Yes, Commander. Good. Then I expect to hear no more arguments from either of you. The Vents bowed his head again. I will send your supper up at the designated time, Commander. Send it through the girl, I said. Make sure she knows the way to my quarters. I don't want my food arriving late. I could hear the irritated prick of the Vents' pinchers, but I ignored it. He would be careful around the girl now. I didn't like the idea of showing her preferential treatment, but favoring her might keep her safe against the other slaves. There was no denying that she was the weakest slave on board the wyvern, and even among the lowest of the low, there was always a hierarchy. I turned and left the kitchens, aware that the girl's eyes were following me out. I went straight to my quarters on the first floor, where all the other commanders were housed as well. My chamber was modest compared to some of the other commander's quarters I had seen. I preferred the simplicity of modesty in my lifestyle. I had a large bed staged in the center of the space, and shelves of books rung up on three of the six walls that made my room. Books were not usually a favorite pastime among my kind, but I had developed an affinity for them. Ever since we had pillaged a huge library in the temples of the Udi Sitka in Gurnasi. The remaining walls had been decorated with the trinkets of my early conquests. I had a ribbed bow and arrow from the Uvet tribe of Alagor. I owned a Kazmirian steel sword from the Mirak people of Sanatol. I possessed a double edged war hammer from the Brexa warriors of Castellan. I walked over to the fireplace I had commissioned especially for my room. Obviously, I had no need of one with the ship's updated heating system, but it was one of the few indulgences I allowed myself. I liked the heat and light of a live fire. 
I loved the dancing embers and the hissing coals that spat out temperamentally as the wood burned. I bent down and kindled a fire with my own breath. I settled in front of it to go over the rest of my crew files. I lost myself in the pleasure of organization. But every now and again, I kept seeing her seductive brown eyes. Dark and heavy, but spotted with subtle pinpricks of light. A sharp rap on my door forced me to close my files and put them away before approaching my door and pressing my thumb to the identification pad to allow the knocker entry. She was standing on the other side, behind a large, ornate trolley that had been gifted to me by Lahar when I'd first been given command of the wyvern. The carvings on the side of the trolley were native to ermit culture, but the handlebars were reminiscent of Kuvoan heritage. It was most likely one of the odd hybrid creations that came out of the market planets along the axis. Come, I said trying to mask my pleasure at seeing her. I could smell the strong scent of charred meat as she walked past me, pushing the trolley. I spotted platters of sweet fruit, and I could pick out the floral scent of strong wine underneath the earthy char of the spice meat I favored. I realized belatedly that there was also a fresh plate of cookies sitting next to the wine. These cookies looked different from the previous batch, they were fatter in the middle and contained long stripes of dark chocolate. She settled the trolley next to the fire without having to be told, and then turned to me with nervous expectation. You made them already? I asked, eyeing the cookies hungrily. It's not so hard once you have all the ingredients, she replied. Gormit was very helpful after you left. Gormit? She raised her eyebrows. You know, your cook? Oh, I nodded. Him. You don't know his name? He's a slave, I replied. I don't have to know his name. Her face dropped, and I instantly regretted my words. She made her way to the door, but I found my mouth forming her name, desperate to keep her in my presence for just a little while longer. I hated this helpless feeling, but there was no denying it. I couldn't abide the thought of watching her walk out of my chambers. Wait, I called. She turned impassively. Is there something wrong? I... I froze. What could I say to keep her here? Have you eaten? What? She asked, nonplussed. My chest tightened with a strange twisting feeling that I couldn't quite get comfortable with. Was this what it felt to be nervous? It was intolerable. Have you eaten? I asked again. She stared at me with an expression that suggested she thought I was joking. Then she shook her head no. There's too much food here for me, I said, even though that wasn't quite the truth. You might as well take what you want. She looked confused for a moment. Are you asking me to join you for dinner? She asked. I would have preferred if she hadn't put it that way. It implied something that I wasn't ready to face just yet. I just don't want the food to go to waste, I said. One corner of her mouth turned up, but she stopped herself from smiling. She walked towards me slowly and looked down at the full trolley. I suppose I could eat a little, she nodded. Sit down, I said, gesturing to the empty chair by the fireplace. She pulled it to the trolley and sat down across from me. When was the last time I had supped with a female? I served myself first because I didn't want her getting the wrong idea. Take whatever you want. I said gruffly when my own plate was full. She took modest portions of the meat and the thick, crusty bread that had been specially prepared for me. She settled the plate on her lap as she ate, taking small, delicate bites that made me wonder how much she actually tasted. Have you eaten growin' meat before? I asked. 
Uh, no, not really, she admitted. I've never even heard of Crowlin before. It's a bird that's native to Minneapolis. Big, feathered, and bald-headed. Tastes like moon elk. I haven't really tried moon elk either, she said. How do you like it? I asked as she took another bite of her meal. It's strange, she said. I can't quite put my finger on it. It's probably an acquired taste. It tastes better with the wine, I said, pouring her a glass. She eyed the goblet I passed her and then glanced at me. I don't think I've drunk wine in years. Not since I was... She stopped short, but I knew what she had been about to say. Not since I was a free woman. It's funny. Sometimes I actually forget what Earth was like, she said. Can you believe that? I forget my own home. Sometimes a year out here feels like a decade on Earth. What was it like? I heard myself ask. It was a mess, she admitted. Filled with wars and natural disasters and global warming. But for all that, it was home. I had a place there. I was someone important. Were you? I asked, picking out the little slip. She looked up and colored visibly. It's not important anymore, she said, grabbing the goblet and taking a big swig of the wine. Her face scrunched up and her nose wrinkled. Wow, that's strong. I smiled. It is strong wine. It has to be. Right, she nodded, before taking another sip. It's good. Another acquired taste? Not really. The second sip goes down a lot easier. She meant to set her goblet down, but her hand slipped and the wine spilled out onto the trolley's surface. She jumped up immediately. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. It doesn't matter, I said. It's just the table. You didn't get any wine on the food. Still, this is such a mess. She was trying to clear it up when I reached out without thinking and grabbed her hand. It's okay, I said. Leave it. She froze. Her eyes darted down to my hand, wrapped around the tiny circumference of her wrist, and I thought I felt a shiver roll through her body. I wasn't sure if it was a good sign or a bad one. I expected her to pull away or at least cringe back, but she did neither. Instead, she lifted her other hand and placed it on my chest, as though she were searching for something. I said nothing. Instead, I just sat there and waited. Slowly, her hand moved up my arm towards my neck. Her fingers lingered there only a moment before she cupped the side of my face with her palm. I saw her lips part, and I realized I was waiting desperately for her to speak. But before she could say anything, a resounding crash screamed through the air, and the whole spaceship jerked as though it had been thrown off course. I lurched forward, and I heard the girl gasp as she was thrown back. I reached out and managed to grab her hand just before she hit the floor. I pulled her upright but my eyes darted to the space windows that allowed me an unvarnished view of our position. I could see black diamond, rock-like debris cascading past us like throwing stars. I moved towards the windows, and I felt her tail behind me. What is that? The girl gasped from my side. The pelting specks of shimmering black stone glided past us with speed. It was easy to miss and hard to distinguish, but I had been privy to a collision before, and I knew from experience the deadly ruthlessness with which it could take down a spaceship, no matter the size or the power. A black asteroid, I said darkly. At that exact moment, the ship's internal siren went off. 
confirming that the hit we had taken had caused detrimental damage to some part of the ship. My ears pricked up as I picked up the distant sound of chaos breaking. Chapter 11 Yvette For a long time, I couldn't hear anything but the ringing in my ears. My body felt like it was in a state of numbing shock. I wasn't even aware that Rennell had his arms around me. But I quickly realized that was the only reason I was still standing. When he did release me to move towards his windows, I felt unmoored, as though I couldn't stand there on my own. It took me a while to remind myself that I was not on Earth. We were cruising somewhere in the vast galaxy, and this explosion had nothing to do with me. My hand went up to the three-leaf clover on my cheek, wondering if I was responsible for this. I heard a distant noise that sounded like a crash. It was as though something was splitting apart. My eyes tried to focus on the strange black shards catapulting outside the windows in front of us. But my attention was caught by the sudden alarm that screamed through the ship. We've been hit, Rennell said under his breath. I felt my breath grow shorter and heavier. We've been hit? Why did those words sing of deja vu? Someone had said the same thing to me a lifetime ago. I started to feel dizzy again, and every time I blinked, I kept seeing his face. Zelen. He was a large pax with jagged white fur and protruding teeth that distinguished his species. He had beady red eyes that gleamed with sadistic delight and his sneer was an eternal smile that had haunted my nightmares for years during my time in Servos. He was wrong. You are not an ill omen, I tried to tell myself. This is just a coincidence. I tried to push those red eyes out of my head as I put one foot in front of the other and joined Renel at his windows. Space could be an intoxicating thing. There was beauty even in the infinite blackness where colors went to die. But that was precisely what made it terrifying. It reminded you of how insignificant you were in the grand scheme of things. I saw large shooting masses of gleaming rock hurl past us like a massive space hailstorm that looked like black ice. What do you mean? I asked. We've been hit by what? We're being attacked? Rennell looked towards me with mild confusion. We've been hit by a black asteroid. Before I could ask anything else, something else hit the ship. I slammed into the windows, and I was about to land on the floor when Rennell caught me again. He pulled me close to his body so that my face was pressed up against his chest. I heard sirens go off through the ship, and a moment later a gush of panic and commotion sailed to meet us. Rennell's face was filled with a steely concentration that managed to reassure me. His arm was wrapped tight around my body, and I found myself leaning in closer, comforted by his presence. He felt like the only stable thing I could hold on to. Stay close to me, he said as he pulled me towards the door. What do you think that was? I asked, my voice shaking uncontrollably despite my resolve to maintain some level of composure. Another asteroid? Most likely, he replied. Those things are fucking ruthless. But I don't think we were in its direct path. I raised my eyebrows. How can we not be? I asked. That was a huge crash. If we'd been in its direct path, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, 
he said darkly. Come on. Where are we going? Somewhere safe, he said distractedly as he pulled me out of the room. The ship was in a state of upheaval. There were a series of tiny red lights that dotted the sides of each ceiling, alerting every creature on the ship of danger. I saw several crew members running through the wide passageways and open halls, trying to determine the point of impact and the amount of damage it had caused. I recognized the young draken who had been with Rennell at the slave market. Deverin, Rennell said as he walked up to us. How bad is it? The storage deck at the back of the ship, he replied, panting hard, his sentences coming out in bursts. I think we lost some supplies. What about drakens? Rennell asked. Or slaves? Not that we know of, Devron replied. We're still assessing. Despite the pandemonium raging around us, I saw Devron glance down to Rennell's hand, which was still locked around my wrist. Rennell didn't seem to notice, though. I doubt he even realized he was still holding on to me. His eyes were tense, but I could tell he was trying to assess his plan of action without allowing agitation to cloud his judgment. Where Gormson and Bletchgor? Rennell asked. Control room, Deverin said immediately. Good, Rennell nodded. I'll be there shortly. The younger Draken shot me a glance. You're not coming now? Deverin asked incredulously. I'll only be a few microns. Rennell snapped as he pulled me along the ship's main dome and towards the passageways that led to the kitchens. What are you doing? I asked, wondering where he was taking me when his crew needed him. The basement is the safest place for you right now, he said. Stay there until I send for you. Understood? I didn't nod because he was moving too fast and I was trying to concentrate on not tripping. I felt a nauseous sense of deja vu as I heard someone screaming about sealing off the blast site to stop asteroid debris punching through the main chambers of the ship. My dark memories stirred, and I wondered how I was going to fend them off once Rennell had left me. I could see the calculating worry etched into the hard lines of his face, but it was more than that. I knew how he felt. I had been in his position once. I had been a commander in my own right. And when that command mattered most, I had failed. I felt guilt not in my stomach like a steel hug, and I wanted to throw up. He wasn't allowing me any time to breathe, however. I stumbled several times as he pulled me along, but his body always served as the support I needed to keep me on my feet. When we approached the service elevators, I saw a light blinking on the side. It didn't normally do that, and I wondered if the elevators were functioning normally. It's just a warning, Rennell told me, noticing my preoccupation. The mainframe is heavily armed, and the energy soul powering the ship is inside it. We got into the elevator and glided down to the basement. A part of me wanted to ask why he was taking the time to escort me to the basement personally. Surely my safety was not his first concern at the moment. And yet I found myself struggling to find an alternate reason. He led me directly to my cell. Stay in here, he ordered. Once we have the situation under control, an announcement will be made on the internal comm system. He opened the door and shoved me gently inside. Wait, I said before he could leave. He stopped short. His eyes were wild, and I could see that it took all his self-control not to ignore me and leave. I wanted to tell him that I was sorry. This was my fault. How many times had this kind of thing happened around me? Wherever I was, catastrophe always followed. Just be careful, 
I said weakly, losing my courage at the last moment. He nodded once, and then the door closed on me. I took a deep breath, hoping that would calm me down. But I was alone now, and that meant there was no place to hide. Corporal! Her voice was so clear that she might have been standing next to me in my tiny holding cell. I saw her shadowed blue eyes and her matted hair. Kelly Tucker. She was thirty-seven years old, an only child and a closeted poetry lover. She was looking at me, waiting for me to give her an order. Corporal! She screamed, trying to get me to engage. The aliens have landed! They've breached through the first line of defenses. What do we do? She was looking at me like I had all the answers. But I was just as lost as she was. The aliens were stronger than us, more ruthless than us, and used to conquering planets. We were no match for them. But telling her as much felt like a betrayal. Prepare the missiles, I said. It was meant to be a last resort, but I had heard what had happened in China. They had waited to use their heavy artillery, and they had lost because of it. Now? Kelly asked. Now? I practically screamed, before they breached the second line of defenses. I closed my eyes and tried to shake the images that were flashing through my head. I didn't want to go back there. I didn't want to see their dead bodies littered across the rubble like forgotten dolls. I used to have sweating dreams. I used to wake up screaming and shaking. Then, one night, I had woken up to find Magdasa Yuri standing over me. She was looking down at me with her six arms folded together and a smile playing across her unrelenting face. I've been getting complaints about you, she said pleasantly. You're not the only wretched creature here, human. No one else can sleep. Her tone was even and kindly, and that was how I knew she had something terrible planned for me. She plucked me off my hard mattress and pulled me out into service as cold, characterless hallways. She dragged me to the tallest tower in the fortress and made me stand on the battlements between the decomposing bodies of two human slaves that had attempted to escape together four days ago. Are you ready to die, Runt? she asked. The icy wind clawed at my body like hot pinchers, and I shivered silently. The wind's intense bite was still preferable to the pungent smell wafting off the two bodies that flanked me, however. I just stood there, praying that she would kill me fast. Are you ready to die? Y yes I stammered. She laughed maniacally. Death will not come easy, she said. I will make you suffer first. I will peel the skin from your hands. The pain will be so excruciating that you will beg me to cut them off. Now, I will ask again. Are you ready to die? I glanced at her, wondering if my lips were blue. N no Magdasa Yuri smiled triumphantly. That's right, she nodded. Come down from there. I did as she bid me. I slipped as I lowered myself from the battlement and scratched my leg against the gray stone. I felt the sharp pang of blood rip free from my skin. Magdasa Yuri had moved closer to me. She bent low so that I could see her terrifying feline eyes. Her breath smelt like fresh blood. No more screaming. I nodded vigorously. You promise? P pr promise I stammered. Good.
good. Magdasa Yuri nodded charmingly. Then two of her massive green arms worked in perfect unison as they slammed across my face in a punch so powerful that I wore a green-tinted bruise for more than a month. But after that night, the sweating dreams had stopped. I heard someone scream, and the scream pulled me back to my cell on Rennell's ship. I turned on the spot and stared at the ceiling, wondering if it would cave in on me. The ground beneath my feet felt unsteady for the first time since I'd come on board. I had lived the last seven years of my life on shaky ground. I should have been used to it by now. Stop it, I told myself in the darkness of my room. Stop thinking. Turn your brain off. I took three long strides, and I was at the other end of my room. I slammed my fist into the wall and felt pain punch into my arm. I had to admit it felt good. The physical pain was distracting me from everything else. I kept hearing the whirling sirens of the spacecraft's emergency warning system, and the sound grated at my ears. In the end, I couldn't stay in the room. The walls felt like they were closing in on me, and I desperately wanted to breathe. I could smell the thin froth of smoke through the corridors as I made my way to the kitchens. I wondered if Gormit would be there, but when I walked in, I realized he was not. No one was. It was a kitchen full of displaced pots and pans. The crash had displaced many things, and shattered glass and crockery littered the floors. I was walking through the shambles when the whole spaceship jerked again. It wasn't quite a crash, but it succeeded in pushing me off my feet. Luckily, the sink was only a few feet away, and I fell against it, only mildly bruising my wrist. My knuckles were red and raw from when I had punched the wall in my room, so I opened the tap and ran it under some cold water. It soothed my irritated skin, but only temporarily alleviated the pain. I wondered what Ronell was doing now. I wondered what I would do in his position. People used to say that I had a natural talent for leadership. Now, all those men and women were dead, buried under the debris of a falling city. Here the reason they're all dead, Zelen's rat-like memory whispered in my ear. You could so easily have saved them all. Was it worth it? I wanted to run and hide from the voices in my head. Would I never be able to escape them? My dirty fingers scraped at the tattoo on my cheek. There were days when it actually felt heavy, as though it were another limb protruding from my face. I scraped hard at my cheek, wondering if I could cut it off. I spotted a large carving knife on the floor only a few feet away from me. I could do it now. Slice off my cheek with one quick slash and be done with it. I could remove the ill omen for good. Perhaps that would remove its power. Perhaps. I buried my face in my hands, trying to hold fast to sanity. I could not give myself over to dark memories. I had to be stronger. I had to be like a dragon. I thought about Rennell and the fire in his eyes. I needed to be more like him. I thought I heard another siren wail, but I wasn't sure if that was just in my imagination. Phantom sounds could reach you from anywhere when your mind was clouded with unresolved memories. I concentrated hard and realized that the chaos from an hour ago had dissolved somewhat. Had Rennell gotten the situation under control? How many casualties did he have? How could he rebuild from up here? Depending on the extent of the damage, 
he would have to find a peaceable planet to dock on so that he could make the necessary repairs. The Wyvern was one of the oldest ships in the fleet, and I knew it had just undergone a massive series of repairs. Questions circled around and around in my head, and I realized I was coming at the situation from a commander's perspective. I was not a commander anymore. The sad and depressing thought struck me that I had never really been a good one anyway. Perhaps if I had been, my squadron would have lived, and I would not be here, hiding under a sink with a collar around my neck. Chapter 12 Renell. Once I made sure the girl was safe in her cell, I felt more equipped to deal with the fallout from the asteroid hit. I knew my duty as commander should have trumped everything else, especially the safety of a human slave. But I had not been able to quell the protective instinct that stirred in my gut like a wild beast. Once the girl was confined to the basement... I raced back up towards the top decks of the ship. The emergency lights were still glowing sharply along the ceilings, letting me know we were not out of danger just yet. I raced through the ribbed vaults and circular passageways of the wyvern, before coming to a stop outside the control center. Only on-duty commanders could access the control room, so I hastily verified my identity on the authorization keypad before the doors slid open. Deverin, Gormson, and Bletchgor were all present, and I could see the tense rigidity of their backs, coupled with the thin veil of panic that dominated the atmosphere. Well, I asked pointedly, alerting them to my presence. How bad is it? The asteroid came out of nowhere, Bletchgore said, his tone steeped in regret. It came from right above us, a straight, perfect angle. Our sensors didn't pick up the heat because of how fast the asteroid came. We've been thrown off course, Gormson said, affording me only a quick glance. A few hundred leagues off course which means it'll take us about two days to get back on track and reroute. The supply unit has been breached, Deverin said. He was eyeing me as though he wasn't sure I could handle all this information. The asteroid broke through the defensive wall, and we've lost most of our food. We managed to close the second emergency door just before we lost our remaining supplies. So we haven't lost everything, then? I asked. We have enough food on board to feed the whole crew through the next five days. Perhaps seven if we ration carefully. Start rationing right now, I ordered. What about the other ships? Have you had any communication with them? Dashiell's ship was traveling alongside this one. The communication system is down, Deverin replied. We haven't been able to make contact with any of the fleet thus far. I growled under my breath. If any of our ships had been directly in the asteroid's path, they would be completely eviscerated. Try and locate Dashiell's ship. If we know where it is, maybe we can figure out a path to get to it. Yes, Commander, Gormson nodded. What about the other Commander's ships? Any sign of them? I pressed, despite the fact that they'd already given me an answer. The Starlight... The firebender, the raker. Not as yet, Commander, Gormson replied, staring at his monitors. But I'm still searching. I'm getting some signals, but we need to get closer to make sure we have one of our own instead of an enemy ship. I nodded. We'll need to alter our original plan. We may not have the resources to stay the course for Grissa. We might have to make a stop sooner rather than later in order to survey the damage to the ship and repair the supply deck. None of them replied to me, however, because at that moment, a light flickered faintly along the control panel. 
There was a lot of static, but it was better than nothing. Yes, Bletchgore said, raising his voice in excitement. I think I've got something. I think it's Dashiell's ship. I raced over to the monitor to examine the little blinking blue dot that marked one of our own. It was definitely Dashiell's ship. I recognized the identifier on the monitor. Can you tell if there's any damage from here? I asked. Not from here. Hold on, Deverin said. I think someone's trying to communicate from the ship. A message is coming through. We crowded around the communications monitor and waited with bated breath. There was the faint sound of static, and then I heard the slur of words. The signal isn't strong, Deverin pointed out unnecessarily. Dashel, I called, speaking into the microphone. The blocky static got worse for a moment, sizzling up my ears with its unpleasant snarl. But a few seconds later, it cleared, and snippets of sentences reached us. Hit from the right side. Lost two crew. Three slaves. Commander, down. A voice rumbled through the static. The voice was strangely familiar. Youthful, but full of promise. On the heels of the sentence, the comm system packed up and the small blinking light died down without ceremony. I roared loudly and started pacing. Commander down, I repeated. What does that even mean? I don't think he's dead, Commander, Bletchgore said. He would have been included in the body count if that were the case. I think he's just injured. We need to fix the communication system immediately. Get to work. Yes, Commander. Let me know the moment you get it fixed. Understand? Of course. I left the control station feeling shaky and helpless. I was relieved that my ship and my crew had faced minimal damage, but my mind was now preoccupied with worry over Dashiell and his crew. No mention had been made of Natalie, or their hatchlings. I went straight to the supplies dock to survey the damage for myself. Five of my crew members were at the site. The supplies and grain stores that were usually confined to storage had been pulled in, and the emergency door was engaged, sealing off the loading bay. I looked through the glass and saw that the storage dock's loading and unloading doors had been completely blown apart. It was amazing we'd managed to salvage any of our supplies. I could see the midnight blue of space clouds pass by, along with a few floating rocks that hit the sides of the ship with careless ease. Malik was there, bossing the rest of the crew around with an overbearing presence. As I stepped up to him, the words died on his tongue and he glanced at me sheepishly. Commander, he said. I was just making sure nothing else would breach the emergency door. Has the door been properly sealed? I asked. I made sure of it, Malik nodded. Very well, I replied. Move our remaining supplies to one of the empty chambers down the hall. Limit the rations you allow the cook each day. We need to be conscientious about our consumption now. I saw the looks on several of my crew members' faces. They were not happy about the idea of rationing. Dracon had massive appetites, and if you gave any of them a choice, they would have picked war over hunger any day. Make hourly reports to me, I told him. Yes, Commander, Malik nodded, although I knew he had no intention of making those reports himself. He'd probably palm the job off on some lesser Dracon whom he could manipulate. On another day, I might have called him out on it, but I had enough on my mind. I left Malik and the rest of them to their work and headed back down the passageway that had led me to the supply stock. I intended to go back to the control room to ask if the communication system was running properly again, but I found myself taking a different route. I should have been with my crew, 
but a selfish part of me wanted to be somewhere else. I didn't dwell on that, though. I simply let my legs carry me to the room I had left her in. I didn't bother knocking. I just pushed the door open and looked inside. I didn't have to look around to know that the space was empty. She had left her room against my express orders. I had expected to feel annoyed, but all I could summon up was worry. Disaster did seem to follow her everywhere. What if she had been hurt? What if something terrible had happened to her? I sniffed the air and caught a plume of her heady scent. It was becoming more and more familiar to me now. I followed the scent right to the kitchens and walked in expecting to see her cooking, cleaning, or doing something equally ridiculous. Instead, I found myself standing in a seemingly empty kitchen, staring at the wreckage the asteroid had made of the basement. I sniffed the air and concentrated hard. She was definitely here. Her scent was all over the kitchen, but I couldn't spot her. Then I heard the sound of moving limbs from underneath the sink, and I walked around and bent down. She was sitting there with her arms wrapped around her legs. Her face was pale and her eyes were closed. For a moment, I thought she was praying. I started to say her name. The name I had neglected to say thus far. My throat itched, but I pushed the word out of my mouth, letting the intimacy of it coat my tongue. Yvette. Her eyes darted open, and she stared at me with large, honey-flecked eyes. She looked like she didn't recognize me. Her expression was impassive, before breaking into an uncertain fear. Yvette, I said again. Is everything all right? she asked. Is the ship okay? We'll be fine, I nodded. What are you doing under there? She looked around as though she had just realized she was sitting under a sink. I wanted to get away from the explosions. I frowned. What explosions? The ones in my head, she said, her voice breaking over the last few words. I reached out and presented her with my hand. Come on, come out from under there. She hesitated as she stared at my clawed hand and the gnarly scales that coated my skin. Then she slipped her hand into mine and I pulled her out. She got shakily to her feet and looked around. I don't know what happened, she admitted. I think the grass just, it brought back bad memories. Maybe even a little PTSD I didn't know I had. What is that? I asked. Oh, she said, raising her eyebrows. It stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, she nodded. It's a mental health disorder. Many humans suffer from it. It's triggered by painful, shocking, or distressing events. And you have this? I might, she nodded. I'm sure it's not exclusive to humans. I imagine every intelligent life form suffers from it. Not Draken, I said gruffly. She looked at me skeptically. We are strong, I said. Battle is part of life. We are trained for it from the moment of hatching. She looked at me carefully, her eyes searching my face for the chink in my armor. You never lost someone? she asked. Someone you loved? I bristled at the question. It was too much, too personal, too invasive. She seemed to realize that because she broke eye contact. It's okay, she said. You don't have to answer that. I just... What happened today, it made me think of something from my past. Something I've been trying to forget. Memories of Earth? I asked. She looked up at me through long, curling, dark eyelashes. Her eyes really were beautiful. 
pools of deep, soft browns that held all the colors of a theron on them. Yes, she nodded, her voice ghost-like. I watched them all die. I frowned, trying to keep up with her fast-moving thoughts. She was lost in a reverie of her own making, and I could see the power of those memories was making her hands tremble. Who were they? I asked. Her eyes fluttered, and I saw a film of water pass over the surface of her iris. My men, she whispered, and women. My squadron. The eleventh squadron charged with protecting New York. New York? I repeated. The city I was born in, she replied. The city I was charged with protecting. I raised my eyes with sudden realization. You were a commander? I was not always a slave, you know, she said harshly. Then her tone softened, and her defensiveness melted away under the weight of emotions. I used to be someone important. You commanded a crew of your own, I asked, trying to imagine her in the role I was currently encompassing. No, but I led a military unit, she admitted. I was impressed despite myself. I had seen the edge of ferocity in her character, but it had been buried under years of slave labor. She had been transformed into someone who had to adopt an air of meekness in order to survive. Was it possible that I actually felt sorry for her? Suddenly, the collar around her neck jumped out at me. It was a screaming reminder of the reality that had been forced on her. Suddenly... I couldn't look at her without feeling a thin veil of shame wrap itself around my conscience. What happened? I asked, wondering if it was a mistake to ask the question. They died, she replied, her face flushed with bitter sadness and the claustrophobic pain of regret. Because of me. I watched her try to regain some semblance of calm, but she was too far gone into her past. Commanders always feel a sense of responsibility for the men that follow them. You can't have... You don't understand, she said, cutting me off brusquely. I was given a choice. I found myself moving closer to her, enamored of her story and the person she used to be. I was willing to wager that deep down she was still that person. It was just that she had lost parts of herself along the way. What was the choice? I pressed. The mayor, the uh, leader of my city, was paranoid about an attack, that started. Beijing, another city on Earth, had been attacked only months before. The world? thought the attack was an inside job, orchestrated by the Chinese mob, but Beijing claimed it was aliens. No one believed them, I guessed. It was hard to believe them, Yvette said, her tone tittering dangerously on the brink of collapse. The concept of aliens was a foreign one. Humanity has always struggled with the idea but there were those among us who believed. The leader of my city was one of them. He made sure we were prepared, and because of his orders, we had set up certain defenses in anticipation of an attack. She glanced up at me, but her eyes were glazed over. She wasn't really seeing me at all. I never truly believed it would happen, she admitted. But then New York's entire power grid blew out and cut us off from the rest of the world. It was Beijing all over again. And just like that, the sky was falling down on us, and the aliens were attacking. I had never been to Earth. I had never seen their strange trees or buildings. But I had been on the ground in a world succumbing to invasion. You hadn't seen chaos until you had seen a planet being taken. 
It was death, anguish, and hopelessness personified. The Pax Alliance sent an emissary to meet with me, Yvette continued. His name was Scarvo, and he spoke for the commander of their forces, Zelen. He told me that our defeat was inevitable. They would spare our lives only if we surrendered. But you would all be put to collar. Yes, Yvette nodded. We would be slaves, but we'd be alive. Scarvo told me that if I refused their offer, Zelen would kill every last one of my squadron while I watched. Then he would make a slave of me anyway. You didn't take him up on the offer, I nodded. Yvette looked down, and I saw a tear slip free from her face. I was filled with human pride, the gullibility of noble intentions. I thought... You did the right thing, I said sharply. It is better to fight and lose rather than surrender without putting up a fight. There is no honor in yielding. Honor? She repeated, looking at me as though the word had no meaning for her. There was no honor in any of it. I noticed her hand reach up to the three-leaf clover tattoo on her left cheek. It had become her defining characteristic. And yet, there were times when it completely slipped my notice. The Pax did that to you? I asked. Zelen did it himself, the vet replied. Her tone punctured his name with loathing. He wanted to give me a memento of that day, so that I would never forget what my decision did to my men. War is ruthless, I said. Creatures die all the time on both sides of every war ever fought. The Pax invaded and overpowered you. That is not your fault. Isn't it? Yvette asked, and her tone moored in lamentation. You must have noticed. Bad things tend to happen whenever I'm around. Like the asteroid. My eyes shot to her face. You can't honestly. Before I could finish my sentence, I felt my crest light up. What's happening? Yvette asked, her eyes going wide with fear. They need me in the control center, I explained. The fleet is scattered, and we haven't been able to locate Dashiell's ship. Can't you contact them and get their coordinates? Yvette asked, her expression changing immediately to one of fear. The comm system is down, I replied. We can't get clear messages across. Dashiell's ship tried to make contact, but they got cut off. I turned towards the exit, but her hand reached out and grabbed my arm. I froze, and so did she. Our eyes met, and for one turbulent moment I couldn't see past her hypnotizing eyes. Maybe I can help, she said urgently. I raised my eyebrows. I know your software and equipment will be different to what I'm used to, but at the end of the day, it's all just science. If I can take a look at the internal mechanisms of your comm system, maybe I can find a way to correct it. I considered it. Her eyes were earnest and determined, but I could see past what she wanted me to see. The truth was that she was afraid to be left alone. She didn't want to be limited to the confines of the basement. Not with all the ghosts she had carried with her through her life as a slave. The control room was restricted to the drakens of the Hyles reign. Only a trusted few outside of the commanders were granted access to the inner sanctum. But I realized with a start that I did trust this human. Very well, I nodded. Come with me. Chapter 13 Yvette Renell led me up the service elevator from the basement and through the ship's labyrinth of passageways until we reached an area that was cordoned off by a set of large steel doors. 
They looked Spartan in the extreme. And when they slid apart, I realized there was another set of doors on the other side. These doors were embellished with a shiny metal that seemed to throw off any and all reflections. Rennell stepped forward and pressed his hand against the authorization pad at the side of the door. Immediately, they slid apart to reveal the control center. I walked in gingerly, trying to hide behind Rennell as much as I could. The control room was a large room with an oval nose that looked out into the infinite galaxy we were traveling through. I knew the glass that made up the windows was extremely thick, but it certainly didn't look that way from where I was standing. It looked like another hit by an asteroid would cause it to shatter and take us all out in the break. It was a beautiful sight, and I might have been able to enjoy it more if it hadn't been for the three large dragon who were staring at me with suspicious gazes. What happened? Rennell asked. Did you secure contact with Dashiell's ship? None of the dragon took their eyes off me. Dashiell's ship is trying to establish a clear comms line, Devron answered. We thought it was working, but then the connection all but died. Rennell growled low and I took a step back. What is the slave doing here? Devron announced, his tone making it clear what he thought of me being allowed into a restricted area of the ship. She is here under my orders. To help, Rennell said in a curt voice that made me suspect he was slightly embarrassed about his decision to bring me here. To help, Devron repeated incredulously. How can she possibly help us in the control room? I want her to take a look at the comm system, Rennell told them. Devron glanced at me and his gaze was biting. Commander, with all due respect, look at the mark upon her face. She will only make the situation worse. I felt shame burn hot on my cheeks, and my first instinct was to reach up and touch the tattoo on my face. The only thing that stopped me was the way Rennell's eyes darted back towards me, as though he expected me to do just that. I'm aware of what the mark means, Rennell nodded sharply. I will not cow to it. A draken should not believe in silly superstitions. Devon flushed with embarrassment. She is only a human. What could she possibly know? I couldn't see Rennell's face clearly before his back was to me. But I could tell from the rigid stance of his spine that he was not happy with Deverin's tone, or the way he was subtly questioning Rennell's decision to bring me here. She is here at my command, Rennell said. His words were each a nuanced growl. Do you have a problem with that? Deverin dropped his gaze. No, Commander, he replied. Good, Rennell nodded. Now move aside, all three of you. I want her to take a look at the comm system. The two drakens sitting on either side of the sour-faced Deverin were unfamiliar to me. The one on Deverin's left was perhaps the largest dragon I'd ever seen. He was even taller than Rennell, and his scales were a dark, insidious brown that was almost black. The dragon sitting to the right of Deverin had off-white scales, with tinges of burnt orange mixed into the ridges of his arms. When Rennell asked them to move, Deverin balked visibly, but the other two were smarter. Both maintained expressions of detached impassivity. How can she be useful? The massive dragon asked as he stood up. What would a human slave know about our spacecrafts? More than you realize, I said, anger pushing me to speak, despite the fact that I had no clue if I'd actually be any help. I was a commander once, too. 
All three Draken looked at me with keen surprise. It was nice to be underestimated. You were a commander? The tall Draken asked. Gormson, Rennell said before I could reply. Move aside and let her take a look at the comm system. Gormson paused and I knew it was hitting his pride to allow me to look over what he had been unable to solve. How sweet the victory would be if I actually managed to fix the problem. Gormson! Renell growled. Gormson moved aside reluctantly, and I uttered a silent prayer for myself as I walked over to the extensive comm system that seemed to take up half the servers in front of me. I recognized some parts of the machines. They looked similar to the ones I'd worked with back on Earth, but there were other parts that were foreign to me. Look at her face, Deverin scoffed. She has no clue what to do. She's filled your head with lies. She was no commander. Are you saying she fooled me? Rennell snarled as he took a threatening step towards Deverin. I watched as the younger dragon flinched back in obvious fear and backed down immediately. Of course not, Commander. I only meant that she... Stop talking, Rennell hissed. Get out of my face right now. I want to get this system fixed, and I can't do it with you second-guessing my every move. Commander, out! Rennell yelled, his voice echoing across the room, causing me to shiver instinctively. Gormson, Bletchker, that goes for you, too. They were not happy. I felt their glares on the back of my neck as they exited the control room, but I couldn't help feeling a little thrill of satisfaction as well. The moment we were alone, I looked towards Rennell. You didn't have to do that. They were being overly harsh. I wonder where that comes from, I said pointedly. He almost smiled. Almost. But to me, that almost smile spoke volumes. Were we on the verge of a fragile friendship? Would this be the start of a different kind of life for me? I stopped the thought in its tracks. I was getting ahead of myself, as usual. I needed to manage my expectations and stop thinking of myself as a free woman. Rennell may have softened towards me, but he still kept the collar around my neck, a constant reminder of what I was and who he was to me. Not a friend, but a master. I turned back to the control panel and looked over the monitors again. I'm going to need some help, I said. Not all these contraptions are familiar to me. You'll have to explain each one so that I know how to proceed. I can do that, Rennell nodded as he retrieved a large manual from a storage unit in the back of the room. What do you need to know? This small green button has a bunch of wires attached to it, I said. I need to know what it does and what each wire is connected to. As Rennell scanned through the huge manual, I couldn't help but feel a rush of something. Excitement? Nervousness? Gratitude? It felt amazing to be doing something challenging for a change. I had forgotten how much I missed taking the lead. One by one, Rennell explained to me each unfamiliar button device, and wire that made up the comm system. I felt like I was back in bomb training, picking through each little thing to make sure I made the right connections. Rennell was surprisingly patient through the whole process. He answered every question I asked, and he allowed me the silences I required to piece together the broken connections that had been caused by the asteroid crash. As patient as he was, however... I could not escape how nervous he seemed to be. He had mentioned the fleet a few times, but not half so much as he had mentioned Dashiell. 
I could sense that Rennell shared a close bond with his fellow commander. Are you close to all the other commanders? I asked, making an attempt to distract him. He didn't take his eyes off the sequence of buttons I was adjusting. Most, he nodded. But Dashiell and I, we're close. His ship is the one that tried to communicate with you? We lost the signal before they could give us any real information, Rennell nodded. All I know is that Dashiell is hurt somehow. I don't know how badly. I saw the droop in his large, usually fierce eyes. He was more worried than he cared to show. But I was starting to see through his hard exterior. It was all just a mask to hide the vulnerability lying just underneath. Perhaps it was this realization that gave me the courage to reach out and put my hand on his shoulder. It's never easy, I said. To know that someone needs your help and not be able to do anything about it. He's strong, Rennell said, almost to himself. Whatever the injury, he'll pull through. He loves his wife too much to die. He loves those wild hatchlings, too. If he's anything like you, then I have no doubt he will survive, I said, rubbing his shoulders in slow, concentric circles. He looked at me, and there was something indiscernible in his eyes. I wondered if he was going to shrug off my hand, or if he was going to lean in and kiss me. Lean in and kiss me? I jerked back at that thought, shocked that it had come so easily to mind. Uh, why don't you go and eat something? I suggested. My ulterior motive was in getting a few moments to myself, mostly because Rennell's close proximity to me was starting to make me think things I really shouldn't have been thinking about at all. I'm not hungry. Eat something anyway, I said, knowing that Draken usually grew fiercer when they were hungry. What about you? What about me? I asked. Aren't you hungry? I shrugged. I'm used to going days without food. This is nothing. He eyed me carefully and then nodded. The moment he left the control room, I breathed a sigh of relief. The intoxicating pull of his present had me all turned around, and I needed to get my bearings. We had been pressed so close together, and his eyes had a hypnotic quality about them. I was honestly shocked at my own feelings. I had once thought the idea of a man with wings, scales, and a tail was stomach-turning. But it seemed that something had changed. Shaking my head, I pushed Ronell out of my thoughts, focusing on the task at hand. Glancing at the manual that had been left behind, I followed the diagram and opened the little glass casing that housed the main wires, connecting the whole comm system. It looked like there had been a short in one of them when the asteroid had hit. I realized that if I rerouted the unit and connected it to a different functional port, I might have a chance of restarting the communications line with Dashiell's ship. I held my breath as I made the new connections. There was a small spark that mimicked electricity, and I pulled my hand back just in time. I tried a few more ports until the wire slid seamlessly into a small blue port. I knew I had probably cut the communications to another ship in the fleet, but I figured we needed to know what was happening on Dashiell's ship first. There was a crackle of life on the other side, and a second later, I heard signal come in loud and clear. Yes, I gasped as the sweet taste of victory coated my tongue. Hello, I asked pressing the button and speaking into the little microphone. Hello, is anyone there? This is Gignar. Our messages were not reaching you. I didn't recognize the voice on the other end, nor did I care. 
Our comm systems were down, I replied quickly. I've just managed to fix it. Is this second commander Gormson? Uh, no. Bletchgor? No. Deverin? My name is Yvette, I said, because I didn't know what else to say. I know no commanding officer on the Wyvern by that name, the growly voice replied, turning harsh instantly. Who are you, and why have you taken control of the ship? I am under orders from Commander Rennell, I said quickly. Where is he now? I paused. Who are you? Before I could answer, the door slid open, and Rennell walked back into the control room. His eyes fell on the glowing button in front of me, and he rushed forward. It's working! Just the direct line to Dashiell's ship, I nodded. But it's a start. Commander Rennell? The tracking on the Gignor asked. It's me, Modoc, Rennell nodded. Yvette is here under my orders. She is responsible for the communication we're currently having. What happened? Where's Dashiell? Hurt. But he will make a full recovery. Debris from the asteroid hit us on a sideways trajectory. We lost two wings, but our craft is strong enough to fly without them for a short distance. Dashiell was thrown by the hit, and he injured his head. He's in the medical facility now, which is why I have command. He's not conscious at the moment, but he will be in a few hours. We'll need to reroute immediately, Rennell said. Neither one of these ships can stay in the air for long. Set course for Theron. We can regroup there. There was a pause. What about Grissa? Rennell ground his teeth together. Forget Grissa, he snarled. Our fleet is not ready for a pillaging mission. Our ships need to recuperate. But... What about Commanders Lahar and Tarion? Murdoch asked. I saw anger and impatience flit across Rennell's face. I was surprised at how persistent the Draken commanding Gignar was. It was almost like he wanted to pillage Grissa despite the hits the fleet had taken. Once we make contact with them, they will understand the decision. Rennell shot back. I cannot control the whole fleet, but I can command my own ship, and by extension, Dashiell's. Or do you plan on defying my orders, Modoc? There was a pregnant pause, and I could sense that this Modoc was genuinely considering his options. No, Commander Rennell, Modoc replied at last. I will not defy your orders. Good, Rennell hissed, disdain coloring his tone. Keep me updated on Dashiell's status. I want to know the moment he is conscious. Yes, Commander Rennell, Modoc replied in a monotonous voice. The light blinked off, and Rennell turned to me slowly. You did it, he breathed. Despite everything that had happened in the last several hours, I found myself smiling. Have a little faith. Not all humans are useless. His eyes softened. How did you get it to work? He asked. I didn't fix the whole comm system, I pointed out quickly. Just your direct line with Gignar. I knew you were worried about Dashiell and I wanted... Well, I wanted you to have peace of mind. His eyes were bright. I had never seen him look more human. I felt my body lean in without my permission, drawn to the gratitude I could see etched across his face. I could sense the makings of a fragile friendship. No, friendship was too strong a word. Perhaps, at least, there would be mutual respect between us. I could be satisfied with that. Thank you, he said. It was the first time he said as much to me, 
and the sentiment nearly knocked me over with shock. No one had thanked me for anything in the last seven years. In that moment, he was not the owner, and I was not the slave. He was just a shifter who had asked for help, and I was a human who had agreed to help him. There was something beautifully sentimental about that. It stripped away our roles and left us bare. You don't have to thank me, I heard myself say. Actually, I do, Renell nodded. You didn't have to help me. In fact, anyone in your position would have chosen not to, even if they had been confident they knew how to correct the problem. I looked away from his emphatic eyes. I used to think his eyes were terrifying with their animalistic tenacity. But now I thought differently. He was more than his terrifying appearance. He's your friend. I said. I know what it's like to lose people. Rennell's eyes clouded with confusion. You surprise me, human, he said. The way he said the word human was different than how he normally said it. It wasn't an insult or derogatory term. He wasn't flinging it in my face and expecting me to cower. He said it with a new kind of awe. The kind of awe that came from a lifetime of believing one thing and then discovering it was something else entirely. Sometimes, I said quietly, I surprise myself, too. Chapter 14 Renell. Your commanders don't like me. Yvette said, glancing at me out of the corner of her eye. I felt contradicting instincts tunnel their way to the surface. On the one hand, I wanted to defend my fleet brothers, and on the other, I wanted to scoff at their ridiculous sense of importance. They don't think a human can do what they could not. I realize that, Yvette nodded as her eyes turned down to the active line between Gignar and Wyvern. I could see a kernel of satisfaction in her eyes, and I knew that she was allowing herself a moment to revel in her success. Our way of life is different from your reality, I said, feeling the need to explain my commander's viewpoints. A part of me realized that it was because I had shared the very same perspective not so long ago. For the Hyle's reign, battle and war are an inevitable part of life. We are taught to reeve, rove, and pillage as hatchlings. We go from planet to planet and take what we want. It is the right of the strong and powerful. It is how we have always lived. That doesn't make it right, Yvette said, her voice shaking with emotion. Everyone deserves the right to their own freedom. Everyone deserves the right to have a future. If freedom is what you seek, then you must fight for it, I told her. The only thing that wins wars is strength. Her eyes bore into my face, and I actually felt self-conscious. It was a distinctly uncomfortable feeling, one that made my scales feel cold and my breath come in a little faster. Yvette looked at me with an expression I couldn't read. I wanted to reach out and touch her, but suddenly I was nervous. She took a step closer to me and put her hand against my chest. It was a tentative gesture, and I recognized that she was as confused by her emotions as I was. Does it make you feel powerful to reduce whole species to chains? She asked, with a patience that I didn't recognize. We do not make slaves, I said firmly. That is the trade of the Pax Alliance. But you purchase slaves. Yvette pointed out. Every single ship in the fleet is equipped 
with a functioning staff of slaves. There is a difference. Where is the difference? She asked, cutting me off. There is none. Tell me, does it give you satisfaction to see someone with no choice and no free will? She moved closer still, and the strong, heady scent of her flooded my nostrils and made me want to drink her in. Her palm moved slowly against my chest as she spoke. I would think it's more satisfying to have someone do something for you because they want to. We were dangerously close. The smell of her was intoxicating, and I realized why. She smelled of the cookies she loved to bake for me. Her eyes were limpid pools of beauty, and if I looked closely, I could see my reflection in them. I had been fighting this for a long time, probably since the first time I'd set eyes on her. I just hadn't admitted it till right now. I wanted her. This strange and complicated human, who was more draken than she realized. My hand reached out and wrapped itself around her neck. She didn't gasp or cry out. She didn't even pull away from me. It was like she had been expecting it. I held fast to the back of her neck as soft and fragile as a dove's wing, and pulled her to me. I could feel the strange tension between us. It was rife with desire. I paused a moment, trying to test the boundaries of this fragile break in the wall that had been between us since the first moment we had set eyes on one another. I met her gaze, and she stared back at me challengingly. I leaned in, and she did too. Our lips met, and I felt as though the fire inside me had traveled outward and coated my skin. Not since Heron had I felt this way, like I was in my dragon form, soaring through the skies without tethers, without responsibility, without worries. I felt her arms wrap themselves around my shoulders, and my hands fell to her back. She was impossibly small, and I realized that I could seriously hurt her if my concentration slipped. That thought made me pull back and release my hold on her. Her eyes were filled with desire. Her lips were raw from the kiss we had just shared. What's wrong? she asked. I... we shouldn't be doing this. Why not? she demanded. Why not? She was a slave. She was a human. She was everything I didn't want. And yet, my body was calling out to hers. My erection pressed hard and insistent against the fabric of my leathers, and I shifted uncomfortably on my feet. I don't want you to feel like, like you have to, I admitted. She smiled. I know I don't have to, she replied. I want to. My erection throbbed, bordering on painful. The instinct to touch her had always been there, strong and insistent. I had just buried it under prejudice. As lust kicked into overdrive, the intellectual, mindful part of myself started losing out to the carnal, animalistic part. A low growl escaped my throat, and she froze for a moment. I had to remind myself that she was delicate and unfamiliar with draconian ways. Do you know what you're getting yourself into? I asked. She looked at me through her thick, dark eyelashes. Probably not, she admitted. But I don't care. You might. 
We'll just have to do it and find out, won't we? With another hungry growl, I pulled her to me and slipped my tongue into her mouth. She tasted of cookies. Sweet and warm and incredibly comforting. Her arms wrapped around my chest and shoulders, and I ripped off her slave's garments. They landed on the floor between us, and I kicked them out of the way. Underneath, she was wearing a tight white band around her breasts and matching underwear. Let me, she said, glancing at my claws. She freed herself of her undergarments, and I stepped back to watch. She unwound the white band around her breasts with exaggerated slowness. Every few seconds, her eyes darted to my face as though my expression was giving her satisfaction. As the last piece of fabric twirled away from her chest, I was able to admire the round fullness of her perfect breasts. I realized the band she wore smashed them down and made them appear smaller than they were in reality. When she pulled off her underwear, my eyes traveled ravenously over the sharp jut of her hips and the delicious sweetness I knew awaited me between her legs. When she finally stood naked in front of me, I realized that I wanted a moment to just stand there and look at her. Her body was an alien thing, a place I had never ventured before. She was small, yes, but there was strength in her sharp collarbones and the high swell of her breasts. Her stomach was taut and flat, and her slim thighs met at the mesmerizing V of her groin. I saw the heavy rise and fall of her chest, and I realized that she must have been nervous. You couldn't tell from her expression. She looked at me unblinkingly, conveying pride and confidence that I had only just now recognized in her. You are beautiful, I said. I hadn't meant to speak at all, but she overwhelmed me. The only other time I had felt this strongly was with Heron. And that had been another lifetime ago. So are you, she said, taking me by surprise. You are not afraid? I asked. I thought I would be, she replied. But I'm not. I turned towards the control room's door and sealed it shut so that no one could enter. Then I removed my crest, tunic, and trousers. I peeled them all away from my body, taking care not to tear any of them on my wings or caudle. She watched me in the same way I had watched her. When I was naked, I walked towards her. My hand reached out and cupped the heavy swell of her right breast. You'll have to tell me if I hurt you. Instead of answering me, she pulled me towards her and our bodies met. Was there a feeling so singularly perfect as that first moment? When skin met skin, and you were reduced to your most basic nature. It didn't matter that she was human and I was dragon. All that mattered was the way our bodies spoke to one another. That invisible barrier that existed between us seemed to dissolve into nothing. She was no longer a slave, and I was no longer her master. That was when I realized how much sweeter this union was. After years of wondering... I finally understood what Tarion, Lahar, and Dashiell must have felt with their human mates. There was nothing unnatural about this. Her hand slipped down and wrapped around my cock. I heard her sigh against my chest, and the sound sent tendrils of passion running through my spine. I grabbed her firm buttocks and lifted her in the air. 
her legs wrapped around my waist, and I laid her down against the control panel. I entered her in one swift move. The wetness between her legs made my entrance smooth and easy. I heard her gasp with uninhibited desire. She clutched at my chest as I pushed in and out of her, my thrust growing more and more vigorous the longer we went. Her fingers clawed at my skin, but it barely made a scratch. Her nails, sharp as they were, had no impact on my tough skin. They only served to inflame me. At one point, she screamed out and her eyes rolled back in her head. I saw ecstasy on her face, but I also read pain. I hurt you, I whispered against her ear. It's okay, she breathed. I want it. Keep going. How could I say no? How could I stop myself when I was so close? When she was so close? I pushed her down against the control panel and rammed into her harder and harder with my hands on her breasts. New drops of perspiration blossomed on her skin, and I licked them away as we came together. She gasped and shuddered and I growled loudly as I released myself inside of her. Had there ever been a more fulfilling moment in my life? If there was, I couldn't even think of it. I bit at her ear as she pushed me off her gently and looked around for her clothes. I would have liked to stay with her a little longer. I would have liked to enjoy our nakedness a little more but her eyes darted to the control room's doors, and I knew we didn't have that luxury. I pushed away my need for her and reached for my crust. Chapter 15 Yvette I was in the kitchen, trying very hard to concentrate on the work I needed to finish. The kitchen and the scullery were a mess, and Gormit was beside himself. Now that the ship was cruising relatively smoothly, we could start work around the ship once more. Gormit had been tasked with making dinner for the commanders, and the kitchen was full of his Vin's helpers. As usual, I was the only one who had been designated to the scullery, but I barely cared about that. Work I could tackle alone, but the voices in my head, not so much. After what Ronell and I had shared in the control room only a few hours before, it was hard for me to get myself back in the headspace of a slave. But, of course, the harsh reality was that I had never stopped being one. Being with Ronell in that way had changed nothing. The collar was still tight and heavy around my neck. I took a deep breath as I paused over the sink. Now that I was back in the dark confines of the scullery by myself, it felt like I had dreamt the whole thing. I tried to remember that first kiss again. It had been urgent and fevered, as though Renell had been unable to stop himself. I wondered if he had struggled with the idea of being with someone like me, just as I had struggled against the thought of being with him. He had fucked me passionately, but I could tell between the tangled knots of our breaths that he had not planned this, nor had he seen it coming. Shortly after, we had been forced to dress and release the lock of the control room, so there had been no opportunity to talk about what had just happened. A part of me was worried. What if we never spoke about it? What if Renell brushed it to the side and pretend like it had never happened? The nagging fear crept into my head and refused to allow me a moment's peace. 
The joining door between the kitchen and the scullery slid open, and a hoity-looking vent stepped in with her hands full of used pots and pans. She moved quickly to the second sink and dumped the lot of them into it. She barely glanced at me as she clicked her way back into the kitchen. A moment later, the door slid shut, and I was alone again in the shadows. I sighed with frustration as I turned to the new mountain of washing I needed to get done. I tried to organize the dishes in the second sink to make room for washing, and in the process of separating the smaller dishes from the larger ones, I knocked over a small pot. It dropped to the floor with a small crash, and I uttered a silent prayer that no one from the kitchen could hear it. I had broken enough things, and I was already skating on thin ice with Gormit. I heard the door slide open again, and I closed my eyes with weariness. I already had so much washing to get done, and they were already bringing me more. Just a small accident, I said quickly, bending to my knees. I'll get it cleaned up immediately. Don't bother. I'll have someone else do it. I froze, the voice sending chills up and down my spine. I looked up and saw Rennell standing there in the threshold, his dark burgundy scales gleaming. Had there ever been a time when I had thought those scales were ugly, barbaric even? Now I could only see their Spartan beauty. Hi, I said, because that was the first thing that popped to mind. Hi, he replied without emotion. He looked slightly confused, as though he had opened the door and expected to find someone else there. I broke another dish, I said, trying to fill the gaping silence. Another one? Ronell asked. I was distracted. His eyes dipped low and then landed on my face again. I took a few steps forward. What are you doing here? I came to ask you, Rennell started, but then he trailed off without finishing the sentence. Yes? Will you come with me to my chambers? Rennell asked. I felt my breath catch, and I tried to squelch the burst of joy that blossomed in my chest. What was wrong with me? I should have been so happy to have captured his attention. I should have wanted to escape him. Instead, I found myself waiting for a chance to run towards him. Yes, I nodded, unable to fight it. Come, I raised my eyebrows. Now? Yes. But I have work to do, I said, looking around the scullery. And I broke a dish. You already told me, Rennell nodded. Leave it. But you don't have to do that. Rennell insisted. I'll have someone else see to it. Gormit won't be happy, I said. Gormit is not the commander of this ship, Rennell said authoritatively. I am. Was he trying to remind me that he was in charge? I didn't think he was. He was just telling me that I didn't have to worry about anyone else. What he wanted was the only thing that mattered. Perhaps he was trying to tell me that I mattered, too. Okay, I said, as I walked over the broken shards and moved towards him. We left the scullery and took the elevator up to the commander's quarters. We passed a few dragon on the way there, and all of them watched me wearily. I wondered whether the knowing glint in their eyes was just a result of my imagination. I chose to believe it was. When we got to Rennell's rooms, he pushed a button to the side and the door slid open. He gestured me inside, and I heard the door slide closed a few seconds later. I turned to him, wondering if he would address what happened between us or simply move past it. He was looking at me hungrily, an edge of desire coating his expression. I glanced down, 
and saw the start of an erection against his trousers. My fingers twitched, aching to reach out and touch him again, but I resisted the urge. I wanted to see what he would do now. I wanted to know what he would say. You can sleep on my bed, Renell said, taking me by surprise. I'm sure it'll be more comfortable than the thing you usually sleep on. Before I could respond, he turned his back on me and started undressing. First, he removed his tunic and then the crest that rested just above his chest. I stared at the hard muscle of his back and felt a tingling between my legs. His wings were perfect ridged beauties, taut with veins of burgundy and black. His tail flicked from side to side like a caged beast. I wondered if that meant he was nervous. You want me to sleep here tonight? I asked. He glanced at me. Yes. That's all? I half expected him to tell me that I was his bed slave now, but he didn't. He just folded his clothes and put them away. Then he moved towards his windows and sat down in the large bronze chair that had been placed in front of them. I hesitated only a moment, and then I walked over and stood beside him. I know it can be scary, I admitted, but it's so beautiful. It's never been scary to me, Renell said. His voice was barely above a whisper. I hatched on Theron, but the grand infinity before us is my true home. I walked around him and leaned against the window he was staring out of. Don't you ever miss your home planet? I asked, feeling the ache of longing for my own home world. When I do, I can always go back to it, Rennell said. I craned my neck to the side so that I could take in the midnight blue immensity. That must be nice. When I turned back, Rennell's eyes were trained on me. He watched me with a certain odd uncertainty, like he was trying to figure out why I was there in the first place. Did you have a mate? he asked abruptly. On Earth? I raised my eyebrows. I... no, I admitted. I spent my life in service. I didn't have time for love. Rennell nodded. I had a mate once he revealed. A long time ago now. He was offering me a small part of his past. He was pulling back the veil and letting me in of his own free will. I was not fool enough to miss the significance of the moment. What was her name? I asked. His name was Heron, Rennell admitted. What happened to Heron? I asked, slipping to the ground in front of Renell. He died, Renell replied, in a battle against the Pax. There was no inflection in his tone. He didn't look angry or sad. He just looked lost. Then he blinked and snapped himself out of the memory he's embroiled in. Renell? I asked tentatively. Mm. Why did you ask me to your chambers tonight? I asked. I've slept alone for many moons, he replied. I didn't want to sleep alone tonight. I nodded, waiting for him to say something more, but he looked back out into space. Go and sleep, he said. You look tired. He wasn't wrong. I picked myself up off the floor and walked gingerly over to the huge bed in the center of the space. It was perfectly placed. I could see the roaring fireplace spitting out red-orange tendrils of spark. And I could also see Renell sitting in his impressive leather-bound chair. He looked like a strong medieval king out of a fairy tale, 
I lay on the bed and watched him until my eyelids grew so heavy I lost the ability to control them. Sleep washed over me, and I settled into the comforting softness of the feather bed that could have easily held five or six people. Warmth tickled my cheeks and pulled my dreams into my subconscious mind. I dreamt of dragons made of molten gold and humans with wings so big they could wrap around the moon. I dreamt of home. I saw familiar mountains, some snow-capped and others bitingly bare. I saw jungles filled with monkeys and salt streams filled with cod and salmon. I dreamt of New York City and all its glory before the invasion turned to rubble. I dreamt of Earth when it was young and green and hopeful. Most of all, I dreamt of Renell. He was flying through the air with his gorgeous burgundy wings. But he was no dragon. He was a man with wings. He was soaring through planets, and sometimes he took me with him. Static clawed at my ears and made me shift in the comfortable bed. What was that sound? Sound was an unnecessary addition to any dream. So why was I hearing the grating whir of listless noise? What is it? Was that Renell? Yes. That was his voice. I'd recognize it anywhere. Light pricked at my eyelids, but they were still heavy enough that opening them was not an option. There were more noises. More static. Then I heard another voice. Again, this voice was recognizable, but not altogether familiar. Commander Renell. Modoc. Commander, I haven't been able to make contact with the other ships in the fleet, Modoc responded. His tone was hard, reserved, and almost belligerent. I believe part of the fleet is on their way to Grissa as per the commander's plan. What? Renell growled. You should know, Commander, Modoc continued without a pause. I have detected Pax destroyers on my radar. The growl that ripped through the air sent my eyes flashing apart. No, this wasn't a part of any dream. This was Renell, and he was talking to the same dragon that I had first made contact with on the Gignar. Where are they headed? Renell asked. Silence. Modoc! Renell yelled. His ferocious voice bounced off the walls and made my skin erupt in goose flesh. They're coming in hot and fast. They're heading to Theron. Chapter 16 Rennell Theron! I knew it! I fucking knew it! Why did I let those egotistical hatchlings steer me off? My gut had been telling me all along. The Pax had never been interested in Rawl. The planet was too well protected. The Raleigh had made sure of that. But Theron, on the other hand, was a much smaller planet. Draken were strong. But the Pax had the benefit of large numbers, abundant coin, and huge reserves of weapons that had destroyed entire cities. The Hyles reign had long since threatened their ambitions of planetary conquest. We were the only species out there who had a chance at rivaling the Alliance. We were the only ones who could turn into dragons. Alert Theron, I yelled. Immediately. With the majority of the fleet in open space, Theron was laid bare for the sacking. The planet had natural fortifications, large mountains, and harsh wild terrain. But I knew the Pax would be coming prepared. 
They would have been planning this for quite some time. I've tried. Try harder, I growled furiously. How long will it take to get there? A day, Modoc replied, his tone clipped. Maybe two. How far are we from Theron? I asked. At current speed, five solars at least, Modoc replied. I gritted my teeth together with steely resolve. Turn on the light speed engines, I commanded. With a little luck, we'll get there before the packs do. The light speed engines? Modoc stammered. But we might not have the energy reserves to support the light speed engines. The asteroid took out more than half our... Do it anyway, I snarled. Where's Dashiell? Still recovering. Has he gained consciousness? Uh, speak, Draken, I snarled. He is conscious, yes, Modoc replied. His tone was a mix of hesitant weariness, and it made me furious. You were supposed to inform me the moment he regained consciousness, I reminded him. He was very weak. Put Dashiell on the comm system now. I heard a muted gasp on my bed. And I turned to see Yvette staring at me with wide eyes. The sleep had drained from her face and she looked gaunt and frightened. What's happened? She asked as she got out of my bed and moved towards me. I didn't miss the fact that her fingers moved hesitantly towards her left cheek, as though she were reminding herself of something. I just got word from the Gignar, I replied. The Pax Alliance is headed for Theron. Your home planet? Yvette said, her body trembling slightly. Yes, I groaned. I knew it was a faint. Yvette looked slightly confused, and I realized she hadn't been privy to the commander's meeting that had taken place on Dashiell's ship while we were still docked around the mountains of Minneapolis. The comms line with Gignar is still active? She asked. So far, I nodded. There's some static, but I can hear Modoc well enough. As for the rest of the comms system, I can take another look at it, Yvette said quickly. I can see if I can create a direct line to one of the other main ships in the fleet. Tarion ship, I said quickly. And Lahars. I can speak to one of them to make sure they know that Theron is threatened. I'll do my best. She was cut off as the line grunted with static once more. And a moment later, I heard dull breathing on the other end. Dashiell, I called. Renault. Dashiell's voice came in a little grisly, but clear enough. Modoc tells me that the Pax Alliance are on their way to Theron. His information was wrong, I sneered, trying to curb my anger. He's supposed to be in charge of communication between Theron and the fleet. Not to mention our network of spies, and yet... This is not the time, my friend, Dashiell said his tone somber and reserved. We need to think about our next move. We need to hit our light speed engines, I said forcefully. It's the only way to make it to Theron in time. The light speed engines could fry what remains of our power supply, Dashiell pointed out. We need to take that chance, I said recklessly. We can't let the Pax take Theron. Agreed. Dasha replied, but how are you? I asked, unwilling to let Dashiell segue into a diplomatic line of thought. He was ever the peacemaker, and while that proved useful at times, the Pax were not a species that appreciated the art of diplomacy. They liked war, they liked violence, and they thrived on chaos. Peaceful resolutions were not their forte. Renault, will you be able to fight? I asked bluntly. We will need all the able-bodied dragon we can get our hands on. 
especially since we don't know if Tarion and Lahar are aware of what's happening. Their radars will pick up on Pack's movement, Dashiell pointed out, just like Gignar did. Don't you understand? I said, shaking my head at him. What if their sensors are down? What if their comm system is beyond repair? What if someone is blocking our communications with them? I heard a resounding silence on the other line. You think someone is blocking our communication with the rest of the fleet? I paused, wondering if Modok was there and if he was listening. It's only a suspicion at this point. This whole attack? It's been a little too perfectly planned. We cannot solve that mystery right now, Dashiell said quickly. We have to warn the fleet and the border patrollers of Theron. Our direct line with your ship is the only one that's currently working, I responded. The others were badly affected by the black asteroid. My men are still working to repair the other comm lines, but I haven't heard from any of them just yet. We need to hit light speed Dashiell, I said firmly. We cannot risk traveling at our current speed. We will arrive in Theron only after it's too late. I know, Dashiell said, and he sounded weak. I will give the command now. I wished the video channeling were working so that I could see the extent of Dashiell's injuries. I also wanted to see if Modok was still in the vicinity. There was something about the mysterious intelligence officer that I didn't like. As will I, I replied. Contact me if you have any new information. I will. Good luck to you, brother. And you, I replied. A moment later, the static faded away and the comms light blinked off. I turned slowly to Yvette, whose skin was pimpled with tiny bumps, and told me she was either cold or afraid. Is this really happening? she asked. There is going to be a battle soon, I nodded. She shuddered visibly and turned away from me. Her body seemed to get smaller and smaller. I took a step forward and extended my hand out to touch her. I paused. At the last moment, my palm suspended over her shoulder, wondering if I should act on my instincts or not. She shifted on her feet and I dropped my hand. What's wrong? I asked. She looked up at me through her eyelashes. I thought I'd seen my last battle back on Earth. Battles are fought every day up here, I pointed out. She shook her head as though she were trying to dislodge some insidious thought from taking root. Surely this will not be a difficult battle to win, she asked. Your people can turn into dragons. The packs outnumber us ten to one. I replied, without sugarcoating the truth. And they have access to first-grade weaponry. Our weapons are more primitive, mainly because we rely on our shifter forms in battle. But you can breathe fire, Yvette said. Yes, I nodded. We can breathe fire. But it requires effort and energy. We cannot keep a steady stream of fire going. The packs will have educated themselves on our weaknesses. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Maybe I should have another look at your comm system, Yvette said. See if I can do anything more to fix the broken connections. Come with me, I said. We need to get to the control center and see about our progress. We left my chambers and made our way out of the commander's quarters. The ship was quiet. The mood in the air was unusually somber. Yvette walked just behind me, but after a moment, she sped up and moved into step beside me. A slave didn't usually walk side by side with his or her owner, but I allowed it, despite the looks we received from the two draken we passed on our way to the control center. 
Only Bletchgore was in the control center when Yvette and I arrived. He was staring at the monitors and chartering our course through the vast galaxy. I could see from the monitor that his current route would take us to Theron five solars from now. That would be too late. Bletchgore, I said the moment I entered. The orange tint on his white scale seemed to ripple as he stood. His eyes passed over Yvette, but he didn't say a word. Commander, we have a situation on our hands, I revealed. The Pax Alliance are on their way to Theron as we speak. Bletchgore's mouth fell open. I might have laughed in his face if the situation hadn't been so dire. It's true, I confirmed. We need to turn on our lightspeed engines. Bletchgore's eyes went wide. We don't have the capacity. We only need them to work for two solars at the most, I said. By that time, we should be in Theron. Bletchgore didn't even hesitate. He turned towards the control center and pressed in his thumb against the authorization key that opened a large black box that sat towards the side of the main panel. Nestled within the black box was a small red button that was directly linked to the lightspeed engines. One push, and the wyvern would be pushed into lightspeed. Commander! You are cleared for lightspeed activation, I said formally. Bletchgore pressed his hand down hard on the red button, and the ship seemed to purr with new energy. For a second, nothing happened. And then, everything happened all at once. The empty space in front of us seemed to twirl together to form a strange-looking wormhole with pinpricks of light around its edges. Stars seemed to dance momentarily into the swirling whirlpool that faced us, and I felt the ship move into it as though it were being sucked in. I felt a vet lose her balance and slam into me from the back. I grabbed her around the waist and held her close to my chest as we were prepared to jump into the lightspeed tunnel. One, two, three. And we were off. And there was a moment when my head spun and my eyes saw stars with ribbons of crimson running through them. And then the ship settled back into stillness, and I saw that we had made the jump, and the lightspeed engines were functioning at full capacity. Good, I said, feeling only marginally better. We were on our way. Bletchgore, I said. Move aside. Yvette is going to take another look at the comm system. Bletchgore's face darkened immediately. I've been trying through the whole night, Commander. She was able to fix our direct line with Gignar, I pointed out. Bletchgore stepped aside reluctantly, and Yvette moved towards the control panel, gazing at the series of buttons, knobs, and wires like it was a puzzle waiting to be solved. I could tell that she was excited by the prospect of being useful. I could see that her intelligence hadn't been valued up until this point, and she was desperate to put her faculties to use. There was something oddly titillating about watching her work. It almost made me forget that there was a battle on the horizon. One that I wasn't altogether certain we could win. Chapter 17. Yvette I had to work under the direct scrutiny of the white-scaled dragon. His eyes were sharp, his breathing heavy, and his stares seemed designed to trip me up. I reminded myself that I had been under enemy fire more than once in my life. I just needed to keep my head down, power through, and concentrate on the task at hand. The wires that set up the Wyvern's complex comm system were intricate and beautifully arranged. There were red wires that attached to individual ships within the fleet, black wires that connected to the internal comm system on the ship, and blue wires 
that were meant to transmit voice-activated messages directly to Theron. Most of them had been completely destroyed in the asteroid hit. It wasn't plain to see from where I stood, but I knew the comms box that was attached to the head of the ship would be where the main problem lay. Getting to it would require a spacesuit, a lot of oxygen, and a significant amount of knowledge that I was not sure I had. Well, Bletchgore again. And that was how he had been addressing me through the last hour. I turned to him, my eyes rife with impatience. It's a complex disconnect. Bletchgore raised his eyebrows and his large, scaled brow creased into rock-like fragments. Is that so? he asked sarcastically. Imagine that. I gritted my teeth together and turned back to the comm system. I've rewired some of these links, I said. I've got you connected to three more ships in the fleet. I turned to see Bletchgore's face fall slightly. I could see that he was trying to minimize my small victory. Only three? he asked, in a somewhat delayed reaction. It's three more than you managed to fix, I snapped back. The gnarly-looking dragon's eyes snapped to my face, and he pulled himself up to his full height. My instinct was to shrink back, but I refused to let him see my fear. What did you say to me, slave? Bletchgore demanded as he took a threatening step towards me. Enough! I turned to see Rennell standing at the entrance to the control center. Tailing him was the massive draken with black-brown scales. Bletchgore, I left you to supervise, Rennell said impatiently, not harass. All slaves are ours to harass, Bletchgore growled. Rennell moved towards the other draken. He was a few inches taller than Bletchgore, and his shoulders were broader. But it was the expression he wore, a look of such undisputed authority, that I watched as the younger draken shrunk back. I was under the impression the human was my slave, Rennell said in a dangerously low voice. Not yours. His tail flicked insidiously behind him and I wondered what it said about me that excitement bubbled hot and insistent in my chest. Apologies, Commander, Bletchgore said quickly. She was working slow. Good, Renau replied. It means she was being cautious. Any luck rewiring the system? Renell asked as he turned to me. I looked behind me at the wire panel. I've made three new connections, the other wires were too damaged to save. Rennell nodded with satisfaction. Well done, he said to me before turning to his second commanders. Bletchgore, Gormson, send messages out to all three ships. Inform them of the situation and command them to transfer to their lightspeed engines. We're setting course for Theron. Make sure to ask about their comm systems. If they're working, have them contact the rest of the ships in the fleet and make them all aware of our new course of action. Can you handle that? Of course, Bletchgore bristled. Yvette, Rennell said abruptly. Come. I followed Rennell out of the control center, throwing a pointed side glance at Bletchgore. He gritted his teeth, and I could tell he wanted to growl full in my face but Rennell's presence was the only thing preventing him from doing so. I had to suppress my smile as I followed Rennell through the wyvern's neutral interiors to the commander's quarters. We walked inside to the smell of charred meat and strong wine. The trolley had already been brought up, and it sat comfortably by the fireplace. Rennell walked straight to the trolley and tore himself off a large hunk of meat. The broken leg in his hand was so large that it would have taken my two hands to keep it steady. As Rennell opened his mouth to take a bite, I saw the razor-edged glint of his fangs. They gleamed with powerful intensity and reminded me of just how predatory a species the draken really were. 
I watched as he tore at the meat with ease. The red-pink flesh glided apart like butter, and its red-brown juices dripped down Rennell's claws and onto his hand. Eat, Rennell said, glancing over at me absentmindedly. I walked over to the trolley and stood opposite him. Usually, the trolley would have been filled with at least six to eight different choices. There'd be an array of vegetables, different types of meat, breads, and wine, and maybe even a thick, sustaining porridge of some sort. But this trolley had only one large platter of meat that sat next to a tall pitcher of strong wine that had the scent of cinnamon and chocolate. Go on, Rennell encouraged me. One glance at the trolley told me that there were no utensils on hand. I sighed and tore a piece of meat using nothing but my fingers. I realized just how tough the flesh really was. It had melted away like butter, only under Rennell's powerful claws. I lifted the meat up to my mouth and gave it a sniff. Its scent was strong and oaky, and it felt strangy in my hands. I bit into it and tore at it with my teeth, using as much force as possible. It took some effort, but finally the flesh came apart from the bone and filled my mouth with its luscious juices. I stood there chewing as my stomach growled with satisfaction, and meat juices coated the sides of my mouth. I had taken my second bite when I looked up to realize that Rennell was staring at me with amusement. Rennell smiled deep and somewhat, and I realized that something about seeing me eat like a savage was appealing to him. I realized that I was too hungry to worry about being graceful while I ate, so I abandoned my attempts at eating prettily and just dived right back into the hunk of meat in my hands. I tore at the juicy flesh with increased enthusiasm until my hands and wrists were well and truly stained. Wow, I said, realizing how happy my palate was. This meat is just amazing. It's Brynor, Rennell told me. Brynor, I repeated. I don't think I've ever heard the two-headed beast of Kira? Rennell asked. Their meat is tough, but succulent. I nodded. It certainly is, I said, licking my fingers dry. It tastes amazing. I bent down to the second level of the trolley and pulled out the wash basin that had been placed there. It usually accompanied any meal that was particularly messy to eat. I dunked my hands into it and sighed at how comfortingly warm it was. I realized belatedly that I probably should have asked Rennell for permission first. I looked up at him out of the corner of my eye, but he looked calm and unbothered by my presumption. Sorry, I mumbled. I should have let you... I don't need to use it, Rennell said, showing me his clean claws. He hadn't made the mess that I had. Then... Rennell pushed the platter of brinor meat towards me in a gesture of offering, but I shook my head. Thank you, I said fervently, but I've had my fill. Some strong wine, then, Rennell said, pouring me a goblet of wine before I could give him consent. He offered me the glass, and I reached out with my wet fingers and took it willingly. The goblet was heavier than I had anticipated. It was made of thick silver, encrusted with jade stones set in diamond shapes that surrounded the goblet's bowl. I sipped the strong wine and felt its bold flavor punch my tongue. I winced, trying to pick out familiar flavors. I did detect a slight hint of cinnamon, but it was lost beneath the stronger perfume taste that coated my tongue and turned it to fire for a few short seconds. Too strong for you? Rennell asked. I, I've never tasted anything like that before, I admitted. It's made from the sand berries of Nadar Gestolon, Rennell told me. 
Nadarga stolen? I repeated. Where's that? Allegor, Rennell replied. I felt my head spin, and I wondered if that was the wine working, or just the knowledge of how immense the galaxy really was. How do you keep track of it all? I asked. All the planets and the different species that inhabit them. You find a way, Rennell said with a shrug. He finished his own goblet of strong wine in a couple of gulps, and I realized that he was trying to curb his agitation and worry. I don't know what compelled me. Maybe it was the way he kept glancing broodingly towards the fire like he was looking for a solution. Maybe it was the way his eyes seemed to burn with a vicious rage that flamed just beneath the surface. Maybe it was the strength I saw in the tough lines and graceful angles of his face. I found myself standing up and walking around the trolley to Rennell. I lifted my hand, after hesitating only a moment, and placed it gently on his chest. He stared at me with starving eyes, and I realized in that moment what he was starving for. He leaned into me at the same time I bent down to kiss him. It was a soft, tentative kiss. One might even have described it as romantic, but I could taste the suppressed panic in its edges, the burgeoning worry that was born out of helplessness and uncertainty. Rennell needed to be comforted. He needed to be distracted. And I realized that I was more than willing to do both. I felt his one large arm wrap itself around my waist. With one swift pull, he had me on his lap. I adjusted myself on top of him so that I was straddling him, and then I wound my fingers through the brittle darkness of his hair. I felt his body respond beneath mine, and I felt his erection hard against my thigh. Moisture pooled between my legs, and my hand eased down to wrap around his cock. His hands were at my back, and before I knew it, his claws had reduced my slave's garments to shreds. He threw them to the floor, adjusting me slightly so that he could remove his own trousers as he stared at my breasts. He looked, for a moment, like a painter considering his subject. Rather than self-conscious, I felt exhilarated. This was not exactly new territory for me anymore. I had slept with Rennell once before, but this time felt different somehow. There was intentionality to the moment. He wanted me, and I wanted him, and we were both acknowledging as much by succumbing to the carnal desires of our bodies. Rennell lifted me up slightly and pulled me back down on top of his cock. I gasped as he slipped inside of me in one fell swoop. My heartbeat raced higher and higher, and there was a moment when I was actually gasping for breath. He didn't start slow this time. In fact, he fucked me hard, insistently, with a purposeful power that made me realize I would have a hard time walking straight tomorrow. I rode the wave. This was precisely what I wanted. Being a slave had taught me the importance of numbing myself to the world. If you were numb, then everything hurt a little less. But I had also realized that numbness was a poor armor to don. It was flimsy, and it chipped away at the slightest burgeon of hope. I clung to Rennell as his cock slipped in and out of me. I uttered a silent prayer of thanks that I was able to feel this. I felt him growl against my neck, and I sighed, letting my hands run down the scales of his arms. Tough as they were, I enjoyed the feel of them. 
I felt the sharp intensity of Rennell's fangs against my neck, and the thought of him biting me actually sent a shiver of excitement down my spine. As his lips parted against my ear, I felt pressure against my lobe. He was pulling at it with his lips, taking care not to tear off my ear with his teeth. Was the danger part of the excitement of being with someone like Rennell? I didn't spend too much time thinking about it. In all honestly, I didn't really care about the answer. Chapter 18 Rennell She lay naked, cocooned, in the protective circle of my arms. Her flesh was soft and warm. It felt like fine silk against the coarse spikiness of my scales. As I rubbed myself against her, she sighed, uncaring of my body curved around hers. Her eyelashes fluttered softly in sleep, and I found myself reaching out to touch the side of her face. She stirred slightly, but her eyes remained shut. I slipped out of bed and walked over to the floor where my breeches lay. I slipped them on before donning my leathers and crest. The ship was vibrating slightly. It was not something that a vet would have noticed, but the dragon on board certainly would. The ship was not supposed to be vibrating like that. It was a telltale sign that our lightspeed engines were losing steam. If that happened, we were at risk for a crash. And, in our current position, it would mean certain death. Of course, the majority of creatures on board the Wyvern were dragons. We could shift into our dragon forms and save ourselves. But our slaves would be lost to us. I turned to a vet whose hair was strewn about the sheets in a mess of tangled curls. Would I be able to protect her if that happened? The thought clung to my mind and made me lethargic. I shook off the worry and moved to the other side of the room where the internal comms unit was set up. I beeped into the control center, and a second later, I heard low breathing on the other side. Bletchgore? I asked. It's Deverin, Commander. We're approaching Theron. We should be there in 3017 microns. Good, I nodded. And the lightspeed engines, they're holding up? On the heels of that question, the ground vibrated pervasively beneath my feet. I clenched my jaw. Did you feel that? Deverin asked. Yes. Hopefully we can make it to Theron before our engines fry. Deverin said. Otherwise, we'll make it, I said firmly, cutting Deverin off. Inform the crew and slaves of our landing. Any word from the fleet? No, Commander, Deverin replied. As far as we know, Gignar and Wyvern are the only two ships on their way to Theron. Has the royal family been informed? I asked. Modoc assured me the message has been sent, Deverin said. I snarled under my breath. That draken has proved himself to be incompetent thus far, I spat. Let's hope he doesn't prove so again. I will be at the control center shortly, I said, before turning off the internal comms connect. When I turned back to my bed, Yvette was sitting up and watching me wearily. She was still naked and she hadn't bothered to cover herself with the sheets that lay strewn across her legs. There was something extremely titillating about that kind of confidence. As I moved closer, I noticed that there were small bluish-gray bruises that peppered her milky-white skin. You're hurt, I said, leaning forward to touch the bruise on her arm. She looked at it indifferently. It's nothing, she said with a shrug. I've had worse. I don't know why, but I winced. She'd had worse? Why did that make me feel so terrible? Are we close? she asked. 
I nodded. I should go back to the scullery, she said abruptly as she got out of bed and looked around for her slave's garments. She froze when she realized they were heaped on the floor in a pile of tattered shreds. Sorry, I mumbled. That was my doing. Do you have anything I can put on now? I can't walk out of your chambers naked. I'll have one of the slaves bring fresh garments for you, I promised. A vet's eyes went wide. You're going to send a slave up with clothes for me? She repeated. I raised my eyebrows. Is there something wrong? I just, I don't want anyone to see me like this, Havette said, stumbling over her words a little. I cocked my head to the side. Are you ashamed? I asked. She paused, taking stock of my expression, trying to figure out how best to say what she was obviously feeling. Tell me, I said. You are my owner, Yvette said in a soft voice. And I just went to bed with you, willingly. What does that say about me? There it was. I will inform the slave who brings up your new clothes to leave them outside my chambers, I said, trying to keep my tone unaffected. No one will see you. Then I turned and walked out of the room without a backwards glance at Yvette. I heard her call out to me, but I didn't want to hear what she had to say. Did I have a right to be angry? I probably didn't. But the stubborn part of my brain outweighed the logical part of it. I headed straight for the control room, and I found Bletchgore, Deverin, and Gormson all congregated there. They were preparing the ship for landing, and I saw that the red buttons that powered the light speed engines were still ablaze. Once we enter Theron's atmosphere, we need to switch out a light speed, I said. Gormson turned to me with worried eyes. The engines have overheated, he replied. I have a fear that switching to the turbo engines will cause a problem. I gritted my teeth and walked over to the control panel. The vibrations alone were telling me that the ship was in a precarious state and our engines were unstable. What do we do? Devron asked, looking at me for command. I took a deep breath, thankful at least that this latest development would keep my mind off of that. We will wait till we're one micro jump away from Theron's atmosphere, I said. Then we switch off our light speed engines and immediately turn on our landing sonars. Excuse me? Bletchgore asked looking at me as though I had just admitted to joining the Pax Alliance. You want us to switch out of our lightspeed engines only one micro-jump from Theron? Yes. We'll crash, Bletchgore insisted. We'd be traveling at light speed. It's much too late to make the switch. Not if we transition immediately to our landing sonars. It's never been done before. We've never needed to do it before. I countered. We do now if we want to land this ship. If we don't, we run the risk of having our engines blow up. If that happens, there won't be time for anything, including shifting. Gormson and Devron exchanged a glance, and Bletchgore continued to look at me with his mouth hanging open. Does anyone have a better idea? I demanded. We don't have time to decide, Devron said. We're two micro jumps from there and now. We only have a few microns to make a call. I'm giving you the order, I said, putting on my commander's voice. You will do as instructed. Bletchgore looked sick as he turned towards the control panel and prepared for the craziest landing plan I had heard to date. I refused to let myself feel doubt. I had to remain confident in this plan because it was the only hope we had. Coming up, Deverin said as he began a countdown. I felt my heart beat thunderously against my chest, 
and for one briefly insane moment, I wished a vet were here by my side. Now! Bletchgore turned off the lightspeed engines, and the whole ship roared furiously at the change. The floor's vibration snaked up my legs and almost threw me off balance. We were still hurtling down from space so fast that it was making my eyes water. What had I done? This was not a plan. It was suicide. The landing sonars, I yelled. Turn them on! Fletchgore stumbled towards the control panel and turned on the button that activated the landing sonars. I heard the dull whooshing sound of sonars being let off, and a moment later, I realized the vibrations had slowed somewhat. We were still falling fast, but I was hoping the sonars would soften the landing somewhat. I see land, Deverin said, bracing himself against the impact. Me too, Gormson confirmed. I wasn't worried about the land hurtling towards us, however, because my attention had been caught by something in the air. Fuck, I breathed, as I recognized an army of Pax destroyers tunneling their way through to Theron. Our speed far outmatched theirs, and we had passed by a whole legion of destroyers on our way to Theron's soil. Did you see that? Gormson said in a panic. We're going to make it before they do, I said, realizing our increased speed had just propelled us into Theron's atmosphere faster than the Pax destroyers were moving. How many did you count? They are countless, I said my heart sinking with the knowledge that we wouldn't be able to fight them off. What is that? Deverin gasped. What? I think the dragon shield has been activated, Gormson said, squinting into his monitors, one of which was going wild. What do we do? Deverin asked. The shield will prevent us from entering. We have to trust that the guard will see us coming and allow us a pocket hole to get in. I said. They know all our ships. They will recognize this one. All my second commanders looked skeptical, but I knew our guard would not fail me. They were the best of the best, and they would be looking for help in light of the coming assault. Alert the whole ship, I commanded. Everyone needs to brace themselves. We'll be hitting land in mere microns. Gormson made the announcement, and the sound of his voice echoed through the ship like some magnanimous overlord. We're approaching the dragon shield, Deverin said, and I saw his scales grow rigid with tension. I held my breath and watched as the monitor went wild. I braced myself, preparing to come to a sudden stop. But my eyes caught the little refraction of light as the dragon shield was pulled back to allow us to enter Theron. Yes! I exclaimed through gritted teeth. Yes! Immediately after we had passed through the shield, I saw the power of our sonars kick up the dust of Theron's dry, unrelenting earth. I was about to warn my second commanders when we hit the ground with such ferocious intensity, that I was thrown to the side, onto the floor, next to Gormson. I blinked once, wondering if the ship had caved in on us. There was something heavy on top of me, something that was blocking out light and preventing me from rising. Commander? Bletchgore, I grunted, realizing that he was what had landed on top of me. I pushed him off and rose to my feet. I looked around and breathed a sigh of relief. The landing had been a violent one, but the wyvern was still intact. Immediately, I felt a spasm of affection for the old ship that I had once resented. It had succeeded in bringing us to Theron, despite all the odds against us. Open the main hatch, I said, and get everyone off from there, immediately. Yes, Commander. 
my first thought after issuing my orders was Yvette. Where had she been during the landing? Was she safe now? I raced out of the control center only to find that the elevators were jammed. Cursing furiously, I raced through the massive winding tunnels whose ceiling lights had faltered. So much for all the credits I had spent on repairs. It looked like the wyvern would need another serious upgrade after this. I chided myself for getting ahead of the situation. First, I needed to make sure all my crew members and slaves were safe. I heard heavy, running footsteps behind me, and then Deverin caught up with me. The elevators are shut, he said unnecessarily. Open this chute hatch from here. I instructed him, glancing towards the massive oval frame with a giant spoke wheel in the middle. It needed to be cranked, but for a draken, that was an easy enough task. Deverin got to work and I glanced around me. There seemed to be some obvious technical mishaps with the internal lighting because of our severe landing, but the wyvern had mostly stayed intact. I heard a loud groan and the chute door wheezed open at Deverin's push. I heard the chute extend out from the bottom of the wyvern, and I immediately started for the exit. Make sure all the other chutes are deployed as well, I instructed Deverin. I want everyone off this ship immediately. Yes, Commander, Deverin nodded. The chute was a long silver metal runway that extended down from the ship. I sped down, and moments later my feet touched the red-black dirt of my home planet. Usually, I was glad to be back after months of space travel, but today, my heart was beating erratically in my chest, and I could sense muted panic clawing its way to the surface. I could see chute hatches being deployed from around the ship, and I moved in a circle, following the body of the wyvern to make sure everyone was getting out okay. Commander! I turned to see a tall, muscular draken with gold scales dancing along his skin. He was wearing the emerald green and gold onyx of the Royal Draconian Guard. We recognized your ship the last Micron, he said. We very nearly kept the dragon shield in place. It's a good thing you didn't, I said. We risked a lot to get here in time. The draken looked at me with pale silver eyes. Commander, I fear you are too late already. Look to the skies. My eyes moved up wearily, and I felt chills bolt up and down my spine until they had unfurled along my wings. The skies were dark with Pax destroyers. They were tiny, compact ships that might have seated four Draken, but could probably hold up to twelve Pax soldiers. Each destroyer was a steely black but the missiles that clung to the sides of the crafts like fat little wings were a deeper and sinister crimson. Are those? Hellion missiles, the dragon soldier replied. Fuck. Hellion missiles had been known to decimate entire cities, and each Pax destroyer was equipped with two. I tried to count the number of destroyers in the air, but I realized it didn't even matter. There were enough. Commander, the dragon soldier said, turning to me hopelessly. The rest of the fleet? Gignar should be landing shortly, I replied. You will need to open a pocket hole for Commander Dashiell's ship, too. Gignar landed microns after yours did, but what about the rest of the fleet? I closed my eyes for a moment. We're on our own. I said. When I opened my eyes, I saw that the dragon guard looked pale and nauseous. He was younger than I had first realized, and I wondered how many battles he had really seen. In my opinion, you weren't a true dragon until you had seen at least a dozen. What provisions have the royal family made? I asked. He shook his head. Commander, we didn't know what was happening until we were beset by the destroyers. No provisions have been made. No defenses have been prepared. No plan of attack has been decided. I narrowed my eyes. You didn't receive a message from Gignar? 
I asked. From a draken by the name of Modok? No, Commander, the soldier replied, shaking his head. I clenched my jaw as potent rage coursed through my body. Very well, then, I nodded, trying to accept the harsh reality of our situation. We have only one route available to us now. Commander? Prepare the escape pods, I said. We need to evacuate Theron of all those who cannot fight. Draconia has been evacuated, Commander, the young Draken said. The city is empty. Where have the ships gone? I asked. Heilbronn, the Draken replied. Heilbronn is only a temporary respite, I said. Both cities need to be evacuated. You need to leave Theron. Leave? Theron? The young Draken repeated. Look up at our sky, I said, spinning him around and forcing him to look up. They have come to conquer, and conquer they will. We have no chance at winning, but we can at least put up a good enough fight to allow our people to escape. Do you understand, soldier? The Draken nodded, and his pale gold scales seemed to have lost their lustrous beauty. Yes, Commander. Go on, I said. Inform the guard of my orders. He had just turned to leave when I called after him. Soldier, what's your name? I asked. Zabiro, he replied. I nodded. I will remember it. Then I turned swiftly and headed back to the wyvern. Bletchgore and Gormson were standing outside the main chute hatch. I could see a throng of crew members standing alongside panicked slaves who were looking to the skies with undiluted horror. Gignar, I asked, addressing no one in particular. Just landed, Gormson replied. Devon is over there waiting to receive Dashiell. I doubt he's fit to fight, but Modoc, I spat. Where is he? Gormson looked taken aback by my violent tone and bald fists. I, he should be with Dashiell. I nodded and made for Gignar. As I stalked off, I craned my neck back. Find me the human girl, I yelled, uncaring of who heard me. I want to speak with her. I didn't stay long enough to give explanations. I rushed around the wyvern to the open space beyond it where Gignar had landed. I had no time to savor the sweet smell of theory trees that created a vanguard in the distance. I had no time to admire Theron's patchwork red-orange skies. I had no time to appreciate the fierce beauty of the rust-red mountains that formed a backdrop to the expansive forest that a whole host of wildlife called home. Streams of draken and slaves alike were exiting the large ship, I scaled around until I spotted Natalie off by the main chute, surrounded by Dashiell's second commanders. I immediately realized that Modoc wasn't among them. Dashiell, I called as I approached. He was on his feet, but he was leaning against Merrick, his brow already creased with perspiration from the pain of his injuries. My brother, he said the moment he saw me. I was, where is Modoc? I demanded. Dashiell stopped short. He is... he was here. He chose a different exit. Natalie spoke up, her hand flitting to her husband's arm every few seconds. He might be on the other side of the ship. I doubt it, I breathed darkly. Renell, Dashiell asked. I know you don't like Modoc. He never informed Theron of the Pax's imminent attack. I growled furiously. Renell, Dashiell said again. It does not matter now. They are closing in. They could attack at any moment now. The dragon shield is powerful, but it will not hold them off for long. Once they have breached the defense, we need to get all non-fighting creatures up there and immediately, I said, finishing Dashiell's thought. Natalie came up behind Dashiell and put her hand on his shoulder. I could see the gentle swell of her belly underneath the tight black leather she wore. 
It must have still been early, but her clothes could hide nothing about her condition. That includes the two of you, I said firmly. Dashiell ground his teeth together. I can fight, he said. No, Natalie and I both said together. My love, you still need to recover, she insisted. This is one battle you cannot fight. Listen to your wife, I said. I don't have the time to protect you if you insist on fighting today. Do you want to be responsible for my distraction? Conflict raged on Dashiell's face, but I knew his sense would overrule his desires in the end. He had always been the most logical of all the commanders. He dipped his head down in an admission of acceptance, and I saw Natalie's face color with relief. Satisfied that I had extracted something of a promise from Dashiell, I turned toward his second commanders. Ready the escape pods, I told them, and make sure that everyone who cannot fight is on them. What about the slaves, commander? I paused. Natalie's eyes found mine. You cannot ask the slaves to fight for you, she said. I swallowed hard. Evacuate the slaves as well, I nodded. If Dashiell disagreed with my decision, he didn't say so. Dashiell, you need to fly the Gignar to Heilbronn, I said. Make sure everyone in the city gets on a ship. The moment the city has been evacuated, leave. What about you? Dashiell asked. I have to stay here and fight, I replied. Don't wait for me, but... Draconia has been evacuated. Heilbronn needs to be as well. They need commanders, and you are the best of us, I said. Now go. We all have our parts to play. I didn't give Dashiell a chance to respond. I gave both Natalie and he a parting nod, and then headed straight back to the wyvern. Now that my orders had been given, I had only one thing on my mind. Yvette. It felt strange to admit it to myself, but the seriousness of the imminent battle was leaving me no room for denial. I wanted her safe, no matter what. As I turned the corner of the wyvern, I caught a glimpse of her. She was only a puny human among a sea of greater species, and yet she was standing there with fire in her eyes looking up at the sky like she had the power to rain hell down upon the army of destroyers that had come to conquer us. Her dark hair matted around her head and obscured part of her features from view. But she had never looked more beautiful to me. Chapter 19 Yvette I could feel the panic in the air. The atmosphere was rife with the smell of sweat and fear. I got caught up in the throng of slaves as they were ushered from the ship like cattle down one of the descending runway ramps that the drakens referred to as chutes. Halfway down, I got caught up in the crowd, and my legs actually lifted off the ground for a moment as I got stuck between a particularly tall vents and a gray-eyed Norsian. Towards the bottom of the ramp, however, the slaves dispersed, and I fell to the ground with an undignified thump. I was about to dust myself off and pick myself up when I felt a hand on my back, pulling me to my feet. I turned around, expecting to see Ronell, but instead I came face to face with Murat, are you okay? she asked. Her honey-tinted mane was bright in places and spotted in others, as though the cloudy sky was draining out her brightness. I, yes, thank you, I said, deeply touched by her concern. She nodded and looked towards the skies. I think this is the day, she said in a soft whisper. I frowned. What day is that? I asked. The day we die, she said, without taking her eyes off the sky. 
I turned around and followed her gaze. My skin seemed to erupt when I took in the sight that awaited us. I had thought that rain clouds had darkened the skies. But what it actually was, was the force and might of the Pax Alliance's destroyer fleet. I blinked, and suddenly I wasn't in Theron anymore. I was back on Earth. The skyscrapers of New York City stood around me like a concrete wall, allowing me only glimpses of the dapple gray skies behind the hordes of spaceships that hovered over the building's pinnacles. The spaceships had elongated bodies and slim, whip-like wings on either side that made them look like sinister fish perched in the sky. Their bodies were a deep crimson red and their wings were black-tipped with gold. I felt that the very coloring on those ships was a message. They were here to rain blood down upon us. Corporal Long! I turned to see Timothy Mehmet rushing towards me. He was thirty-five years old. He had the ash-blue eyes of his American mother and the heavy features and dark coloring of his Iranian father. He had a wife, Hillary, whose picture he carried around in his uniform, along with a picture of their two-year-old daughter, Verda. They've sent an envoy. They want to meet with the commanding officer in charge, Timothy said. I stopped short. They sent an envoy? Timothy nodded, his eyes wide with terror. He told me that there needn't be any bloodshed today if you only agree to his terms. I gritted my teeth together and looked back at Mitch and Lorna. Mitch was forty-one. He had gone gray by the age of thirty-five, which was around the same time he had lost his wife to cancer, leaving him to raise their two daughters, Nicole and Holly, on his own. Lorna was twenty-nine. She was a pale-faced beauty who had married her partner, Celeste, months before the first alien attack had turned our reality on its head. I have to meet him, I said. Not alone, Mitch said, coming to stand by my side. The whole unit goes with you. I took a deep breath. They might interpret that as a threat, I said. If the aliens have sent an envoy, it means they're interested in negotiating. You can't see him alone, Mitch said immediately. Mitch, Timothy, the two of you will accompany me, I said. Lorna, make sure the rest of the unit is ready. For what? Lorna asked. Her pouting lips were turned down with stress. For anything, I replied. Yvette! I gasped as his massive hand landed on my shoulder. I turned. And just like that, I was back on Theron, and Rennell was by my side. Come with me, he said, grabbing my arm and pulling me past the wyvern. It's not safe here. No place is safe from the Pax, I heard myself say. But my eyes traveled to the almost invisible barrier that seemed to be keeping the spaceships at bay. The Battalion of Destroyers was hovering just behind the pellucid surface, and every time a craft ventured too close, there was a ripple of white energy that seemed to push it back by a few inches. It didn't seem to cause any serious damage to the craft, which meant the shield wall was merely a defensive barrier and had no offensive potential. Then I saw a little burst of fire from the corner of my eye, and I turned to see a small missile being launched at the shield wall from one of the crafts. The spaceships were built for speed. They were small and shaped like little black comets. The only oddity was the fat red missiles that were attached to both sides of each craft. I thought at first that those were the missiles the packs were launching at the shield wall, but it didn't appear to be so. After the first little missile was released, the rest of the destroyer fleet followed suit, and soon 
the whole shield wall was being inundated with fiery little explosions that turned the skies red, orange, and gold. Come, Rennell said, pulling me even harder in the opposite direction. Where are we going? I screamed over the panicked chaos that filled the air. Rennell's hand was so tight around my arm that it was actually starting to hurt. His eyes were darting everywhere, and I knew he wasn't aware of how tightly he was holding on to me. Rennell! I yelled. He stopped short and looked at me with shock. What? You're hurting me, I said, looking down at our entwined hands. He dropped his hand immediately, but his expression remained calculating and remote. His eyes darted up behind me to the legion of enemy ships, waiting to blast through the protective barrier. You can stop them, can't you? I asked. The shield is not going to hold for much longer, Renault replied. They'll keep up the attack long after the wall is down. Surely you have artillery of your own, I asked desperately. Machine guns, weapons, cannons, something. We are dragons, Renell replied, the cold note of pride etching through his tone. Suddenly, the firestorm stopped, and the Pax destroyers seemed to move back slightly. Rennell and I turned to face the skies together. Then, without warning, a loud, amplified voice echoed across the air. Dragons of Theron, the voice boomed. I am Corvin Gull, and I have a gift to offer you. I saw star stands across my eyes. No, I thought. I knew what Corvin Gull's gift was. I had been offered it once before by a different Pax commander with the same intentions. His envoy had stood before me with one unseeing milky eye, whose eyeball danced around the socket of its own volition. Despite his monstrous appearance, he was not the one that held my attention. It was the young human girl standing beside him. Her straight black hair had been pulled back to reveal the rounded beauty of her face. She had large, slanted eyes fanned by thick lashes. She wore a threadbare robe that exposed her shoulders, legs, and one of her breasts. Around her neck, she wore a thick, black collar that looked as though it were choking the life out of her. I am Scavo, the girl spoke translating the alien's words so that my men and I could understand. Her English was heavily accented, but clear and understandable. And I am here on behalf of Commander Zelen to offer you a gift. I knew that thousands of Chinese had been taken by the aliens once the city had fallen. But to see the young girl standing in front of me, with her submissive stance and her head bowed low... It was enough to make me want to kill the envoy right then and there, without even hearing his terms. What gift is that? I spat, unable to keep my tone neutral. The girl spoke to the alien. Her mouth moved in unfamiliar clicks and rolls that I couldn't fathom. How was it possible that she could act as a translator for an alien who had only captured her months before? The girl turned back to me. Her eyes refused to meet mine as she spoke with the alien's voice. The gift of life, the girl spoke. If you stand down now, surrender your city to our forces and submit to our rule, you will be allowed to leave. This is your decision to make as the commander of the city. If you choose to turn down this generous offer... We will kill every last man and woman in your crew, and take you as a slave. My blood boiled as she spoke, but I turned my eyes to the vicious creature standing just behind her. 
He was smirking at me with calculating rigor, and it was all I could do not to open fire at that very moment. Tell the giant rodent behind you that it doesn't work like that, I said, forcing myself to remain calm. I am responsible for protecting the city, but we have governments who make those kinds of decisions. I am not in charge here. The collared girl turned back to her master and related to him what I had just said. He looked amused as he started talking. I saw her cheeks flush just before she turned back to me. They said the same in China, the girl said, her body shaking slightly. We do not care for governments. We respect only commanders. You are in command of the city, and therefore you have the choice. Choose wisely, or you and your crew will suffer the same fate as those in the slave's wretched city. My hand fell to the gun on my right hip, but Mitch's hand shot out fast and steadied my hand. My eyes fell to the line of aliens that stood about twenty feet from us. Each was equipped with a massive contraption that revealed the shiny steel of unfamiliar bullets. We will give you time to think over your decision, the girl said with finality. Scarvo licked his lips before he turned from me to join his army. I stood there, in my crumbling city, still clinging to the faint illusion of hope. We had already lost, but I hadn't yet known it. Rennell growled furiously under his breath, and my memory shattered. Surrender to us now. Give us ownership of your lost planet. Give us dominion over your bodies. Serve us as loyal slaves, and we will let you live. Refuse, and you will all die screaming for collars. Theron seemed to go soft with silence for a split second. Then the air burst with roars, bellows, and howls of rage. For a species as proud and ancient as the Dracons of Theron, I knew it was the ultimate insult. I realized now how much the Pax wanted to enslave the Dracons. If they succeeded, not only would they have supreme military and firepower, they would also have dragons who were theirs to command. They would become invincible. Make your decision, dragons of Theron, the amplified voice screamed through the skies. You have only till your dragon shield falls. A second after he had stopped speaking, the onslaught of smaller missiles pelted the shield from every direction. Once again, the sky was alight with the colors of a bleeding sunrise. Commander Rennell! someone screamed. I turned to see Gormson standing a few feet away from us. The shield! He didn't have to point it out to us. I could see the fissures start to form in the shield's translucent facade. Theron was in chaos. Ships were everywhere. Some with the hatches still down. Slaves were running amuck, and the able-bodied dragons were moving towards the forefront. Their bodies undergoing a change I didn't quite understand. Take cover, Rennell said, pushing me back behind a massive burnt gray boulder that smelled of earth. Stay down and don't engage with anyone or anything. Do you understand me? I nodded, even though I barely heard a word he had just said. When you see a clear path, run as far away from the battleground as possible. But do not argue with me, Rennell yelled, guttural and animalistic. It felt as though his voice had been amplified a dozen times over. I cringed back and took cover behind the massive boulder. I stuck my head out, looking for a clear pathway out of the line of fire. But my eyes caught Rennell and my breath caught. He was transforming. He was shifting into his dragon form. 
and for some reason, the bedlam of the fight seemed to fade into the background as I concentrated on his change. His body seemed to be morphing. I saw his legs bulge with muscle, and his arms followed suit. His clothes ripped apart, but the body beneath them was no longer that of a man. Rennell's body burst from something that resembled a human male into a fully-fledged beast with powerful legs that would have cast me in shadow, and massive wings that could have wrapped around the circumference of the wyvern. The humanness of his face transformed into the reptilian terror of a large snout that was spiked with sinister-looking spurs. He let out a roar, and I saw hot smoke rise out of his mouth from between his protruding teeth. His burgundy scales glistened with subtle power, and I could see a series of tiny spikes that covered each scale. I had to crane my neck upwards as Rennell leaned back on his powerful hind legs and let out an earth-shattering roar that seemed to make the skies shiver. Civilians and slaves scattered like pebbles in the wind until only the dragons remained. They filled the landscape with their immensity, with scales of copper and jade, bronze and magenta, rust red and pearl gray, obsidian and teal green. They were terrifying creatures, but I could not think of any other species that commanded that kind of raw and untamed beauty. Slaves ran past me, kicking the deep red-brown earth of Theron into my eyes. I heard someone shout to me to move, but I couldn't seem to make my legs cooperate. My eyes were transfixed on the scene before me, and it was only then that I realized I was on a new planet whose beauty I had not yet had a chance to admire. Theron was as wildly beautiful and as tempestuously raw as its inhabitants. I saw rugged mountain ranges off in the distance with more peaks than I could count, and steep ledges that were different colors of gold and red. Some mountains were bare, while others had patches of deep purples and pale blues, as though they had been laid with mossy carpets. The land we were currently standing on seemed to stretch out for miles with no discernible forest or jungle that I could see. It was just flat, bare land that tapered off into little hills that seemed to climb into the mountains that I could see from every angle. I thought I spotted the clear blue of a river or stream, but my attention was split between Theron's natural beauty and the small army of dragons that were amassing before me. The Pax's small missiles were still hitting the dragon shield wall with full force. The fissures that whipped through the shield had now turned into noticeable cracks that pinged with electricity. And then I heard it. A whiplash tear that felt like an earthquake. It screamed across the dragon shield, and just like that, the translucent barrier that had been keeping the Pax army at bay dissolved into nothing. There was a second of shock as everyone realized that the dragon shield had been disabled. All at once, the air was filled with the war cries of dragons. My eyes were trained on Renault, and I saw him flap his great wings and kick off the ground with his powerful back legs. He kicked up such a flurry of dust that I felt as though a sandstorm was headed my way. I ducked for cover behind my rock, but I was still showered with a spell of golden dust. I shook the dirt and grime from my eyes and peeked from around the boulder. Rennell was flying up through the air, straight for a line of Pax destroyers. I could pick out his roar amongst all the others, and I uttered a silent prayer that he would be all right. A breath of heat engulfed me and I realized that a few dragons were unleashing their toxic breath upon the fleet. 
torrents of fire zoomed through the air like a crimson orange avalanche, and I felt sweat pepper my brow. The dragons attacked the Pax fleet in a storm of gnashing teeth and bursts of fire. The fleet scattered immediately, and I watched as ships zigzagged up, down, and sideways in an attempt to avoid the dragon's merciless attack. I saw several ships go up in flames, and soon after, their bodies zoomed to the ground in undignified clumps of fire-ravaged metal. As I squinted at the wreckage in the sky, a glint caught my eye, followed by the sharp muzzle of a ship. Was it possible that some of the Hyles Rain fleet had received Rennell's message and made it to Theron in time to join the battle? I watched with bated breath as two spaceships broke through Theron's atmosphere and hurtled towards the battle. I saw their cannons draw forward from the underbelly of the ships, and then the blasting started. I gasped, realizing that if the fight moved any closer, I would be hit with serious debris from fallen Pax destroyers and Hiles rain ships alike. I looked back over my shoulder and realized there was another rocky outcrop, a collection of smaller boulders that had formed a somewhat granite-like display that provided both coverage and a decent amount of protection. If I started running now, I might be able to make it there before something deadly speared me in the chest. I searched the skies first, trying to pinpoint Rennell's location. He was somewhere directly in front of me, battling a horde of Pax destroyers that were bending and weaving, trying to avoid his huge wings and the bursts of fire that sprouted from his open jaws. I was starting to realize that the dragons couldn't sustain their fire breaths for longer than a few seconds. I couldn't see the Hyles Rain ships any longer. It looked like they had disappeared altogether, and I was struck with the sudden fear that they had been thrown from the skies and crashed somewhere in the vicinity. But then I saw two huge dragons join the fight and I realized that the ships had probably landed nearby so that the dragon aboard could shift and join the fight. A salient piece of shrapnel smashed into the ground next to me, and I gasped and fell back against the dry dirt. Realizing that my life depended on it, I abandoned the minimal coverage of the boulder I was hiding behind and ran for the granite crop of stones off in the distance. Every now and again, I couldn't help but risk a glance over my shoulder to see how the battle was progressing. It seemed like the Draken were winning. Their sheer size and immensity were enough to knock a dozen destroyers out of the sky. I felt my panic ebb slightly, and that allowed me to run a little faster. I was almost at the granite outcrop when an ear splitting blast echoed through the air, and I was flung forward, propelled by the blast. I thought I hit something, but my head was spinning. Get up, human, the voice said with contempt. Are you completely mad? I knew that voice. I looked up and saw a beautiful face with light eyes that were bright with annoyance. It was the oddest thing, though. The person looking down on me had a mane. Get up, you vet. She knew my name. Huh. That was odd, too. I tried to stand, but my legs felt like jelly. I was suddenly aware of a sharp pain in my side. Was I bleeding? I touched my hand to the side of my stomach. No, everything seemed all right. It seemed I was in one place. Yvette! Bring her in here, another voice said. I blinked, and my vision seemed to filter into the right perspective. What's happening? I wanted to ask, but the words were slow to my tongue. Where am I? 
I closed my eyes. Someone's voice was tunneling its way to the surface. No, I didn't want to hear that voice. It had haunted my dreams for too long now. His voice was high and reedy and filled with raucous delight. He spat sounds at me, but I couldn't understand any of it. Then I saw him gesture to someone to my side. Another alien walked forward. The creature had the body of a large rat. Its red eyes followed me with a violent lust. In its hands, it carried a thick black collar. No! I screamed. No! Two more aliens grabbed my hands and held me in place while the collar was fastened around my neck. I felt something click together, and then the weight settled around me, heavy and foreboding. There we go! His voice permeated through my brain. Much better! I gasped. How can I understand you? The colors are fitted with a translator chip, the commanding alien said as he came forward. Convenient, don't you think? Remove it, I screamed. Do you know who I am? The alien asked pleasantly. I don't care, I said, thrashing around despite the sharp, pincer-like claws that held my hands down. Oh, but you will, he said, smiling deeply. I am Zelen. I offered you a gift that you refused. I felt my breath catch. We will destroy you. Every person in my unit is worth ten from yours. Zelen threw his head back and laughed with glee. The fight is over, silly human, he said. You fought and lost. No, I said, shaking my head, refusing to accept his words. I remembered being in the thick of battle. The blasts were still echoing in my ears. And then... Something happened. An explosion so big it made the world go black. When I'd woken up, I'd found myself in a dank, tented area, surrounded by those filthy vermin. I gave you a choice, Zelen continued, as though he were disappointed in me. I told you what would happen if you chose to fight instead of submit. You could have saved your men. You could have saved them all. Better to live as slaves than die as free men. No, I said. Zelen walked towards me. He was smiling, but his red eyes were cold. His clawed paw slashed across the air like a whip and struck the side of my face. I would have keeled over if I weren't being held in place by two of his minions. Come, Zelen said. It is time to show her the cost of her decision. Bring her. The flaps of the tent were thrown open, and I was dragged into the glaring sun. New York City was in shambles. I could hardly recognize it. The Empire State Building was nothing more than a mass of rubble. I might have cried to see it as it was, but my eyes fell on the line of bodies that had been displayed neatly in front of me. My mouth opened in a wail of anguish, but no sound came out. No sound was deep enough painful enough, heart-wrenching enough to do justice to what my eyes had to suffer. I stared at the dirt-stained faces of every man and woman in my unit. Their eyes were trained on the sky above, unseeing and devoid of life. Now, tell me, Zelen said, whispering into my ear like a lover. 
What was her name? Lorna, I whispered. Zellin laughed. And his? Mitch. And his? Timothy. Zellin took me down the line until I had been forced to say every single person's name out loud. I could sense the bloodlust in the air. The aliens were watching reality television, and they loved it. Excellent, Zellin said when I had finished. Now, you see the cost of the choice you made, don't you? I nodded. Yes. You killed the men and women who trusted you and followed you. Yes. In our world, you would be considered a bad omen, a sign of ill fate, Zillin continued. I think you should have a memento to remember this day. I will always remember this day, I said in defeat. Yes, you will, Zillin agreed. But I am generous. You refused my first gift, but I wonder, will you refuse my second? I felt my heart thud fearfully in my chest. Please, do you want my second gift, human? Zellin asked. I wanted to scream. I wanted to kill him. I wanted to run. But I was powerless. The line of bodies in front of me told me so. They were staring at me, accusing me of destroying their lives, their families. Zellin was right. I was a bad commander. I was a bad omen. Yes, I nodded. I want your second gift. Good human! Zellin nodded. Scarvo, bring me the Tetris ink. We have some carving to do. Someone's hand was reaching out for me. I batted it away. I didn't want to be touched. Her eyes are open. What's wrong with her? Someone asked. Were my eyes open? That was odd. I blinked. Once. Twice, a third time. Shapes started to form, and like a floating puzzle, the pieces started to fit together. First, I saw Marat and her gorgeous mane. Then, I saw a human woman whose name just eluded my tongue. Yvette, the woman asked, are you okay? Can you hear me? There was ringing in my ears, but I could hear her. I nodded, grateful to be out of the nightmare. I looked around and realized we were in a cave of sorts. The granite stone that surrounded us was shiny, and shadows reflected off one another to give us light. I noticed the opening of the cave a few feet away. I had been running here when something had happened. An explosion? I made to move towards the opening, but the human woman reached out and held me in place. It's not safe, she said. Who was she? Why did I think of the scullery when I looked at her? Why did her face make me angry? Carissa? I asked. Yes, she nodded. But how? We got Rennell's message late. We were setting course for Nort, Carissa said. We wanted to recuperate there. Our ship had taken significant damage in the asteroid blast, but we changed course the moment we got the emergency signal from Theron. I remembered the two Hiles Rain spaceships that had emerged during the thick of the battle. I want to see what's happening, I said. It won't make you feel better, Carissa said, looking at me in an odd way. 
I frowned. What do you mean? I asked. Yvette, she said softly. Muted pain filtering in through her facade of strength. We're losing. Chapter 20 Renell. I felt the heaviness of my body lag as my powerful wings started to feel the burn of fatigue. Fire breathing was draining, and while the heat of a hundred dragon fires blushed against my scales and spurred me on, it did nothing to replenish my stamina. As our small army of dragons amassed in the sky, it was clear that we all had one goal. Destroy as many pack ships as we could manage, and turn their hellion missiles to rubble. If we succeeded in that, we had a chance. Except that for every Pax destroyer we tore to shreds, another five seemed to emerge from the red smoke that tainted the skies. I looked down and saw the fallen debris of our battle. It had already destroyed a good portion of our land, but at least it hadn't touched Theron's inner circle. I could see over the large mountain range that circled Theron's great royal city of Draconia. It was probably the largest city in the galaxy nestled into a dangerous outcrop of mountain. Even from my vantage point, I couldn't see the city. Sharp edges and cavernous precipices expertly hid homes from view. As three Pax destroyers zoomed towards me, I forced a spiral that turned my wings into weapons. I struck two of the three ships, and they flailed through the sky like toys. One hit another Pax destroyer and both screamed to the ground, while the second disappeared into a thick plume of orange smoke that had started on the ground and had risen so high that it had created a fog of mist it was starting to blur my vision. I realized that the battle had spread as far as the Thorin Mountains. I felt panic grip my body as I realized that, in the thick of this particularly fierce battle, it would take very little to ignite Mount Krato, the volcano that sat in the center of the small range, nestled between two dormant volcanoes that had died centuries ago. I heard a roar that seemed to shake the sky, and I whipped around just in time to see a silver-gray dragon with dark markings around the snout and legs go down, struck by a hellion missile. The missiles were powerful offensive weapons, and it seemed even Dragonhide could not withstand their dynamic force. My hope died right there in the sky. Our size, strength, and firepower were immense, but not compared with the sheer number of the pack's force. As more pack's destroyers soared towards me, I let loose a powerful surge of fire breath, taking down at least three of the five spacecrafts. Feeling a dull sense of satisfaction, I flew back down to the ground. I hated turning my back on the fight, but it was time to be sensible instead of brave. I landed next to the wyvern, realizing that the complete left side of the spacecraft had been obliterated by one of the Hellion missiles. I could see the ugly crimson of its fat bulk sitting innocently by the sides of my hangar. My transformation back into my human form was quick. I raced up an open hatch and turned the corner where the emergency supplies were stored. Everything seemed to be intact as I pulled the lever that released the lock. I pulled out some clothes and light armor and dressed quickly. I was racing back down the hatch when I saw both Tarion and Lahar hit the ground in their dragon forms. I signaled to them, but neither one saw me in the confusion of smoke, fire, and debris. Abandoning my attempts to get their attention, I raced around the remains of my ship and ran towards the protective boulder colonies in the distance. It would provide the perfect protective hiding place for anyone wishing to avoid the thick of battle, and 
and I was fairly certain I would find a throng of civilians gathered together under the granite formations. Before I had even reached the formation, I saw a vet emerge from under one of the boulder's protruding edges. She stumbled in the rust-gold sand and fell to her knees. I saw Carissa walk out after her and attempt to help her to her feet, but a vet brushed off Carissa's hand and made straight for me. What are you doing? I growled. I told you to take cover. Is it true? The vet asked, her hand moving toward her cheek. Are we losing? We. Oui. It seemed an insignificant thing to focus on in the moment, but the word stood out and gave my pain a thin edge of joy. Yes, I said without hesitation. Carissa grabbed my hand in sudden panic. Tarion, she gasped. Where is he? Is he still fighting? I saw him land just before I got here, I told her. I think he and Lahar both know that we can't win this. There's too many of them, and their hellion missiles match our fire breath. This can't be happening, Carissa said in desperation. We are the Hiles Reign. We don't lose battles. What are we going to do? Yvette asked. I need to get you all out, I said, looking over Yvette and Carissa's heads at the small collection of slaves and civilians that were looking out from under the granite formation at me. The escape pods by the mountain base, Carissa said immediately. Is it safe enough to reach them? We have no choice, I replied. We need to get all of you on them now. They will be evacuating in Heilbrunn, Carissa said. There should be enough heavy-duty ships to carry all of us out of Theron. Good, I nodded. Let's go. Come, I will lead you to the pods, Carissa said, turning to the motley collection of creatures behind her. Her tone changed instantly. She sounded more like a commander in her own right, and less like a frightened wife and mother. The children, I asked quickly, realizing I couldn't see any of the hatchlings. We evacuated all of them at the beginning of the battle. We landed the spaceship long enough for Tarion, his men, and I to get off before sending it on to Heilbrunn, Carissa explained glancing over her shoulder at the royal peak behind which sat the ancient city of Draconia. In that moment, I couldn't help but admire her. She had chosen to follow her husband out into open battleground, even though she could contribute little to the fight. She was a warrior, as much a dragon as any one of us. She lacked the tools, but her spirit was fire. There should be enough escape pods to get you all out. I said. Quickly! I don't know how much time we... Before I could finish my sentence, another explosion sounded off in the near distance. I turned and saw a mirage of gray smoke race towards the skies in the general vicinity of the Thorin Mountains. A moment later, I heard a deep rumbling noise that made the earth feel like it was shaking beneath my feet. What is that? Yvette asked as she stumbled into me. That was when I realized that the earth actually was shaking beneath my feet. It seemed as though the Pax Destroyers had succeeded in activating Mount Crato. What are you doing? A familiar voice screamed. I turned to see Lahar and Tarion race towards us. Both had the look of defeat about them and that was harder to take than my own disappointment. If Tarion had abandoned the skies, that meant there really was no hope. What are you still doing here? Tarion screamed at his wife. You were supposed to be in Heilbronn by now. Come on, I said, grabbing Yvette's hand and pulling her towards Mount Royal's base. She tripped twice, before I abandoned my attempts to pull her along behind me. I grabbed her around the waist and hoisted her into my arms. Then I started to run at full speed. She gasped against the hot wind that whipped at our faces, but I didn't slow down. I needed to get her off our dying planet before it was too late. Within microns, we were at the base of the mountain. 
The stone there was craggy and formed hollowed and caves that had allowed us to place our skate pods inside. Each pod could take at least three to five creatures, depending on size. But since the whole mountain base contained a series of pods set about ten feet from one another, I had no doubt we could get everyone out. I set a vet down and picked an escape pod quickly. They were oblong in shape and covered over with glass shield roofs, from which you had an excellent vantage point of the world as you escaped it. There was a simple set of controls at the head of the pod, and a small navigation system built into the mechanism of the tiny craft. I had no doubt that a vet would be able to figure it out. I pressed the button on the side of the escape pod and heard a whooshing noise as the glass parted from the side to reveal a doorway into the pod. Get in, I said, turning to her. She just stood there, blinking at me. What are you doing? I growled. I said, get in. The vet looked to her left and right. Slaves and civilians alike were jumping into pods, sometimes two at a time. I could hear the familiar whooshing sound of the glass as it parted from the slick base of the pods. Yvette, I said slowly, adjusting the location on the navigation system that was set at the front of the pod. Listen to me. Fly this pod over the mountain range and keep traveling north until you hit Mount Helbrun. The cities of Theron will be evacuating. Get on a ship there and get off the planet. Are you coming with me? Yvette asked, turning back to me. I frowned. Of course not. I said without hesitation. You said we were losing, Yvette countered. You said the battle was lost, so why, Draken, do not run, I snarled. What do you take me for? I took you for a smart man, Yvette screamed back at me. Her eyes were bright with fury, but I knew the fury she was projecting on me was a defense mechanism she needed to hide her fear. I thought you had sense. If you stay here, you will die. I am not leaving my home. This is not your home, Yvette reminded me. This is the land you were born in. Space is your home. You are a pirate. I am a pirate second, I countered. First and foremost, I am a dragon of Theron. You will be a dead dragon of Theron if you don't come with me. I heard the sharp drum of engines, and I realized that the escape pods were taking flight. I turned in time to see at least seven zoom straight up in the air before clearing the mountain range. Time was running out, and my frustration increased tenfold. I grabbed a vet by the arm and pulled her violently towards me. She knocked into my chest, and I saw her wince. I didn't hesitate, however. I wound my hand around her neck, searching for the button at the base of her collar. What are you doing? Yvette gasped, struggling to extricate my hand from around her neck. Ranel! I heard Tarion scream at me. What are you doing? Hurry up and get that girl on the fucking pod! Two Norsian slaves rushed forward and jumped into the escape pod that I had been trying to convince Yvette to board. Let go of me! Yvette said, panting heavily. I found the clasp and hooked claw into it. If I pushed hard enough, I could break the mechanism that held it in place and remove it from around Yvette's neck. What are you doing? Yvette gasped. I'm trying to give you your freedom, I said. No! She screamed, putting both her hands on my chest as she pushed me back. I frowned eternally perplexed by this strange human who couldn't wait to cast off her shackles one micron, and the next was ready to risk her life to stay behind on a falling planet. You don't want to be free? If you remove my collar, I won't be wearing a translation chip, that said. I won't be able to understand you, or anyone for that matter. She was right, I realized. She would need to be fitted with a less cumbersome translator before her collar was removed. But there was no time for any of that now. Fine, 
I will record a message that will give you your freedom. The glass door to the escape pod closed, and I realized that the two Norshan slaves were not about to sit around and wait for me to convince you that. Their pod shimmied away from the mountain's edge, forcing Yvette and I to move back. I glanced around the mountain, grabbed Yvette's hand, and pulled her down the range. There should be some more pods. No! Yvette screamed as she ripped her hand from my grasp. My claws scraped against her soft flesh, and I saw thin streaks of blood ripple to the surface across her wrist. Yvette didn't even seem to notice. Furious, I roared full in her face, but she stood her ground and didn't so much as blink. I'm not scared of you, she yelled back at me. Not anymore. That was my doing, and I knew it. I had removed that necessary barrier between us the one that needed to stay intact in order to exert any amount of control over another creature. I had torn it down the moment I decided to take her into my bed. You are a fool, I hissed, vaguely aware of several explosions happening a distance away. And you are... Her last word was lost in the earth-shattering eruption that wrenched through the air and filled my nostrils with the sharp, acrid scent of lava. Yvette was pushed back, and I managed to grab a hold of her just in time. Even I found it hard to stay on my feet as a barrage of wind and dirt hurled itself at us with merciless abandon. Oh my god, I heard Yvette whisper against my chest. What's happening? It's over, I replied. Mount Crado is erupting. Chapter 21 Yvette A part of me had always known I would die in a war zone. I had resigned myself to that knowledge the moment I had chosen a life in the armed forces. I had been 19 years old, and the decision had tunneled its way to the surface like a long-repressed memory. Once my desire had worked its way into my conscious mind, it seemed like the most natural, most logical decision in the world. Of course I would serve my country. My father and grandfather had both served, and I had always listened to their war stories with an entitled pride. But it was more than just service. I wanted to live an extraordinary life. The volcano will take out everything. Tarion said as he rushed towards us. We have to get off Theron. We can't just leave, Lahar said, glancing around at the wreckage of his home world. This is our home. If you stay, you will all die, I said fiercely. What good will you be to your people then? Theron can't afford to lose three commanders. You need to evacuate the rest of your people. She's right, Tarion nodded. We have to go. I glanced up and saw Rennell's ashen face. His eyes were hooded with loss, and I realized he was already saying goodbye to Theron. I wanted to reach out to him, but now was not the time. The three large dragons stood around in a loose semicircle. I stood slightly apart from them. Not quite in the inner circle, but not outside it either. This can't be happening, Lahar said. His features were distorted with denial. We are dragons of the Hyle's reign. We cannot flee our own planet. I watched as Renell looked between his two fellow commanders. I saw the conflict in his eyes. It was not in his nature to run away. I recognized that immediately. But he was also logical, sensible, and mature enough to see that there was no other way. I reached out and grabbed his hand. His eyes flickered down to our connected limbs. Please, Renell, I said. I know this isn't easy. Nothing about war is easy. Whether you win or you lose, there are always casualties, and there are always hard choices to be made. 
You think it was easy for me to see the dead faces of all the men and women in my unit? They died because of me. I have to live with that choice every single day. I couldn't save my people. But you have a chance to save yours. Your planet may be lost, but your people are not. Don't you think the packs will hunt them down pod by pod? How will they survive without you to protect them? I could see my words start to make an impact. Lars' features clouded momentarily, and he sighed with resignation. Tarion looked at me as though he were seeing me for the first time. We have to go, Tarion said at last. Yes, Rennell agreed, and I breathed an internal sigh of relief. Lahar and I will take this pod, Tarion said, pointing to the pod directly in front of us. The two of you take the pod to the right. We need to get up in the air before the eruption reaches us. I looked back and saw spitting orange lava, molten and rootless, erupt from the mountain's fissures. It bubbled to the top and gushed over the mountain's gaping mouth in thick, fluid waves. Having successfully accomplished their goal, the Pax Destroyer seemed to fly higher up into the sky. But I realized it was because of the volcano's violent spitting. Thick chunks of molten rock were being flung from the volcano's opening with deadly purpose. The lava was moving fast, and I realized that it wouldn't take that long to reach us if we stayed on the ground. Riddell grabbed my arm again and pushed me into an empty pod. It was only then that I realized that Lahar and Tarion were in their pod and it was already pushing off the ground, creating a wealth of steam that was catapulting them into the air. Rennell followed me inside the pod and pushed a button to seal off the door. The moment the glass shut in on us, the pod started to vibrate slowly until it became an incessant gyration that had my teeth chattering rapidly. Thankfully, once we had lifted off, the vibration slowed to an easy tempo, and the craft seemed to relax immediately. I could feel the power of our takeoff as we climbed higher and higher in the air. Rennell steered the ship, whose controls were straightforward and user-friendly. I had the mechanisms figured out within minutes— but my main focus was on the surrounding land. The volcanic eruption had sent hot lava flowing down to the base of the mountain. Now it was creeping through the land and swallowing everything in its path. Just when I thought it was done, more lava spewed from its mouth, and fiery orange tongues seemed to whip out everywhere. I couldn't feel the heat from inside the pod, but I could sense it somehow, and it made my skin tingle with discomfort. I wondered if Rennell felt heat in the same way I did. The mountains seemed to rejoice in the eruption. They stood proud and tall, mammoth pillars that had been standing since the dawn of time and would go on standing, even after the rest of us had crumbled to dust. The same could not be said for the rest of Theron, however— I watched with gut-wrenching sadness as lava ate up everything in its path, including two ships that had been damaged in the pack's attack. I was supposed to be in my seat, but I abandoned it in order to stand by Rennell's side. My vantage point gave me a unique perspective of the war zone. Theron's beauty was in its wild mountains, rough terrain, and primitive nature— but all that was gone now, extinguished by the Pax's brutal attack. The sky was filled with red smoke that seemed to weave and bend as we flew through the clouds. I wondered how Rennell could navigate, and I realized his eyesight was probably a lot better than mine. Rennell was steering our pod away from the volcano and the small army of Pax destroyers. I felt his muscles tense under the rough leather of the worn tunic he wore. His wings were folded neatly against his back, 
but they flinched every time a sound echoed in the distance. His tail swung from side to side in an ever-increasing tempo that reminded me of manic pacing. Tentatively, I put my hand on Rennell's shoulder. I prayed he wouldn't push me away, because I needed this as much as he did. He stiffened under my touch, but he didn't push me away. Smoke rose into the sky in large tendrils, and I closed my eyes, trying to keep the suffocating memories at bay. Look upon your city, you men, Zellin said with childish glee. This is what you chose. I stood there, staring at broken buildings, bodies, and the unseeing eyes of the dead. The fresh scar on my face was bleeding heavily, but I was actually grateful for the searing pain. I didn't want this. Zellin's hand swung forward and smacked me across the face. It was lighter than I expected, a slap meant to insult rather than hurt. Zellin was reminding me of my new status among his minions. If you had accepted my gift, Zellin continued pleasantly, as though we were simply finishing a spirited conversation, then we would not be in this situation. The collar around my neck made it possible for me to understand his words perfectly, but its weight was too much to bear. Where are you taking me? I asked as the Pax guard pushing me forward walked me right up to a massive spacecraft, the likes of which I'd never seen before. Wherever I please, Zellin replied. You are a slave now. You no longer have the right to make decisions. You are nothing more than an object now. Your only purpose is to do the bidding of the beast that owns you. Do you understand? I gritted my teeth together, hoping that would keep the fear from my face. I will never be anyone's slave, I said with certainty. I will escape. I will get away from here, and then I will find my way back to Earth. I will warn them about, you will never see your home again. Zellin said in an almost gentle tone. Say goodbye to Earth. It is lost to you now. I watched Theron burn from the safety of our escape pod. But I was really seeing Earth as I had left it. A violated planet that would never be the same again. I wondered if Earth had recovered. The Pax had infiltrated many cities and taken many slaves, but there were still places that were oblivious to what had really happened. It was denial at its finest, but I took comfort in the fact that I knew Earth continued to exist. But Theron... I squeezed Rennell's shoulder. I watched my city burn, I told him softly. I saw my friends die. At least you were spared the latter. Rennell's voice came out in a soft yet urgent growl. They will pay for this, he swore. I swear it by all the stars in the galaxy. The Pax Alliance will rue the day they ever decided to launch an attack on the home of the Hyle's reign. I wanted to caution him but the injustices in my own life made me cry out in support of his words. The packs were a scourge, and they needed to be taken down. And if anyone could do it, it was the Hyle's reign. Chapter 22 Renell. The pod zoomed through the air effortlessly weaving past the plumes of murky fog that seemed to be following us everywhere. The escape pods had been designed to be command-sensitive, so they were both easy to fly and fast to react. The smell of fire hung heavy in the air. I could sense it, even through the pod's protective encasing. That stood by my side, 
her hand pressed against my shoulder. She applied pressure every time we heard another bubbling explosion off in the distance. For the first time since we had met, I was able to relate to her. She may not have seen her whole planet turn to dust and ash, but she had been wrenched from her home planet after a terrible defeat. There was something incredibly lonely in that knowledge. As we passed over the range of Mount Royal, I saw the peaks and battlements of the old stone castle that had been erected over a thousand years ago. The red flag had been hoisted up on the tallest battlement, and it sat there and waved at me sadly. The royal guard was gone. The castle and the surrounding city had been evacuated the moment the Pax destroyers had cleared Theron's atmosphere. How many draken lived in that city? The vet asked. Two thousand, I replied. Give or take a hundred. And what about the city we're traveling to now? Ovet asked. Heilbrunn is smaller, I replied. It had a population of 840 at last count. Will we make it in time? Ovet asked. I knew that most of the larger spaceships would have taken off by now, carrying away the bulk of Theron's population. The truth of the matter was that I wasn't sure. For all I knew, the remaining commanders had assumed we were dead and left us behind. We're almost there, I replied evasively. Can the pod function in space? Yvette asked. Not for long, I replied darkly. It doesn't have enough energy or resources to carry us far into the galaxy. And even if it did, there aren't enough food supplies on board to last us more than a week or two depending on how sparingly we ration. Yvette nodded. Then let's hope there's a spaceship available when we get to Heilbrunn. The further we got from Mount Royal, the more the air cleared. We could actually see the raw beauty of Theron. Oh, my God! Yvette breathed, her breath ghosting over my shoulder. What is it? I asked, looking back at her in panic. Is that waterfall purple? I glanced down and saw the rocky summit of the Thork mountain range. Boulders and rocks had created loose peaks at its apex, but they would reform again during heavy rains. Purple water skirted over the top in small floods, rejoining at the center of the mountain before dropping down almost a hundred feet into Lake Thork. That's because of the Beldor, I replied. The what? Yvette asked. They're a type of fish that's native to Theron, I said distractedly. They secrete a chemical that turns the water purple. I felt a small thrill sharing that information with her. But on its heels came the sharp slap of reality. I was sharing with her the wonders of a world that would soon be destroyed. Yes, Theron was beautiful, but that would cease to matter once we had cleared its atmosphere. We would never see it again. I can see the Heilbronn Mountain coming up, I said, noticing its sharp, pinpoint peaks in the distance. Within the next twenty microns, we had come upon the spindly mountains of Heilbronn. The moment we passed over it, I took in the city that lay in the cradle of its body. I had expected to find an abandoned city, but instead I found chaos. I could see two spaceships on the ground, both of which were royal crafts that were larger than the wyvern. Next to them sat the Gignar. There were a number of escape pods that littered the ground in front of the spaceships and a crowd of creatures hemming in different directions across the uneven surface. As our escape pod made its descent... I noticed a small group of guards aim their weapons at us. The moment they caught sight of me, however, they lowered their weapons and they began to clear the area for landing. We had just touched down when I saw Dashiell walking up to our pod. 
Lahar and Tarion flanked him, and they both looked out of breath. Why aren't you in the air yet? I demanded. Are you complaining? Dashiell asked. No, but we were waiting for you, Dashiell admitted. I held back two spacecrafts in the hope that you would make it in time. The last lot of Draken and slaves need to be boarded. I looked around at the massive creatures running back and forth. Some held large rucksacks on their backs, while others grabbed their hatchlings and made straight for the entry ramps. We don't have time, I growled. The packs have succeeded in erupting Mount Crato. They will lay waste to Mount Royal, and then they will be upon us. If we're not in the air by the time they reach us, we're all dead. I have two draken keeping their eyes peeled for the pack's destroyers, Dashiell said. Giving commands was the only thing I could do here through the evacuation process. They will let us know when the pack's fleet are upon us. I looked back over my shoulder and saw that Yvette was standing a few feet away. Her eyes were trained on a Norshan slave and her young child. The child was trying to help her mother, who had a leg injury, that was causing her to stumble every few feet. Without a glance at me, Yvette abandoned her position and made straight for the Norshan. As she approached, the slave shrank back, despite the fact that she was twice Yvette's size. Let me help you, Yvette said. The Norshan slave looked weary, but the child grabbed Yvette's hand as though she had thrown them a lifeline. The child had large golden eyes, and her mane was scraggy at best, but there was strength in her timid features. Yvette hoisted one of the Norshan's arms around her shoulders and helped her towards the open ramp of the spaceship on the right. The child followed behind, carrying the thin bag of possessions that they'd brought with them. Acting on instinct, I moved to help Yvette, knowing that the Norshan's weight would be too much for her to bear for a long period of time. The slave tensed immediately as I picked her up. Yvette looked slightly taken aback, but a moment later I saw a ghostly smile play across her lips. I ignored that and carried the slave up the ramp and into the spaceship, while her child scampered behind. Once she was inside, I headed back down to the ground where a vet stood waiting for me. Get on the ship, I said firmly. A vet's ghostly smile disappeared altogether, and her jaw set stubbornly. Not without you. I need to make sure my people are on board. Then I'll help. Don't be a fool, I snapped. Instead of engaging with me, Yvette turned and ran in the direction of another small group of slaves. They were panic-stricken ermits, whose wide-set eyes stared at the world with a foreboding sense of dread. I was more than a little frustrated with Yvette, but I couldn't deny feeling admiration and respect for her. In spite of everything, she was here on the ground trying to help the scared and the lost to a place of safety. The Pax had made a slave of her, but deep down, she was still a commander. Suddenly, a blast of flame shot through the air like a cannon, and I recognized it for the warning it was. We had run out of time. The Pax fleet had been spotted. Chapter 23 Yvette. They're here. They're coming for us. We're all going to die. The dragon child screaming was piercing through my facade of calm and making my head spin with pain. I turned around and saw the child's wide eyes staring up at the sky. The fleet had only just been spotted, which meant we had a few more minutes before they were actually upon us. We're going to die! I looked around for the child's mother, but there was no one around. I don't want to die. You are not going to die, I said, speaking louder than I had intended to make myself heard over the chaos of the evacuation. The child stopped his wailing immediately. Clearly, the shock of being addressed so directly by a slave had taken him off guard. 
He was a pale-faced boy with golden scales that snaked across his arms, neck, and part of his face. His hair was a golden brown, and his eyes were dark and secretive. You don't know that, he replied. Yes, I do, I insisted. You know why I know that? Why? Because you are a draken of the Hyles reign, I said. No, I'm not, the child refuted me. Only the greatest fighters can join the Hyles reign. Then become a great fighter and join it, I said. We might be leaving Theron, but a kingdom is only as good as its people. Before the boy could say anything, another whip of fire rose through the air like a rocket. I looked around and saw the fury with which everyone was making for the ships. I tried to catch sight of Rennell, but I couldn't see him anywhere. Where's your mother? I asked urgently, turning back to the boy. I, I don't know, he admitted. She told me not to leave her side, but I turned around and... It doesn't matter, I said hurriedly, looking towards the skies. It doesn't matter. Take my hand and come with me. We're getting on a spaceship. But it's right here, the boy said, looking back at the ship we were rushing away from. I need to get on Gignar, I said, knowing that Rennell would be boarding that ship instead of one of the two larger ones. That's a Hiles rain ship, the boy said. I didn't reply. I just pushed through the crowd as I tried to get to Gignar as fast as possible. I was thrown off balance several times, but I managed to remain standing. I had just gotten to Gignar's main ramp when I caught sight of Rennell. It seemed like he had been looking for me, too, because his eyes went wide with relief when he saw me. His eyes fell to the boy at my side and our entwined hands. What is your name, Hatchling? Rennell asked. Horrick! The child answered in an awed voice. And your parents? I don't know where they are. We'll find them, Rennell nodded. For now, get inside, both of you. The boy raced ahead of both of us, but I stood my ground. Rennell took one look at my stance and narrowed his eyes. Then he grabbed me without warning and hoisted me over his shoulder. He took the ramp at a run, and before I knew it, we were inside the confines of Gignar. He set me down roughly and nodded to a brown-scaled dragon to the side. Make sure she stays on board, he commanded. I have more civilians I need to see, too. Then, without a glance at me, he turned and ran back down the ramp. When he was at the bottom, he turned and gave the signal to start closing the ramp. No! I screamed. I bolted forward, but the brown-scaled draken grabbed me by the waist and pulled me deeper and deeper into the annals of the ship. Furious with Rennell, I tried to look for another open ramp, but all I could see were large curving windows that overlooked the intricate brilliance of the mountain range that had the now nearly abandoned city of Heilbrunn. We're not taking off just yet, are we? I demanded from the brown-scaled dragon who kept looking at me with interest. Rennell is still down there, so are the other commanders. That's Commander Rennell to you, the dragon hissed. His annoyance didn't faze me. I had been through too much today to get caught up in some random dragon's disdain for me. Who did you lose? I turned and saw the young boy, Hatchling, that I had befriended only moments earlier. His dark eyes were lighter now, and he looked upon the smoking skies with curious wonder. What? I asked. You look like you lost someone, he said. Like me, with my mother. I turned towards the glass panes. I glimpsed Rennell's burgundy scales from afar. He was running across the rocky plains with two young hatchlings on his back. I was furious at him, but my fury didn't prevent me from recognizing his magnificence. Had there ever been a time when I thought him monstrous? 
I haven't lost anyone, I said, mostly to myself. You're wearing that collar, Hork said. That means you're a slave. I nodded. Yes, I am, I replied. But then I thought back to the moment Ronell had tried to rid me of my collar. He had wanted to give me my freedom. I wondered if that would still hold true once we cleared Theron's atmosphere and were back in the ceaseless infinity of space. I heard a massive blast and goose flesh prickled on my skin as I saw a Pax destroyer rise over the mountain range to face us. My entire body went cold as I realized that Gignar had just hummed into takeoff mode. As we rose into the air, I noticed that both of the larger spaceships to Gignar's right were in the air already, and their combat missiles were aimed at the Pax destroyers. Seconds later, I saw the missiles rip through the air. The sky seemed to burst into flame as a missile made contact with the Pax destroyer. Smoke fluttered into the atmosphere like claws reaching for the sun. We were rising higher still, and I looked around the ship in panic. Where was Rennell? I was starting to feel lightheaded. My vision blurred, and a sharp pain shot through my stomach. I was aware of the small collection of creatures congregated in front of the viewing deck. They were watching the larger spaceships of the Royal Fleet take on the Pax destroyers and their Hellion missiles. I felt weak, unbearably weak, and my knees were starting to give way. I desperately wanted to close my eyes, but I knew I wouldn't be able to rest until I knew that Rennell was all right. I stumbled into Horik, and I saw his dark eyes blink at me with concern. Are you all right? he asked. I opened my mouth to say something, but the only word my mouth was able to form was Rennell. What? Horik asked. I don't know what she's saying. The slave is probably delirious with panic, another voice spoke. This voice was harsh and indifferent. I felt rough hands around my arm, but I didn't bother pushing him away. I was too weak for that. Unhand her, a familiar voice ordered. I looked up as relief flooded my body. Rennell? The sea of creatures parted, and Rennell stepped through the small crowd. He approached me with bright eyes that were thick with purpose. I'm here, he said. I placed my hand on his arm just to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I certainly felt strange, strange enough to make me think I could be hallucinating. But no, it really was him. I could tell from the warmth that clung to his scales and the way his tail swished out behind him back and forth as though he were pacing. You're here, I said unnecessarily. Satisfied that Rennell was here and he was safe, I let my eyes close. I was vaguely aware of my knees giving way, but I didn't think too much of it. I knew Rennell would catch me. Chapter 24 Rennell Do we have enough medical supplies for the wounded? I asked. Dashiell's face paled. I think so, but I don't know if I underestimated the extent of the injuries in question. Two of my men are alive, but unconscious. I don't know if they'll make it or not. Natalie put her hand on Dashiell's shoulder and squeezed gently. I saw the look on his face every time she touched him. It was like her skin had healing potential. I wondered if that was what I looked like when Yvette touched me. We were in the circular solar of Dashiell's private quarters. He had retired there once we had cleared Theron's atmosphere and called for me. His chambers had no definitive identity. He alone, of all the commanders, had not cultivated a taste for collecting. Tarion, 
had his extensive weapons collection. Lahar had a significant hoard of shells and jewelry, and I had my books. Dashiell's room reflected more of Natalie's personality than his own. She had dressed the space with large cushions that looked to be of Elsam make. The Elsam made the softest, most comfortable fabrics, sheets, and clothes in the known galaxy. They were a peace-loving people whose protection had been won through the manufacture and trade of spaceships. There were also little trinkets that littered the room, and I was fairly certain they hailed from Earth. There was a tiny mirror that was ornamented by an intricate silver frame whose purpose evaded me completely. There was a small oval piece of wood with bristles on the face and a handle protruding from one side. There was a strange square tablet with a glassy surface that displayed a bold crack down the middle. It looked like trash to me, but it had been given a place of honor on the long, narrow table where Dasho kept his commander's sword. I wondered if a vet would know what these objects were. We paid a high price, Natalie said, but our people fought bravely. Draken, always do, Dasho said with fierce pride. But I detected a small note of regret that stained his tone. It was important that you led the evacuation, brother, I said. The people needed a strong leader to take charge. The royal family is not versed in the art of battle or warfare. Not the way we are. No, Dashiell agreed. But I could tell that not even my words could remove the sting of knowing he had missed the most significant battle in Draken history. You're right. What's done is done. Now we must look to the future. We have to find a place to settle, Dashiell said, glancing at Natalie. His hand fell automatically to the swell of her belly. We need a plan. The fleet has dispersed and our con system is down, I said, mentally taking off all the problems we had to contend with now that we were a nation without a home. And our ships are in need of repairs and supplies. We don't have very many choices. Without Lahar and Tarion present to chime in, it was a lonely commander's meeting. But I was glad that at least they had kept possession of their ships. I was the only commander to have lost his, and my pride had taken a deep hit because of it. Still, I had gotten off easy. My injuries were minimal at best, and I knew they would heal within days. The same could not be said for several other draken on board. Those who had fought in the sky battle against the Pax had sustained serious injuries, and some had even lost limbs. We couldn't know the final death count for sure until the whole fleet gathered and we could take stock of our losses. For the first time in recent memory, the medical quarters on board Gignar were completely full. Within the first few hours of our flight, we had lost three fighters, four civilians, and eight slaves who had all succumbed to their injuries. Where do you think we should go? Dashiell asked, looking up at Natalie. We could go to Pilak, Natalie suggested. The Pilak are not exactly friends to us, I pointed out. We pillaged their land recently. They're unlikely to have forgotten that. Not Pilak, Dashiell said immediately. What about Gurnacy? Rennell, you took a fondness for the land. Not Gurnacy, I said firmly. The land is not large or wild enough to satisfy our people for a significant length of time. We need a place we can colonize on. Do you have a place in mind? Dashiell asked. Nort, I said. Nort? I nodded. The Norsians will not threaten us. They fear us enough to keep out of our way. Their land is immense. We can easily find a patch of land to make our own, no matter how temporary. Dashiell nodded. Nort it is, then, he said. I will make the order to my second commander. I will do it, Natalie said, standing up. No, my love, Dashiell said, his hand reaching out for her protectively. You must rest. 
Rest is all I've been doing lately, she said. But the stress of battle is past, Natalie said gently. I want to check on our feral hatchlings anyway. She leaned down and kissed Dashiell tenderly on his brow before leaving his solar through the arched door to the right. I watched their easy dynamic and the equality that existed between them. It was hard to believe that Natalie had ever worn a collar. It was harder still to believe that Dashiell had owned her, just as I now owned Yvette. Yvette. You seem far away, my friend, Dashiell said, interrupting my thoughts. I understand it. This defeat cuts deep. I didn't bother telling Dashiell that I had not been thinking of our defeat at all. Of course, now that he had reminded me, the pain was like an open flesh wound. It was more than painful. It was humiliating. What do we do now? I asked. Dashiell looked towards the black midnight of space. His eyes were tortured, clouded over with worry. And I imagined I looked much the same. We survive, he replied. We have no other choice. Have your crew made progress on the comm system? I asked, getting into problem-solving mode. They're working on it as we speak, Dashiell nodded. We have our direct lines with Lahar and Tarion working, but the rest of the fleet will have to be contacted only once the comm system is up and running again. I nodded. Do we have the supplies to make it to Nort? We do, Dashiell nodded. I'm fairly certain we can hold out. We need to be sparing, though. Understood. I nodded as I turned in the direction of the door. Ronell. I paused and craned my head back to glance at Dashiell. Yes? Is there something going on between you and your human slave? Dashiell asked. I felt my jaw set uncomfortably. How could I refute him? I was sure my own uncertainty was etched across my face. I pressed the exit button, and the moment the door slid open... I stepped out and followed the winding pathway out of the commander's quarters towards the guest quarters. I was back in the room I had occupied when the wyvern had been undergoing repairs. It stung now to know that I would be on board for the foreseeable future, at least until I managed to find myself a suitable replacement ship. Spaceships were expensive, high-value commodities— and in my opinion, choosing one was a deeply personal decision. There were several planets that sold them. Elsim was one, but their production process was long, arduous, and tended to lean towards aesthetic beauty rather than practical functionality. Another option was Rawl. The Raleigh had a number of formidable natural resources that they utilized in the production of their spaceships, their vessels tended to be smaller and were nowhere near large enough to support my crew or my slaves. I thought about purchasing a vessel of brigadine make. The quality of their spacecrafts had improved considerably in the last century, but Brigadar was situated far into the middle of the galaxy. It would require at least five revolutions and seven jumps to reach. When I got to the entrance of my quarters, I pushed the button that slid open my door and walked in to find that Yvette was awake. She was standing in front of the viewing windows, staring out at the midnight darkness. Her hands were crisscrossed, folded around her body as though she were cold. The fire was blazing away in the hearth, so I knew that if she was feeling cold, it had nothing to do with the temperature. How are you feeling? I asked. Yvette turned to look at me with faraway eyes. I had obviously caught her in a moment of deep contemplation. I'm feeling strange, she admitted after a small pause. Frowning, I walked over to her and searched her face. Strange? I repeated. I don't know, 
Yvette said. It's just been a difficult few days. I nodded, unable to speak. Is everything okay? Yvette asked, her eyes grazing over my face. Yes, I nodded. It's just... I trailed off, but Yvette nodded with understanding, as though my explanation were unnecessary. I know, she said. It takes a long time to process... I'm afraid it won't feel real for some time. Not until you start to accept your new reality. She was right, I realized. Nothing felt real. It was like I was standing on shaky ground and waiting to wake up. I moved closer to her, and I noticed she angled her body towards me as well. I wondered if she even noticed or if it was merely an instinctive response. How long did it take you? I asked, to accept your new reality. Lovette smiled. Honestly, it comes and goes. Just when you think you've accepted it, something happens, and you get pulled back in with fresh pain. When I was in Servo Skull Arm, I used to wake up and not have any recollection of where I was. I used to think I was still on Earth. Then I'd turn and see the other girls... I'd see their black collars and the scars that ran up and down their arms and legs, and it would all come back to me. Did you know the attack was coming? I asked. There had been talk of alien invasion for decades, Yvette admitted. Humanity has always stubbornly clung to the belief that we're the only intelligent life force in the galaxy. But things kept happening on Earth. Abductions, strange sightings unexplained phenomena. It started making people nervous. Then, one day, the power grid in Beijing, China, completely blew out. Phone lines, internet, everything completely shut down. It was like they were completely cut off from the rest of the world. China? I asked. Earth is made up of continents, Yvette explained. Each continent has countries. China is one of them, and Beijing is its capital city. It's far from the country I was born in, but we're all connected through trade. For three days, no one knew what had happened there. Later, the Chinese government confirmed that Beijing had been attacked. Half the city had been destroyed. Thousands had been killed, and hundreds had been taken away by aliens. Yvette looked down and shook her head. No one believed them. I raised my eyebrows. No one? Some did, she conceded. But no one with any real power. Most other governments believed that it was the work of the Chinese mafia. They thought the alien excuse was just a far-fetched ruse to try and keep international intervention at bay. Like I said... The majority of humanity is too proud and stubborn to believe that we aren't the only ones in the universe. The idea of not believing in other planets or species seemed like the height of stupidity to me. But Earth had always been somewhat removed from the rest of the galaxy. I tried not to be too unkind for Yvette's sake. But you were prepared, I pointed out keeping my opinions over Earth's oversights to myself. Because the mayor of my city was one of the few who was fearful that the alien threat was real, that said. And as it turned out, he was right. Mere months after the Beijing incident, New York was cut off from the rest of the world, too. It was a Pax tactic, a strategy to sow confusion, distrust, and panic before they attacked. No one saw them coming until it was too late. Your planet confuses me, I admitted. You have no kings or commanders? We do, Yvette said. Some countries are ruled by kings, and others are governed by elected officials. Elected officials, I repeated. Men or women who are chosen by the people to lead them. Yvette said. But it's a temporary position. They cannot stay in power for more than eight years. It varies from country to country. 
It's a confusing system, I said. That almost smiled. It can be, she nodded. To me, it's just normal. Do you miss Earth? I asked, before I could stop myself. All the time, that nodded. Every day, it is a wound that never heals. I reached out and wrapped my arm around her waist. She walked into the circle of my arms and rested her head against my chest. It felt like the most natural thing in the world. She started stroking the bruised scale of a wound I had taken to my left arm. Does it hurt? She asked without looking up at me. I barely notice it, I said. It will be healed in a few days. Is it true that Draken have regenerative abilities? Ovet asked. We heal faster than other species, I shrugged. But a wound is still a wound. It requires time to heal. Our wounds can kill us just the same as everyone else's. Havet kept stroking my arm, and I closed my eyes and surrendered myself to the beautiful warmth of her touch. It was a dark time for my people. But in this stolen moment... In this tiny pocket, in a vast and vengeful galaxy, I found some small measure of peace. I hooked one claw underneath her chin and pushed her face up to me my own. Her eyes were clear, limpid pools that I could see my reflection in. I bent down and kissed her softly, until I'd forgotten where we were, where we were going, and what we had fled from. Chapter 25 Yvette Rennell's wounds had healed well over the last six days. His burgundy scales were a pale, slightly marred pink, where the scales had torn away. But I could already see scabs of fresh, hard scales start to form. He barely tended to his wounds, so I usually did. I longed for our evenings now. We had fallen into a comfortable routine, and I hated to admit it out loud, but there was a certain air of domesticity about it. I had freedom of the ship, a luxury I had never been afforded before. It appeared that the rest of the crew had been informed of my newly elevated status, because despite the subtle stares I received, all of them left me alone. I split my days between the nursery and the medical wing, and for the first time in a long time, I felt as though my life had a purpose. The dragon hatchlings awaited my presence each morning, and I had even befriended a young dragon named Earl in the medical wing, where I spent most of my evenings. By unspoken agreement, I spent my nights with Rennell in his chamber. Some days I beat him there. And sometimes I would walk in to find him sitting by the fireplace or staring into the black abyss of space. Last night, however, I had walked into an empty chamber and fallen asleep before Rennell had arrived. Then, this morning, I had awoken to the smell of briner skin and spiced milk. Rennell poured me a glass of the spiced milk and I accepted it gratefully as my stomach rumbled greedily. Thank you, I said. You were sound asleep when I walked in yesterday, Rennell said. I don't know why I'm so tired lately, I admitted. I'm sure the hatchlings are not easy to take care of. I smiled. I love spending time with them, I said. And Horik has really bonded with Natalie and Dashiell's young ones. His parents? Rennell asked. I sighed. We still don't know which ship they're on, I admitted. Or if they made it onto a ship in the first place. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we locate them soon. For now, he seems to be doing well. Good, Rennell said distractedly. How are the comms repairs going? I asked. Slowly, Rennell said through gritted teeth. It feels strange, being disconnected from the whole fleet, 
stuck on someone else's ship. I could tell that the loss of the wyvern had been particularly hard for him. It was as though his identity had been tied to the ship, and now he was struggling with who he was without it. He took a piece of dry briner skin and chewed on it absentmindedly. The skin was oddly spicy, but I liked it because it had a slightly nostalgic vibe that reminded me of jerky. Today, however, my stomach turned at the thought of eating the tough meat. I sipped on the milk instead, allowing my palate to get used to the punchy flavor. You'll find another ship, I said. It won't be the wyvern. It'll be better, I said. The vet. I liked the way he said my name. He didn't use it often, but when he did, I felt my skin tingle with a strange kind of electricity. Yes. Dashiell has some strange objects in his solar, Brunel said. I think they're from Earth. I wonder if you know their purpose. I smiled. Describe them to me. He described the first item to me, and I couldn't help but laugh. It's a hand mirror, I told him. It's also called a looking glass. To see your face. Why not use a large mirror? Renell asked. You can't carry it around. Why would you want to? Renell asked. I paused. It's sort of an outdated item, I admitted. People used to use them a very long time ago. Now they're merely, well, some humans use them for novelty's sake. Despite the fact that he seemed unsatisfied with my explanation, Rennell started to describe the second item that had caught his eye. Oh, it's a brush, I told him. Brush? To comb our hair, I explained, running my fingers through my dark roots to keep it neat and tidy. Rennell raised his eyebrows for a moment and then shook his head. Humans are strange creatures. What does it matter if your hair is neat or not? I smiled. I guess it doesn't matter. Rennell's expression was contorted into a creased frown, as though he were still trying to puzzle my species out. Why are you suddenly so curious about Earth? I asked. Rennell shrugged. It's where you're from. As simply as he put it, I felt the importance behind his words. It touched me so deeply that moisture sprung to my eyes, and I wiped them away hurriedly before Rennell noticed. How are your wounds? I asked. Almost fully healed, Rennell nodded. You worry too much about them. They look painful. Rennell observed the bruised scale with detachment. I have suffered far worse in battle. I was lucky. I agreed with that. The medical wing was still teeming with the injured, some of whom showed no signs of recovery. Every day since we had left the burning remains of Thirin... Dashiell and Rennell had been forced to perform what they referred to as black funerals. When a dragon or slave succumbed to their wounds and died, their bodies were brought to a circular hatch at the back of the ship. The bodies were released through the hatch, and then Rennell and Dashiell stood and watched as space devoured the body within microns. I had never been to a black funeral, but Rennell had described it to me on the second night. I hadn't been able to sleep at all for three nights after that. I stopped by the medical wing yesterday before retiring for the night, Rennell told me. It seems Earl has taken a shine to you. I smiled. He's a little rough around the edges, I acknowledge, but he does grow on you. Do you know what they call you there? Rennell asked. I frowned. They call me something? They've named you Hamina Helissa, Rennell told me. It means human healer.
I smiled. That's not the kind of name I've gotten used to up here, I admitted. It's a nice change. I finished my spiced milk and sighed with satisfaction. It had helped settle my stomach, and I felt strong enough to face the rest of the day. How was our progress? I asked. We're making good time, Rennell nodded. We should make it to Nort two solars ahead of schedule. That's good, I nodded, noticing the way Rennell's brows were creasing every few seconds. I got to my feet and walked around the breakfast trolley to where he sat. I sat down on the arm of his chair and stroked his forehead gently. There were tiny scales that protruded from his hairline. They were a light-flecked burgundy that melted into his dark hair. Is something on your mind? I asked. You seem to be preoccupied, more so than usual. He turned his face up to meet mine. Modoc, he replied. Modoc? I repeated. Are you talking about the draken who was supposed to be in charge of communications between Theron and the fleet? Rennell nodded. I don't trust him. He made a mistake. He doesn't get to make mistakes like that, Rennell growled. He's not aboard Gignar at all. He's on Tarion's ship. At least he's still with the fleet, I pointed out. The others have turned a blind eye to his faults. Renell said. They trust him simply because he is a draken. Well then, share your concerns with them, I said. I intend to, Renell nodded. I kept massaging his forehead until his eyes closed. Then I leaned down and kissed his brow, his eyelids, and his cheeks until I finally landed on his lips. I had grown confident in our newly found intimacy. Familiarity had crept into the space between our bodies and made everything simpler. His lips responded to mine, and slowly I felt the rise of his erection against my thigh. He pulled me onto his lap, and I adjusted my legs so that I was straddling him. His hands pushed up the soft white cloth of my night slip and I felt his rough hands against my belly. I felt a tingle of excitement spread through my body until it reached the wet area between my legs. I was completely naked beneath my slip, and Rennell took full advantage, traversing the lay of my body with eager zeal. Slowly, he pulled off my slip and threw it to the floor next to us. He took a moment to admire my breast before slipping a nipple into his mouth. He was extremely gentle with me, and I knew how much effort it was taking him to stay mindful despite his raging desires. There were moments when our lovemaking was rough, and more often than not, my cries were a strangled mix of pleasure and pain. But today, it was different. I could tell in the way Renault caressed my body like I was the most fragile being in the universe. I kissed the top of his head as he sucked on my nipple, making me cry out with pleasure. Feeling suddenly ravenous, I pushed his head away from my breasts and started to undo the tie-ups of his breeches. I pulled away the tough fabric to release his erect cock. With my heart drumming fast against my chest, I raised my hips and guided him inside me. That first moment of contact always made my head spin. I raised and lowered my hips in gentle strokes as my body adjusted to accommodate his immensity. He left a trail of kisses along my neck and collarbone as his hands stayed on my lower back and my hips supporting my movements, and giving me a little additional assistance when I slowed down. We came together, with my hands wrapped around his shoulders and his claws scraping gently against my back. I felt the build of his release shudder through him, accompanied by his groan of pleasure, and I felt something stir inside me. 
I had never been in love with anyone before. So it was hard for me to know exactly what it was I was feeling. I had nothing to compare it with. Rennell, I asked softly, moving to lay on the bed beside him. Hmm. Tell me about Heron. Rennell turned his head and looked at me with confusion. You want to know about my husband? Yes, I nodded. Why? I suppose the same reason you wanted to know about Earth, I explained. Heron is a part of who you are, and I don't want you to feel like you can't talk about him. Rennell's eyes grew distant for a moment, but then he focused on me, and I saw a smile playing on the corners of his mouth. Very well, he nodded. He encircled me with his arms, and I settled into the curve of his body. Hesitantly, Rennell started talking, and I sat and listened to his story as we fell back into his past together. Chapter 26 Rennell Tarion and Lahar's ship will touch down on Nort a few solars before Gignar, Dashiell said, fixing me with his calm gaze. The comm system on Gignar had been fixed for the most part, and we had managed to make contact with most of the fleet. There were a few spaceships that were still unaccounted for, but Dashiell seemed confident that they would figure out a way to send us a message about their location. And Modoc. I asked. Dashiell sighed. He's with Tarion. Has he explained himself? I demanded. He made a mistake, Rennell. Dashiell said with forced patience that made my blood boil hot in my veins. He understands the oversight he made. Oversight? I repeated furiously. It was far more than an oversight. I'm not disagreeing with you, but you are defending him. He is willing to make amends. He should be tried, I said. He should be brought before a tribunal and made to answer for his mistakes. That is extreme, Renault. Extreme? I asked, wondering if it was possible for my eyeballs to jump out of their sockets. His mistakes cost us our home planet, not to mention the countless lives that were lost in the battle. Mistakes are made in war, Dashiell said softly. Tarion has already questioned Modoc. Tarion is a good commander, but he can be a fool, I spat. I didn't take you for a fool, though. I saw Dashiell's expression shift immediately. His eyes turned cold, and he angled his body away from me in silent protest. I think you're overtired, Dashiell said. Maybe you should retire for the night. I can speak with my second commanders alone. It was a firm dismissal, and one that I could not ignore. He was the leading commander, given that this was his ship. I had no choice but to nod my head and make for the door. I exited Dashiell's circular solar and headed straight for the medical unit. It was still early, and I knew that a vet would be tending to the sick and injured there. She had become devoted to their safety and comfort, and more often than not, she arrived at my chambers after me. The medical bay on Gignar had been transformed. The few single beds we possessed formed a line down one wall, and at least a dozen or so makeshift beds had been arranged around the rest of the large space. The center island, which was usually kept clean and free of any unnecessary objects, was now teeming with different medical aids, ready for use at a moment's notice. I noticed Natalie in one corner attending to a young Norsian slave, who had severe burns on both arms. I spotted Yvette in the corner of the medical wing with Earl, the draken she had befriended. 
He was laughing at something she had just said, and I felt an unexpected flare of anger ignite inside me. Was this jealousy? It was all-consuming, almost tangible, and I had no idea what to do with it. My first instinct was aggression. But I was a commander of the Hiles Rain fleet. I didn't have the luxury of acting impulsively. In any case, neither Ural nor Yvette had done anything wrong. I was keenly aware that my emotions were unjustified. And that made me feel even more uncomfortable. I walked towards Yvette and Earl, and I saw the latter straighten when he saw me approach. Commander, he said, bowing his head respectfully. Yvette turned to me and smiled. Her eyes brightened immediately, and I felt shame for my earlier jealousy. How are your wounds healing? I asked. Earl looked down at his broken leg. Yvette thinks I should be able to start walking tomorrow. On crutches, Yvette said quickly. And small walks, just around the medical bay. That's all? Just until we can assess how well the leg is healing. I feel good. Because you haven't used it yet, Yvette said firmly. She had an air of authority about her, and it suited her well. His fractured wing is healing nicely, too, she added. But I wouldn't recommend any shifting, not until it's completely healed. I watched how Ural hung on Yvette's every word. The disdain with which Mustraken used to look at her had disappeared. Now there was a certain amount of respect mixed in with obvious liking, and she was thriving on it. Get a good night's rest, Yvette said. I'll come by in the morning for your inaugural walk. Ural smiled and nodded. See you tomorrow, he said, before he turned to me. Commander? I nodded and turned to leave, knowing that Yvette was following close behind. Several of the slave patients and other draken called out farewells to her as we left the medical wing. I was almost out of the door when I caught Natalie's eye. She gave me a knowing smile and turned back to her patient. I tried not to read too much into it. We walked back to my chambers in silence. Our footsteps left a subtle echo drumming against the walls of the broad tunnels that connected one pathway to the next. There were no deaths today, Yvette said the moment we entered my chambers. There was no fire in the hearth, so I moved to light it, while Yvette pulled off her roughly sewn white garment in favor of the night slip she usually wore to bed. I adjusted the logs in the hearth, and then sent a hard puff of hot breath right onto the uneven pile. It sparked only slightly, so I sent another, harder breath towards it. And this time, the sparks danced, then burst into little flames that grabbed a hold of the supple wood. I know, I nodded with relief as I turned towards her. Today was a good day. I watched as Yvette's white garment fell to the floor to reveal the beautiful curves of her body. I felt myself stiffen slightly at the sight. Her milky skin had a tawny glow from the fire I had just kindled. She reached for her night slip, and it flowed over, clinging to her body like water. Come here, I growled. She walked over to me, and I sat down on my favorite chair, pulling her down on top of me. She wrapped an arm around my shoulder and rested her forehead against mine. How did your meeting go with Dashiell today? Yvette asked. Tarion and Lahar were able to link into the meeting via the comm system, I admitted. We didn't have video, but it felt good to be able to communicate properly with one another. Horik's parents, Yvette said immediately. Did you ask about them? No, I admitted. I'll ask them tomorrow. I stroked her hip in slow circles. Tarion is furious, I said. He's swearing revenge on the packs. Yvette nodded. I'm not surprised, but you will need to be careful, she said. 
I don't know if you're ready for another war with the Pax. They need to pay for what they've done, I said through gritted teeth. You've lost many of your people, Renell, Yvette said gently. You need to recuperate first. Jumping into another fight with the Pax is not going to end well for you. She was right, and I knew it, but it still stung to hear. We Drakens prided ourselves on our strength and our power. It seemed that the rodents of the galaxy had outdone us on both fronts. It was a bitter pill to swallow. We should have seen this coming, I said under my breath. We should have known. No one could have known they were coming after Theron, Yvette said gently. The packs are in the business of conquest, I said. And any species who rises up to threaten their power is immediately targeted. It happened to the Jibrex. The packs hunted their species into near extinction. Breck is now a colony planet of the packs. Soon, the universe will be overrun with those monsters, and every planet will just be another spoke in the packs' wheel of conquest. Don't say that, Yvette said, shuddering against me. There are a lot of planets in the galaxy, and as many if not more species. The Pax can't destroy them all. No, but they can subjugate them all, I pointed out. The Pax's goal was not just to extinguish the threat of my species. It was to enslave us. They didn't succeed, Yvette said, with new fear in her eyes. No dragon will ever agree to be a slave. I never thought Theron would ever fall into the hands of those foul rodents, I spat. But here we are, a nation without a home. Sometimes circumstances change, and the perspective with which we view the world and ourselves changes to reflect that. I saw tears glisten softly in Yvette's eyes and I immediately regretted confiding in her. I knew she was strong enough to hear all this. I just didn't want her to have to. The instinctive need to protect her flared hot inside me and reminded me that I had much to lose now. You'll find a way forward, Yvette said with conviction. I know you will. Where does your belief come from? I asked. She pulled my face to hers. From you, she said simply. Chapter 27 Yvette I woke up and reached for Renell, but his side of the bed was glaringly empty. I turned around and squinted against the bright sunlight that was streaming through the windows into Renell's chambers. Sunlight? We were supposed to be in space. How was it possible that I could see blue-gray sky and cotton candy cloud formations? I stumbled out of bed and nearly tripped over the long sheets in an attempt to reach the windows. I craned my neck to look down and saw the still blotchy design of land and water that formed a fuzzy canvas below me. I rushed back to the bed and grabbed my clothes. I dressed hurriedly and rushed down to the medical wing, hoping that Natalie would be there. Of course, she wasn't. If we were landing on Nort soon, she would be in the control room with Dashiell. I knew that Rendell would be there, too. And I felt a small bubble of isolation, knowing that I wasn't included. Earl was standing by the center island in the medical wing when I entered. His leg had made great progress, and he could walk around for longer stretches than I had anticipated. In another few days, I was pretty sure he would be able to remove his crutches altogether. Nice morning, isn't it? He asked pleasantly when I walked in. We're landing soon? I asked. That seems to be the case, Earl nodded. Nervous? Should I be? I wondered. We're colonizing on a foreign planet. Earl pointed out. 
Drakens have always stayed on other planets, but it's always been temporary, a stopgap on the way to the next pillage. Well, sometimes circumstances change, I said, thinking about Rennell's words a few nights ago. How's your leg? Almost completely healed. And your wing? Hurts a little when I unfold it, but much better than it used to be. No shifting for a while, I told him. Yes, homina helisa. I smiled. No one had ever used the title on me directly, and I found that I quite liked it. It was nice to be seen as something other than a slave. It was nice to know that you were making a contribution that was not only appreciated, but respected, too. I excused myself and headed to the main pantheon of Gignar, where the central viewing decks were located. The glass stretched from floor to ceiling, almost twenty feet tall, and gave you a spectacular view of the surrounding area. When I reached the viewing deck, I saw that a few other draken had gathered there. I wondered if they would take offense at my presence, but apart from a few side glances, no one said a word to me. I found an empty spot at the front of the deck and looked out over Nort. I was struck by how barren and lifeless a planet it looked. The landscape was made up of dull browns, sad grays, and confused whites. Parts of the land looked like they had been excavated recently. As Gignar descended, I could see huge mining tunnels to face dusty mounds of brown soil. There were no trees, and almost no foliage that I could see. There were a few plants that reminded me of cacti because of the small thorns protruding from their spines, but they were brown in color and seemed to sag to one side as though they had given up already. I couldn't see much water either. There was nothing in the way of natural lakes or rivers. Nor looked more like a ravaged desert that had been stripped of all its natural beauty. My chest felt heavy with the knowledge that this would be our home for the foreseeable future. I would have much rather been floating around in space indefinitely, but I knew the fleet was weak now and needed some place secure to recuperate. I felt a shadow over my shoulder, and I turned to see Marat walking toward me. Who's with the hatchlings? I asked. Marat looked unconcerned. Her eyes were fixed on the arid land before us. I am not the only nanny, she replied, her tone biting. The others can take care of the little monsters. Hey, I said gently. Marat didn't even seem to register my words. Her eyes were large and unblinking and I realized that this was an emotional moment for her. I imagined what it would feel like for me if we were landing on Earth. How long has it been, I asked, since you were on Nort? Many moons, Marat replied. I was a much younger, more gullible Norsian. I never asked you, I said. Your story. My slave story, you mean? Marat asked turning her golden eyes on me. Yes, I said. But if you'd rather not... There was a large ravine down from my village, Marat said, interrupting me. I went down one morning to collect some water. My mother was making gampari for supper. It was my favorite. I liked helping her cook, and I was eager to get the water back to our hut so she could start boiling the gampari. I had just finished filling both pails when I heard it. At first, it was just a quiet whir in the air. Then it became louder and louder. I looked up and saw tiny aircrafts in the sky. They were black and gold, and they had blasting sirens that made me feel like the mountains were shaking. They flew over the ravine and headed straight for my village. I felt my body grow cold as Marat continued her story, with a stony-eyed detachment that told me just how hurtful the memory still was. Microns later, 
I heard screams and explosions and turrets of sand kicked into the air like a storm. I left my water soaking up the soil and ran as fast as I could in the direction of the explosion. By the time I reached my village, it was too late. Half our huts had been destroyed by the bombs, and the survivors were being rounded up by the packs. Your mother? I asked nervously. Dead, Marat replied curtly. Both my brothers were killed trying to fight the packs, and my sisters were taken as slaves, just like me. They're out there somewhere in this vast galaxy. I just don't know where. We were put on the same auction block, but were sold to different slavers. I realized I had tears in my eyes. I'm so sorry, Marat, I said fervently. She shrugged, holding in her emotion like it was a shield against the pain. They have destroyed our land, she said. It is not the Nord I remember. They strangled out the beauty and left behind only sand and dirt. This is not the home I recognize. I wanted to reach out and touch her hand, but I knew she would not allow that. It was enough to know she had shared her story with me. I resolved to tell her mine one day. There was a loud beep, and then the internal intercom went off, alerting us that we'd be landing shortly. I glanced towards the large exit ramps that would lead us out into our new home. As we kept descending, I realized that there were several ships already on the ground. I recognized them immediately as part of the Hiles Rain fleet. Do you recognize where we are? I asked, glancing at Marat. We're on the north-western side of Nort, she replied. Where the Mehmet Plains meet the Hiskandar Valley. Are we close to your village by any chance? I asked. No, Marat said, and I detected a note of relief in her tone. My village is much further south. As the Gignar landed... I tried to count the ships that had taken over the surrounding landscape. There were at least eleven that I could see, and I hoped that that number would increase in the next few weeks. The fleet was strongest together, as Rennell often pointed out to me. I could see that the larger spaceships had been positioned in a semicircle of sorts that acted as a barrier. Within that protective circle, settlements were being erected. Maybe this will be a new beginning for us all, I thought. Don't be a fool, Morant said, making me gasp. I hadn't realized that I'd said the words out loud. We may be on a new planet, but make no mistake, we are still slaves. I gulped, feeling an uncomfortable itch just beneath the surface of my skin. Morant's beautiful large eyes looked down at me, and there was a certain amount of resentment on her face. Of course, I speak only for those who do not share a bed with a dragon commander. I felt my cheeks burst into flame, but before I could say anything in response, Marat turned and left the viewing decks. I saw her head back in the direction of the nursery, and I was left standing there alone. Within microns, the draken on duty opened the exit doors and the ramps were released. The slaves were ushered into their corners and it reminded me of the day that we had been hoarded off Gignar and onto the wyvern like cattle. Given that I was still wearing my slave collar, I was bunched in with the slaves and we were made to form a single file line in front of the exit ramp. The line had just started moving when I saw Rennell turn a corner and approach the viewing decks that directly preceded the exit ramp. He caught sight of me immediately, and I saw his expression turn sour. Yvette! he barked. What are you doing there? The dragon on duty exchanged nervous glances when they realized their mistake. We're sorry, Commander, a young dragon with thick orange-brown scales said quickly. We didn't see her there. Yes, Commander, another dragon added. If we had, we would have made sure to keep her separate from the slaves. I closed my eyes in frustration, wishing 
that the conversation had happened far from the ears of all the other slaves on board. Already I could feel their eyes boring into me with barely concealed bitterness. Why did Renell have to make a scene? Why did Draken always speak so loudly? It was infuriating. Yvette, come with me, Renell said. Left with no choice, I followed him out onto the ramp and walked down behind him. The moment we were clear of prying eyes, I turned on him angrily. Did you have to make a big deal about that? I demanded. About what? Rennell asked, his brow furrowing. About my being in the slave line, I said. Everyone was staring. So? I gritted my teeth. I don't want them to feel like... Like what? Rennell demanded. He looked genuinely confused by my anger, and I realized the difference between our perspectives. It hit me that as simple as things were for us within the confines of Rennell's chambers, it would not be the case anywhere else. I don't want you treating me differently in front of the other slaves, I said, struggling to find a way to express myself. Rennell frowned. How can I not? he asked. Everything is different now. Everything was different now. A wealth of noise surrounded us as we hit the gritty sand of Nort. Renell looked up distractedly at the settlements being built, and I watched as he made eye contact with a fellow draken who he was obviously familiar with. He left me standing there to go and greet his friend. I watched as the two grabbed each other's arms around the elbow as was the custom among their kind. It was the equivalent of a hug. I turned back to the Gignar and watched as the slaves were being led down in the single-file line I had just been removed from. I saw Marat at the very back of the line. Her eyes met mine for only a moment before she turned her face away deliberately. It was a subtle rebuke, but it hurt all the same. I felt an overpowering sense of guilt engulf me, and almost immediately I realized why that was. I remembered my first few days in Gignar's scullery. Carissa had visited me there when I had still seen the galaxy in black and white. I had been incapable of understanding her choice at the time. I had judged her for it, I had taken her life personally. It felt as though she had betrayed me by turning her back on Earth. Now, here I stood, on the other side of her choice, and I realized just how much I had misunderstood. The galaxy had never been black and white. It was just different shades of gray, and a whole host of difficult choices. Chapter 28. Renell. The roars of the War Council were deafening. I felt the ground shake beneath the steady stamping of dragon feet. We were holding the Council on the outskirts of our rising colony. On one side, we were cast in the shadow of our spaceships, and on the other, we were flanked by barren hills that might have once been mountains. There was a spindly formation of rock just in front of the hill, and we had made that our dais. Tarion was standing atop the highest rock as he made his wild and impassioned speech. The main commanders of the Hyles' reign were standing on either side of the rock formation, and the rest of the Draken fleet had congregated in front of it. The Pax have ravaged our galaxy for too long now. Tarion said, his voice carrying across the desert, reverberating with anger. They have plundered and destroyed, murdered and enslaved. The Pax Alliance is the scourge that taints our universe, and it is time we rip their so-called legacy out from under their feet. The dragon in front of us roared and stamped their feet raising their fists into the air in agreement. 
I watched the fervor that was spreading through the gathering and smelled bloodlust in the air. As a species, we were trained for battle, but more importantly, we were built for it. It was in our nature to reeve and pillage and take what we wanted. It was in our nature to make war. And yet, my blood did not boil with the urgent need to exact revenge. I did not want to rush into battle. I did not want to make another war. Perhaps I was getting old. We thought they were merely rodents. We thought they would be no threat to us, Tarion continued. But here we are, forced to make our home on another planet. We are the Drakons of Theron, and yet Theron is gone. The Pax took Theron. They raped her, murdered her, and left her for dead. Theron is our motherland. She gave birth to us all, and now we must avenge her. More roars, more stamping. Dust pushed off into the air like little golden tornadoes. It rose higher and higher until it had created a fog that hung just above our heads. I looked towards the other side of the rock formation, where a second lot of commanders stood. Modoc was among them in the far corner. His face was turned up to Tarion, but I could tell he wasn't engaged at all. His features were blank of expression, and his stature was stiff and uncertain. I had wanted to question him in front of the council, but Lahar and Tarion had spoken for him and my suggestion had been thrown to the wayside. We are dragons, Tarion yelled. We are the masters of the sky, the kings of fire, and the monsters of lore. We are dragons, and we will take what is ours. We will kill every last Pax in this galaxy, and once their kind has gone extinct, we will build shrines devoted to their kind, and anyone who wishes it may be allowed to deface those shrines in the manner of their choosing. It is the perfect tribute. It took everything I had in me to keep from rolling my eyes. Tarion certainly had a flair for the dramatic, but I couldn't deny that he was effective. Every dragon at the War Council looked ready to lay down his life for the safety of our species. Remember, my brothers, Tarion continued, never forget what they took from us. Never forget what they stole from us. We will pay them back in kind. As the deafening roar of chanting dragons took to the wind, I made my way to where Modok stood next to Lahar. The draken shifted his eyes uncomfortably as he saw me approach. Commander Renault, he nodded. I was vaguely aware of Tarion getting off his makeshift dais and walking over to us. Modoc, I nodded. Have you managed to make contact with the remaining ships in the fleet? Six of them are not yet accounted for. I'm working on it, Modoc nodded. I assure you, Commander, I am doing everything in my power. Like you did for Theron, I demanded before he could even finish. We no longer have a home because you did not do your job right. Easy there, Ronell, Tarion said, appearing at my left shoulder. Just because you lot are willing to trust him blindly does not mean I have to, I said. He was in charge of communication for the fleet. Tell me, Modog. How did you miss something so detrimental as the Pax Alliance heading straight for our own planet? I saw them too late, Modoc replied. It was an oversight on my part. Oversight? I growled. That's a pretty big fucking oversight, wouldn't you say? Run now, Lahar said, placing his hand on my chest. That contact seemed to snap me out of my rage. I took a deep breath and willed myself to calm down. I was obviously outnumbered, and if experience had taught me anything, it was don't spend energy fighting a battle you couldn't possibly win. 
Lahar, Dashiell, and Tarion were all in favor of pardoning Modoc for his mistakes. I, for one, thought he should be tried and then locked in a cement cell for the foreseeable future. You're just going to turn a blind eye to his mistakes? I demanded of my brother commanders. Lahar and Dashiell exchanged a glance. We intend no such thing, Nashel said, looking at me pointedly. We're merely trying to be fair. No dragon would ever betray his kind. If Modoc made mistakes, it was unintentional. I ground my teeth together, trying to read the evasive expression on Modoc's face. Is that right, Modoc? I asked. I thought I was doing the right thing. Modoc replied. I frowned. That answer didn't satisfy me, the way it seemed to satisfy Lahar, Dashiell, and Tarion. We will put a trial together, Tarion said. We will judge the right punishment for Modoc. I pushed down my rage. A trial was certainly a step in the right direction. Very well. A trial was certainly justified. I said, before turning back to Modoc. I do not trust you, Modoc, I said, taking a step forward so that our noses were only an inch apart. I want you to know it. Modoc didn't meet my eyes, and that troubled me too. He was hiding something, and I was still determined to get to the bottom of it. Once the war council was over, I headed straight back home. Home was no longer a chamber within a spaceship. Now, home meant a small hut that had been fashioned out of stone, brick, and thick black cement that we had made from the viscous mud and dirt at the base of the Mamet Plains. With the help of our slaves, we erected up to three settlements a day, fusing together all the various materials with cement, and in some cases, the hot blaze of dragon fire. I was grateful to be busy. If I didn't have something to keep my mind occupied, my need for vengeance might have overpowered my good sense. My hut was located close to Gegnar. It was one of the larger colony huts due to my status as a commander. The main room fed into the bedroom, which I now shared with Yvette. And we were also equipped with a functioning bathroom and a small kitchen space that Yvette cooked out of most days. It was nowhere near close to the luxury and comfort I had been used to aboard the Hiles Rain ships, but adjustments needed to be made given our current plight. When I got to the hut, I could see smoke rising from the chimney roof that sat above the kitchen. I could smell the bold scent of Groot wafting towards me, and I sighed. I wasn't a fan of Groot. It was a vegetable that was native to Nort and considered to have a meaty flavor, but I didn't think so. It tasted of no meat I had ever tried before. There was another scent that I caught hiding beneath the smell of Groot. It was sweeter and more inviting, and I suspected I knew what it was. That, I called as I walked into the hut. I pushed open the thick blanket that served as our door. It hung over the entrance and served to keep out bugs and insects. Renelle, are you back already? Yvette asked as she jumped into the main room. How was the war council? She was wearing a simple blue sheath that I had procured from Carissa a few days earlier. It hung over one shoulder, leaving the other one bare and hugged her curves before ending at her knees. Her dark hair hung loose around her shoulders and looked slightly unkempt, as though she had been running her hands through it all day. It was as expected, I replied. Darian is swearing vengeance, as are most of the dragon. Are you? Yvette asked, eyeing me closely. I felt hot anger boil inside me. I am, I nodded, but I need to keep a clear head, especially when everyone around me seems eager to jump into another war. It's too soon, Yvette said. 
You're not ready to take on the Pax army right now. I'm aware of that. Now I have to make sure my fellow commanders realize that too. It's not in our nature to take a defeat like this lying down. There is a difference between intelligence and strength, Yvette pointed out. I am aware, I nodded, realizing how much easier it was to talk to Yvette about these things than it was to talk to Tarion, Lahar, and even Dashiell. Why don't you sit down, Yvette suggested. I made dinner. Groot, I asked. How'd you know? Yvette wondered. I managed a smile. It has a distinctive smell. Yvette frowned as she took in my careful expression. You're not a fan of Groot, are you? I raised my eyebrows innocently. I never said that. No, but your expression does, Yvette said. I know when you're hiding what you really feel. I bristled at that. I thought I had done a good job of hiding my innermost thoughts. Yvette disappeared into the kitchen, and when she returned, she was carrying a large tray of cookies. I sat up instantly, my mouth salivating. I knew it! Yvette laughed. I think they came out pretty well, she said. I had to work hard the last couple of days to put together the ingredients I needed. I wanted to surprise you. This is a very good surprise, I acknowledged, reaching for a cookie gratefully. I didn't think I would ever get tired of the delicious sweetness of the crumbly treat. Yvette sighed heavily, and my head snapped up to her. Are you all right? I asked. Of course, she nodded immediately. Just... A little tired. You've been getting tired often lately, I observed. Yes, Yvette nodded, and I realized she had been worrying about it herself. Maybe I'm getting sick. I can have you examined. No, Yvette said quickly. That's completely unnecessary. I think it's just the stress of adjusting to a new world and a new reality. How is your PTSD? I asked, hoping I had gotten the name right. She smiled and reached out for my hand. It's manageable, she nodded. It's better when I'm with you. I noticed how pale she looked in the pallid evening light. I wondered if that was a warning sign or just a trick of the light. I reached out and placed my claws against the black thickness of her collar. I said nothing about it nor did she. But its presence stood between us, an ever-present third person who refused to leave. You're doing too much, I said. You need a rest. I don't need you to cook for me. What else am I supposed to do around here? Yvette asked. I have no place among the draken apart from that of a slave. I cringed against the word. Was there ever a time when I had used it so freely? I looked into her eyes and saw the potential there. She was no slave. She never had been. Chapter 29 Yvette I woke up with a strange feeling coursing through me. It almost felt as though my body didn't belong to me anymore, and I started to panic. Maybe I had been too hasty in refusing Ronell's offer to have one of the dragon healers look at me. I turned in bed and realized that Ronell wasn't there. I was alone, tangled in the sheets with only Ronell's dewy scent to keep me company. He was so busy these days. And of course I understood that he had to oversee the construction of the colony, but I missed him terribly when he was gone. It was still strange to think of Ronell that way. There were moments when I genuinely forgot about the collar around my neck. Unfortunately, today was not one of those days. Its vice-like grip made me feel weak and ungainly as I slipped out of bed and padded over to the stone hearth that Rennell had fashioned himself out of Nordic rocks that lay deep in the Hiskandar Valley. 
The walls of our little hut had been made from the same rock, but it had been broken down and mixed in with black cement to form an incredibly thick and durable substance that felt almost invincible. The Drakens referred to their colony home as huts, but the word felt insubstantial in my opinion. It was like using the word hill to describe a mountain. I pushed away the curtain that hung over the open window in our bedroom and looked upon the Draken colony that had taken over the Norsian plains. It looked like a small village that had been around for a few decades at least. It was amazing how resourceful the Drakens were. I had watched how they had used their claws, strength, and fire breath to build a fortified colony in mere days. I stood in awe of their capabilities, and I realized why it had been so hard for them to swallow their defeat against the packs. They were a species that had grown used to success. I was still staring absentmindedly out the window when I caught sight of Rennell in the distance. He was wearing pale colors today a simple shirt whose neckline was slightly parted to reveal the muscular burgundy scales of his chest. The sunlight touched the scales on his arm and turned them into dancing fire. Even his eyes seemed to spark with life as he walked towards the hut. His wings were folded neatly behind his back, but his tail swung from side to side. I had come to realize that it was just habit he had formed over the years similar to how I used to bite my nails as a child. I pulled on the pale blue sheath that had quickly become my favorite item of clothing and left the room to meet Renelle. It's late, I said. Why didn't you wake me? You were tired, Renelle replied as he stepped through the door. You needed rest. Were you at another meeting? I asked. Renelle gave me a small smile as he pulled out a beautiful silver bracelet that seemed to gleam even within the confines of the hut. It was a sleek band, but as I took a closer look, I realized it was thicker than it looked. It's beautiful, I said. It's yours, Rennell said. I commissioned it especially for you. Commissioned it? I asked. Does that mean it's not stolen? I paid real credits for it, Rennell said. Wow, I breathed. I'm flattered. Thank you. It's not just nice to look at, Rennell said before I could take it from his hands. No, it serves a purpose, he told me. The bracelet contains a translation chip. I raised my eyebrows. Come here, Rennell said, taking my hand and pulling me towards him. I think it's time we take that thing off your neck. I took a deep breath and my stomach started to quiver. I had worn the black collar around my neck for years now. Sometimes it felt like a lifetime. Renault, Shh, he said gently, as he lifted my right hand and snapped the bracelet in place around my wrist. Then he hooked his claw into the back of my collar and pressed hard. I felt my knees buckle as a bolt of electricity raced through the collar and around my neck. I gasped, but Renell had a firm grip on me and I stayed on my feet, held in place by his arm around my waist. A second later, I heard a faint clicking sound, and then the thick collar fell away and landed on the ground with a resounding thud. I stared at it for a long time. Why did it look so puny all of a sudden? It had felt larger than life when it had sat around my neck. Oh, my God, I breathed, stepping away from Renell so that I could look at it lying there, powerless, obsolete. How do you feel? Renell asked. I turned to him, my eyes wide with wonder as I lifted my hands up to my neck. I hadn't felt the skin there in so long. It felt soft, almost alien. I'm free? I asked. You're free, Rennell nodded. I felt my head spin with joy. 
and just like that I lost control over my body. I saw the ground rise up to meet me, but I felt my body freeze just before I made contact with the hard surface. I was vaguely aware of Rennell saying my name. I was vaguely aware of his arms engulfing my body and lifting me up. I was also aware of the sudden deluge of sunlight that hit my face. Were we outside? It certainly seemed so. It was never this bright in the hut we shared. The world went black for a long stretch of time. I saw stars and wondered if I was back in space. It certainly felt like I was floating. Yvette? I turned my head in the direction of my name, but I couldn't see anyone. I tried to reply, but my mouth felt heavy with fatigue. That strange feeling that had clung to my body all week was back, and it was gnawing insistently at my stomach. Yvette! I felt something flutter over me. A strong, pungent smell burned my nostrils and made me want to turn away, but my limbs felt disconnected from my body. The smell only got stronger until I realized it was sitting right beneath my nose. Before I could do a thing, my mouth had been forced open, and some unfamiliar thick liquid had been forced down my throat. It tasted of bitter wood, and I coughed violently as my eyes tore open, bringing me back to the conscious world. I looked around in panic, and almost immediately Renell emerged in my line of vision. It's okay, Yvette, he said gently, taking my hand. I'm here. I looked around wildly and realized that I was in the colony's makeshift medical unit. I recognized the supplies cabinet that had been brought down from Gignar. I could also see the long tables and a line of beds arranged in one corner of the hut. The dragon standing over me had pale blue scales and dark eyes. He had a healer's crest sitting in the middle of his chest and a large black bottle in his hands. What did you give me? I asked, finding my voice. Runsing oil, the dragon healer replied. It will help your body adjust. Adjust to what? Renell asked. The dragon healer looked between the two of us with surprise that bordered on amusement. E you are not yet aware? He asked. Aware of what? I demanded impatiently. What's wrong with me? Nothing at all, the dragon healer replied. You're nesting. I raised my eyebrows in confusion. I'm what? I looked to Renell for an explanation, but he was staring at the healer with wide, shocked eyes. I reached out and touched his arm, but he made no indication that he even registered my presence. Renell? I asked. The healer looked towards me. I believe the human term for it is pregnant. I stared at the healer for a moment and then burst out laughing. What? I said. That's... I was about to tell him that it was impossible. Before I could even finish my sentence, I realized that it was not. I had been feeling strange for some time now and I had always just dismissed it as stress or worry. Was it possible I had been pregnant for weeks and not known it? Commander, the dragon healer said, I am certain of it. The human is pregnant with twin whelps. Twins? I gasped. Renell seemed to snap out of his frozen reverie and turn to me with an unreadable expression on his face. I couldn't decide if he was upset or excited. I could see every shade of emotion on his face, and I wondered what was written on mine. Delagro, Rennell said, would you give us a moment, please? Of course, Commander. The healer nodded as he stepped away from us and exited the medical unit through the flap door to the right. Rennell turned his dark eyes on me. They looked to be smoldering, but I was almost sure that was just my imagination. Are you okay? I asked cautiously. 
Rennell had never expressed any interest in starting a family. In fact, we hadn't ever spoken about our future together. Was it naive of me to want to believe that he could actually be happy about this? I'm stunned, he said in a gravelly voice. I am too, I nodded, and scared. Why are you scared? Rennell asked, his eyes darting to my face. I don't know what this means. For us. Rennell reached out and cupped my face with both his hands. He bent his head down and kissed me gently on the lips. It means we're going to have two feral hatchlings of our own, he said, and we're going to raise them together. I stared at his face, and a tear slipped free from my right eye. So you're happy? I asked, holding my breath for the answer. Rennell's face broke out into a huge smile, probably the biggest I had ever seen on him. You have made me very happy, he nodded. Happier than I've been in a very long time. He dipped his head low and placed it against my chest. I held him close to me and stroked his hair as his body shook with emotion. I couldn't believe it. After years of servitude, I had been delivered into a life of freedom and happiness. I remembered the mark on my left cheek, the ill omen I had carried with me through my entire life as a slave. The mark would be permanently emblazoned on my face, but its hold over me had started to chip away. For the first time in years, the three-leafed clover on my face no longer bothered me. And most important of all, it no longer defined me. Epilogue Rennell I walked along the base of the Gignor, looking up at the shiny new additions that had been made to its surface. There were large missile cannons that had been attached to the underbelly of the ship, and the sides had been equipped with laser shooters. There were silent beams that could blast apart tough objects. In mere months, Gignor had transformed from a sleek and impressive spaceship into an intimidating war machine. I glanced around at all the spaceships in our fleet. They had been undergoing a rigorous series of additions, repairs, and services. Slowly, our broken fleet had transformed into something much more formidable. I just hoped it would be enough against the growing Pax Empire. I turned to see Dashiell and Tarion walking towards me. You think the fleet is ready to fly? I asked. Tarion nodded eagerly. I saw the bloodlust in his eyes, the anger and zeal to exact revenge on our sworn enemies. I think so. Are you... We're sure, Tarion interrupted immediately. Dashiell? Dashiell nodded. Our ships are strong, and the improvements we've added have made them stronger. The packs still outnumber us, I pointed out. We can't take the stuff feet lying down, Rennell, Tarion said with obvious annoyance. We are not a slave species to cower against the Pax's might. We are drakens of the Hyle's reign, and if we don't fight back, then we will lose respect in the galaxy. I do not suggest we do nothing, I replied impatiently. I'm merely counseling caution and sense. Sense, Tarion growled, throwing his arms up in the air. His wings unfurled in anger, snapped back into place as he addressed me. I'm tired of being sensible. We've been on the ground in this barren wasteland for over two months. It's time for action. Dashiell sighed at Tarion and turned to me. What do you advise, Renell? he asked temperately. We stock up, I said immediately. We travel around the galaxy. We arm ourselves with the best weapons, missiles, and arsenal we can get our hands on. And once our people have healed as a nation, 
Then we strike with all the might of the Hyle's reign. I saw Tarion's expression change. He saw the logic in my plan, but he was like a hatchling clinging to his need to fly. Dashiell, on the other hand, smiled easily. That does sound like the best course of action, Dashiell nodded. There is no action involved, Tarion said through gritted teeth. Dashiell and I exchanged a look that Tarion didn't miss. It's different for you, too, he complained. You have new hatchlings at home. It's easier for both of you to be patient. Speaking of new hatchlings, Dashiell said, turning to me, how are your two? A revolution old, and they've already got their mother wrapped around their little claws, I said bumly. Just their mother? Dashiell teased. I smiled. Fatherhood had been an unexpected blessing. It had softened me in ways I had not expected and changed my perspective on many things. I was no longer quick to anger. I was no longer wholly impatient. I was no longer adamant to get back in the sky. I was happy to enjoy each little click as it came and savor the moment when it lasted. Our hatchlings were growing fast and I found myself longing to be back in our little hut rather than overseeing the colony's comings and goings. I should get back and check on them, I said, eager to see my children. I'll walk with you, Tarion said. Carissa's visiting with Yvette. Dashiell said goodbye to us and headed into the Gignar to oversee the work going on inside the ship. Tarion and I headed down the flat plains in the direction of my hut. Nort had been good to us. It wasn't the most beautiful planet anymore. The Pax had seen to that. But it was still useful. There were still pockets of Norsian villages and towns in the vicinity, and we had been able to strike a deal with many of them for supplies, oil, and other necessities to aid in our repairs. I missed Theron more than I could say. But Yvette and our children had helped soften the loss. Now I finally had something that was mine, and I was prepared to go to any length to protect it. We were just approaching the hut when I saw Carissa emerge from within. She was wearing black trousers under a figure-hugging tunic and a soft blue. She also wore a black sash belt across her shoulders, making her look every bit the warrior that Tarion was. Rennell, she said, nodding at me. Your children are beauties. The compliment made me swell with pride. They are, I agreed. They'll be wild, both of them, Carissa said. I've had enough children now to tell. Yorin can be tamed, but Renat will be fire. My smile deepened. Oh, I know. She is her mother's daughter. Carissa fell into step with Tarion, and the two made their way back to their own ship. I saw them off and then walked into the hut to the mewling of my hatchlings. Yvette was sitting in the large armchair I had crafted for her during her pregnancy. She had Yorin nestled against her chest while Renat gurgled at her feet. Yorin had dark crimson scales that were thick and heavy. His wings were large almost as large as his body, and he was constantly trying to maneuver them. His eyes were dark, almost black, and his hair had the same dark, shadowy tinge. Renat was almost the same size as her brother, but her wings were much smaller. Her scales were close in color to my own, a thin burgundy that was fused with rose pink. However, her scales were light, barely visible, and her wings were tiny. Yvette and I suspected that she would be able to fly, but not shift. That would be a difficult transition when both hatchlings were older, but Yvette assured me it was all in the raising. I deferred to her in the matters of parenting. She had presence of mind and confidence, both of which I lacked when it came to the rotund little wildling she had birthed. Both hatchlings looked to me with alert eyes. Yorin gave me a half-hearted smile, 
yawned wide to reveal his sharp fangs, then turned into his mother's breast for a snuggle. My little Renette, however, raised her hands to me, her eyes bright, demanding my attention. I lifted her up and placed a kiss on her forehead. She giggled knowingly and started touching the scales that snaked up my neck and peppered my jaw. I sat down next to Yvette and offered her my hand. She slipped her fingers into my palm and gave me a slow, contented smile. Good day, she asked. It was satisfactory, I nodded. Did you see Horik around the colony? Yvette asked. The young dracon that Yvette had helped during the evacuation of Theron had become a permanent fixture in our lives. His parents had not been located, but Yvette was still holding out hope for their return. There were still a few ships from our fleet that were unaccounted for. He was with Lahar and Lara, I replied. He has taken a shine to their hatchlings. Good. He needs to spend time with children his own age. He's joining us for supper tonight, I informed her. Yvette smiled. Good. I've made mulberry pie especially for him, she said. I chuckled. At this rate, he might as well move in with us. I wouldn't mind, Yvette said, and I sensed the sincerity in her words. You have two little monsters to contend with, I pointed out. You really want to add another? Yvette smiled. I would add a dozen more like them she said, nuzzling her face into urine soft cheek. Patience, my beauty, I said. There's time for that yet. A vet laughed before seriousness traveled back into her eyes. Any new developments? The repairs on Gignar finished today, I told her. Modoc was part of the crew. How is he taking his new position? A vet asked. Modoc's trial had been undertaken a few weeks ago. He had been severely demoted and put at the rank of a common crew member. It was a blow to his ego, and I had seen that on his face. But he had taken his punishment silently and with a dignity that I begrudgingly respected. He worked aboard Gignar now under Dashiell's command. He's a proud dragon, I observed. But he has been surprisingly accepting of his fate. That's a good thing, Yvette pointed out. Or a suspicious thing, I said, thinking out loud. Yvette smiled. You're always so suspicious, she said, rubbing my hand. Maybe it's time you relaxed a little. Relaxed? I repeated. I don't think I know how. I'll teach you, Yvette said. You just sit here with me and our children. Enjoy this moment, and forget about everything else. We'll need a new ship, I said. We can't stay aboard Gignar forever. A problem for another day, Yvette countered. The Pax are still out there amassing their empire. A battle for another day, Yvette said. Motherhood looked beautiful on her. Her features had a gentle edge that was absent of fear or worry. She smiled more and laughed often. She gloried in the beautiful purpose she had found with the twins. Look at your children, my love, Yvette said. This is the only thing that matters. I looked at Yorn and then Renat. Lastly, my eyes fell on Yvette, the human slave who had become the most important being in my galaxy. She had given me hope again. She had given me children. But most of all, she had given me a reason to keep fighting. I had something to lose now, and I wouldn't rest until the Pax Empire was burning. It would take time. It would take skill and cunning. But I was a dragon of the Hyles reign, and I had a family to protect. I would not fail. Not this time. 
this has been Enslaved by the Alien Dragon, a sci-fi alien romance, Galactic Alpha's Conquest, Book 4. Written by Stella Casey. Performed by Lisa S. Ware. Copyright 2019 by Special Fiction Books. Production Copyright 2020 by Special Fiction Books. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.